Graham and Peter Chambers. Created by Henry Kane, transcribed and starring Dane Clark. A private investigator, duly licensed and duly sworn, Peter Chambers. You're a private eye. That's your business. Anything else? That's for laughs. You've got a slant of sun coming in the office window, your feet are on the desk, and you're relaxed. Business is lousy, but you've got no kicks. You're young, you're strong, you've got a few bucks in the bank. And it's a beautiful day. You, Peter Chambers? All of me, lady. Beautiful day, isn't it? Not for you. Not for long, anyway. She's a cute little trick, but nervous as a puppy with fleas. She's wearing a tan suit, molded to her figure, and properly protruding. The rest is in perfect taste. Black nylons, black shoes, black blouse, and black gloves. So she spoils it. She dips into her bag, and what she produces doesn't quite go with the ensemble. Because now she's wearing a pearl-handled gun in her right fist. Looks like a thirty-eight, And it's pointing directly at you. So you scrape back out of your chair, and you go to her. Stand back. Stand back, I tell you. Honey, you're not even holding the gun right. I know what I'm doing. Keep away from me. Oh, you're shaking like you're practicing to be a cooch dancer. Now relax, little lady. Keep away, please, please. Okay, now. I've got the gun, and you're still shaking. Now sit down, lady. What's your name? Elsa Corey. What do you do? Do? For a living. A gun ma, you ain't. Uh, I'm an actress. Working? Yes. Well, come on, sister. This is like pulling teeth. Let's have it all in one lump. I, I have the second lead in the Lady Dances. It's in rehearsal. It's my first real job. It's produced by Jack Burke. He hired me. Anything else? Where do you live? 1013 East 39th Street, 2B. Oh, please. Please don't point that gun at me. It's your gun, remember? Okay. I drop it in my jacket pocket like so. See? No more gun. Now, what's this jiggle all about? Jiggle? Look, it's a beautiful day. I'm sitting around with my feet on the desk, dreaming my own personal little dream. So a dame drops in, wriggling around a Roscoe, and the Roscoe is blinking its eye at me, so I got a right to ask. What's it all about? Well, I... I can't... I, I oh, can't... that's coherent. Now, let's do it incoherent this time. I... I came here to kill you. Hmm? Why? I was sent... By whom? Bruce Burke. Bruce Burke, huh? Well, it's all in the family. Jack Burke, Bruce Burke, two lonely brothers. Well, I never met your producer, but Bruce. Brucey boy, I know. I'm sorry. I'm dreadfully sorry. Believe me, I don't think I could have. I couldn't. I know I couldn't. All right, Elsa. <laughs> Elsa Corey, simmer down. Just make yourself at home. I'll be back. Where, where are you going? To pay a call on Brucey boy. Maybe you can fill me in where you can't. And I'll go away, baby. Pop will be back. Bruce Burke. A crumb right out of the bread box. A bum with a couple of million bucks. A sharpshooter that owns a nightclub called The Flame. You put the light out on The Flame about a year ago, hooked him for watering his stock... So, it's a beautiful day, only for you, suddenly, it's beginning to shape up cloudy. You get to his Park Avenue address, stick your finger on the buzzer. Nobody's home. Well, you've been there before, a 12-room suite for Brucey and his missus. Plus, she's got an apartment on the side. And just for kicks, you try the knob, and very conveniently, the door's not locked you're inside, but you don't go far. Bruce Burke is napping, face down. Only when you go to turn him over, Brucey boy's napping days are finished. The guy stiff as a bugle, two bullet holes in his face, and his rigid leer is like a spiteful grin. And suddenly you feel it. Call it extra sensory perception. You know you've been yanked into a deal that you ought to get out of. Fast. 
You do a beeline for the door, you pull it open, and you're face to face with Detective Lieutenant Louis Parker, New York City Police, homicide. Hi, Pete. Fancy as they say, meeting you here. Hi, Lieutenant. Same fancy goes for me. What brings you? Jingle on the phone, what they call anonymous. Oh, I see. Well, come in. Thanks for the welcome, Shamus. Hey, what do we got here? Corpse. Body used to belong to Bruce Burke. Plus. Plus what, kid? Plus, I've got a hunch, a little frame job with me in the middle. Yeah, take a look at this. A little encumbrance I'm carrying in my pocket. I handle it, you notice, by the muzzle. Pearl handle 38 revolver. Okay, what scoop? Break it, Lieutenant. I have a vague notion you're going to find two shells discharged. I also have a notion that ballistics will show that the two bullets in this monkey came out of the gun you're holding. Uh, two hunks of lead missing. Figures. And my fingerprints on the handle. And my fingerprints on the doorknob. And me and Bruce Burt supposed to have a feud going? I hope you got a good story for me, kid. We've been friends a long time. And the little dame wearing gloves. I'll bet mine are the only fingerprints on that Roscoe. Better be a good story, kiddo. Salute, so, Lieutenant. Lend an ear. You tell him the tale and he listens. Louie's an old friend. You've worked together for years. He promises a thorough check on the situation, and you promise to be down to see him to check the check. You leave him the pearl handle pistol, and you leg her to the next spot that might furnish a little information. The lady dances is rehearsing at the Ascot on 48th off Broadway. Backstage, there's one solitary guy working a song on a piano. Well, what do you want, Bob? Looking for Jack Burke. I'm Jack Burke. Stands up on the piano, very fashionable type. White hair, slender figure, $200 suit. Well, what is it, young man? What do you want here? Oh, I thought there was a rehearsal going on. It's off for a while. Oh, may I ask No, you, you may not ask. What do you want here? Oh, name's Peter Chambers. I'm a private detective. I'd like to inquire about a young lady, Miss Elsa Corey. I'm not messing into the affairs of every private shummus that comes barging backstage for some cockeyed reason of his own. Oh, look, Mr. Burke, if I you haven't want... got the time now. just now. one little minute, Mr. Burke. Oh, like that, is it? You want to play tough boy, huh? Willie! A muscle-bound monster comes ambling out of the wings. The guy's six foot four and practically as wide as he's long. Willie's got a face that's half moron, half pig. And the part of the pig is dangling in a couple of ham-like hands. But you're not worried about Willie. You've got a large ego and a lot of confidence. And you think you can take Willie if you had the time. But right now, you don't have the time. So you turn from Willie to get back to Jack Burke. But you've underestimated Willie. Willie's not as amiable as he looks. You get a hit in the head like a stroke of paralysis. And the lights blaze and start whirling. And then there are no more lights. There's blackness, whirling, spinning, black, blackness. You open your eyes and you're sitting on the sidewalk, sprawled like a drunk that forgot how to stop. You're backed against the stage door, but it's locked. You've got a bill to collect with a joker named Willie and a larger bill with his boss, Jack Burke, but you can't now. Thoughts joggle in your mind and then you know where you're going. Loretta Burke is the wife of Bruce Burke, and she's got a lush little cave of her own on Central Park South. You head for it, thinking about her. Loretta Burke, who managed a nightclub called The Flame. You head for a diggings, and then you're there. Hello, Mrs. Chambers. To what do I owe the pleasure? A lush blonde, 30 years younger than Bruce. A page boy blonde with shining hair and shining green eyes. And a figure that brings it to a full stop. Loretta Burke in silver lounging pajamas. Always nice to see you, Mr. Chambers. May I offer a drink? You may. I uh, can use it. Oh. Here you are, Mr. Chambers. Uh, thank you. <laughs> well, you're not yourself today, are you? Gulping your drink. Well, for a very recent widow, Mrs. Burke, you're certainly bearing up staunchly. 
I didn't know that you knew. Well, let's do a reverse on that, sweetie. I didn't know for sure that you knew. Look, tough boy, I don't believe in mourning. I don't wear my heart on my sleeve. No? What do you wear it? Inside, where it belongs. Hmm. I'm a gal with a lousy reputation, but in my own peculiar way, I loved him. Maybe you did in your own peculiar way. Well, let's put it this way. Whoever killed him, sooner or later, is going to face up to me. Now, you got any comment, Mr. Chambers? I don't know. This started off as such a beautiful day, and me sitting around thinking about how business is lousy. Maybe you ought to get out of here and see if you can't stimulate a little. Gentle hint, Mrs. Burke? I've got a lot of things to do. I get it. Well, one question before I leave. You know a little dame by the name of Elsa Corey? Never heard of her. Bye now. See you around. You bet you will. Outside, you call the office about Elsa Corey, but of course our little birdie has jumped the chicken coop. You do a small debate with yourself. Corey or Parker? Which one first? But you promised the lieutenant, so you mosey for police headquarters downtown. You're jogging up the steps when you see him coming out. In a hurry. Well, the private eye, or is it the public enemy? You coming to give yourself up? Lieutenant is jocular, but he looks worried. And when a friend looks worried, you begin to worry. That was the murder gun, Pete, no question. I'm working it slow, working the angles first, because you're involved. But that little Elsa Corey better be around to back up your story. Hmm. Well, what else is new, Lieutenant? Jack Burke's been scouting for dough for his show. He needs money. Bruce's wife, that doll, always needed dough. Well, they're both falling into it. How? Bruce Burke's will. Jack gets half the estate. Loretta Burke gets the other half, plus the nightclub goes to her. Hmm. Real cozy, huh? Now, look, pal, you're not one for throwing stones. Not in this case. So far, all I've really got is you. Yeah, yeah, me. You've been a doll, Lieutenant, a living, breathing doll. Well, don't depend on it, Pete, not for too long. I know you, but uh, there's a DA he's beginning to champ at the bit, so let me go to work now. Huh? Where are you heading for? Date with Jack Burke. Jack Burke? Where? Casa Moretti, upstairs, private room, number four. Look, Louie, one more favor. Mm. Give me a ten-minute head start, huh? Head start with whom? Jack Burke. I've got a bill to collect, and it's overdue. Ten minutes, Lieutenant. Oh, please, Louie. Okay, but uh, I hope you know what you're doing. Oh, I hope so, too. The Casa Moretti is in Greenwich Village, and it serves the longest, skinniest, most flavorsome spaghetti west of a little town called Rome, which they tell me is in Italy. Casmaretti has a downstairs dining room and an upstairs private room where you can run yourself a tete-a-tete or a banquet, depending on your mood. Your mood right now is for a little private chatter, and you rub your knuckles against the door marked four. What? You again? Now, look here. First, you clip him because you owe it to him. No! Then you close the door. Then you drag him into the room. You give him a quick frisk, but there isn't a thing on him that's incriminating. So now you pick him up and deposit him in a chair. And you slap him back to consciousness. What? What? Uh, Live it up, Mr. Burke. Well, listen to the birdie sing. I'm listening. And you're no birdie. What do you want? A bit of polite conversation, nothing more. Well, what do you want? Johnny One Note, that's me. Little lady by name Elsa Corey. Know her? Yes, she's the second lead in the show we're rehearsing. Know her any, uh, better than that? She's an actress in my show, period. Hmm? Have it your way. According to her, she says your brother sent her to see me. Did you introduce her to your brother? No. You happen to know if your brother was acquainted with her? My brother is dead. I know that. And from what I hear... You, a private eye by the name of Chambers, you hated his guts. I'm supposed to know all about that, too. All right. Is there anything else? No, no. I told you all I wanted was a bit of polite conversation. Well, then get out of here. Say it nice. Would you please leave, Mr. Chambers? Oh, a pleasure, Mr. Burke. (laughs) A pleasure indeed. (laughs) 
There's one stop left. You've done the merry-go-round. You've gone the full circle. Elsa Corey said 1013 East 39th Street. Turns out to be a tinderbox. Ramshackle's an ancient barn on a prairie. Young actresses don't have it too easy, and that is a problem. You climb up to 2B, and you knock on a door that's thinner than Melba Toast and has about as much resistance. Nobody answers. You turn and leave, and all of a sudden, a hunch comes up and clobbers you. You shove a shoulder at the rattle trap door, and you lean hard. You're inside now. Little room with the barest of trimmings. And your hunch has paid off. Because you're not alone. Elsa Corey sits in a chair and looks at you, but her eyes aren't blinking. Elsa Corey. Her face mottled and blue bruises on her throat. Elsa Corey strangled to death. So, it's still a beautiful day. Only it's not day anymore. It's nighttime. You've gone home and you've put in a little afternoon sleeping, but it hasn't helped. You're weighed down deep in a jam and you feel it beginning to close in. How goes it, Pete, boy? Uh, pretty bad. Yeah, bad. Detective Lieutenant Louis Parker, a nice guy and a good friend, but the expression on his face is that of a pole bear with rheumatism doing his job on a rainy day. Ain't good, pal. Stinks, in fact. Yep. Elsa Corey, she's dead. Yeah. We got another one of them phone calls. Anonymous. I can clear that for you. Like how? I made that phone call. You did? Yeah. I busted into her place and I found her. Like what you found when you got there. You know what it means, kid. I got an idea. You had one little out. An alibi witness named Elsa Corey. Now she ain't with us no more. Where's that leave you? Crouched behind the eight ball, only keeps getting smaller. Pete. You know how I feel about you, but... Uh, Want to come downtown with me now, fella? And tussle it out with the DA's people? Well, well, must we... What's left, kid? Well, I've got a little night duty to attend to. I've been sort of resting up for it. Night duty? Yeah, now look, look. Let's make a date, Louis. I either collect a killer for you or I present myself. Present yourself when? Let's say tomorrow morning. Bright and early tomorrow morning. You either get a closed case by then or you've got me. You know, I only work for a living, Pete. I can get kicked off the force. I never the... crossed you up, Louie, ever. It's been a long time now, you and me. It's, well, it's one for the storybooks. A private eye and a public cop who can work together and who respect each other. We got a deal. Deal it is, yeah. Bye, Lieutenant. Bye, Detective. Flame is a nightclub on the outskirts of town, and that's your next stop. And the last stop, you figure, one way or another. You get the car out of the garage, you drive up and park in their parking lot. The club is a distance off, and you crunch through gravel on your way. You see a uniformed cop a distance off, but you don't see what's right close near you. Easy does it, mister. Well, if it ain't little Willie... That's me, pal. Willie's loaded with artillery and is jammed to your ribs. Back up to that shed, mister. Double time we do it. But you're not having any. You're not turning your back on Willie. You did that once and once is enough. So the left comes down on the gun and the right goes to the chin. And down goes Willie with me on top of him. The gun gets kicked out of the way and Willie absorbs a few additional raps and then my hands are around his throat. You, you're choking me. That's the general idea, Willie. Let up, mister. Let up. Let up. Uh, uh, new position, Willie. Now I'm sitting across you like you're a hassock, and my fingers are still around that bull neck of yours. And you're a little weaker, Willie. You're quite a little weaker. Talk, Willie. What? What do you want to know? Why did you conk me backstage at the Aska? I... I got the signal from Jack. You work for him? Yeah. Okay, I think we're in rhythm now. Why did you croak Bruce Burke? I didn't. Oh, you need a little more pressure on your throat, is that it? No, I, I had nothing to do with Bruce. Okay. Elsa Corey. 
Talk it up good now, Willie. Well, okay. I I, I went there. 39th Street. Jack sent me. I did a job on her like Jack told me to do. Willie passes out of the picture. You get up off him, collect his gun, and go looking for the cop. And latch law onto Willie with instructions to deposit him in the lap of Detective Lieutenant Louis Parker. Then you brush at your clothes and you make for the nightclub. The joint is jumping and it's temptation, but you haven't got the time. You steer through the joyous people to the door marked office of the manager, and you open it without knocking. Well, Peter Chambers, we're just talking about you. Close the door. The other half of that we is Jack Burke. He's in a tuxedo. And Loretta is in a red off-the-shoulder job that almost gets your mind off your work. But the old mind comes right back to attention because dear Loretta shoves a lily-white hand into the desk drawer and it comes up caressing an ugly 45. Sit down, Mr. Tim. Oh, thanks. I'll stand. Jack and I have been chatting about you. In what connection? In connection with the death of my husband. Lady, you're pointing that gun in the wrong direction. What are you talking about? I'm talking about Jack Burke, who dreamed himself up a foolproof little murder. Only I'm going to take it apart for him right now. This had better be good. Listen, this guy is in a jam with his show. He's looking for money all over town. He... Do you know whether he asked Bruce for a loan? Yes, I know he did. And Bruce turned him down. Bruce had no confidence in the lady dancer. So Bright Boy figured one out. If he bums Bruce, he gets half of his estate. Even if he can't get the loot right away, he can borrow on the strength of it. So he kills him. He's a liar. He knows a little dame, second lead, Elsa Corey. This kid doesn't know which end is up. He gives her the cleaned-up gun, and she's wearing gloves, so it's still clean. And what is she supposed to do with She's it? supposed to come to me because Jack thinks there's bad blood between me and Bruce. She's to threaten me, not shoot me. No, no, nothing like that. And she's to tell me that Bruce sent her. Bruce? Why, Bruce? Because this guy figured it exactly as it happened. Oh. I took the gun away from her. I went to Bruce to find out what it was all about. The door was conveniently left open for me, and I found Bruce like this bum had left him. And then a cop show spurred by an anonymous phone tip. Cute, huh? Cute enough. Where's the girl? That Elsie Corey. Yes, where is she? Look at where him. is she? Look at him wiggle. The big producer. Where is she? She's dead. What? He wasn't going to let her hang around to testify against him, was he? Did you ever hear of Willie? Of course. Willie choked her to death. Proof, 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 not words. The proof. law's caught up with Willie. He's yodeling out there like a broken down jukebox. Well, that's proof against Willie, not proof against me. Look at him, squirming like a rat with his tail in a trap. Look at him. How much more proof do you want? The lady looks. Guilt is scribbled on him like the devil has written on his forehead. She lifts the gun, and for a minute you think it's for you. But it isn't. There isn't much left to look at when you get to him. And all of it is very dead. All right. It's over, and it's done with. Mind if I sit down for just a couple of minutes? Sit. <sighs> It was a beautiful day before it shaped up cloudy. What? What are you talking about? Then a dame comes in and threatens me with a gun, and I get myself jammed up with the law as a murder suspect, and I get pushed around by an ape named Willie, and then I almost catch up at the wrong end of your forty-five. but it's finally developed into business. Business? From whom? You. Me? Next stop for you is a pokey. Maybe with a good lawyer. Who knows? It turns out justifiable homicide. That's business for a lawyer, not for you. True enough, but a lawyer's got to have facts. Now, who's better at getting up facts for you than uh, yours truly? I'm beginning to see what you mean. How much? Well, for a lady who's coming into a million plus a swanky nightclub, uh, how's $5,000? You've talked yourself into a client, Mr. Chambers. You're hired. Thank you, ma'am. Thanks a bunch. Uh, 
And there you've had Crime and Peter Chambers. Dane Clark was starred as Peter Chambers. Crime and Peter Chambers transcribed was created, produced, and written by Henry Kane. Others in the cast were Bill Zuckert, heard as Lieutenant Parker, Fran Carlin as Loretta, and Everett Sloan as Jack. It was directed by Fred Way, and this is Fred Collins inviting you to tune in again next week, same time, same station, for Dane Clark in Crime and Peter Chambers. Visit with Fibber McGee and Molly tonight on the NBC Radio Network. Crime and Peter Chambers. Created by Henry Kane, transcribed and starring Dane Clark. A private investigator, duly licensed and duly sworn. Peter Chambers. You're a private eye. That's your business. Anything else? That's for laughs. The guy on the customer's end of your office desk, no laughs here. This one is strictly business. He's a round little man, balding on top, pudgy in the middle. He's got eyes like a vulture and a cranky voice. Mr. Chambers, you've been highly recommended to me. You're supposed to be number one in your uh, racket. (laughs) He chuckles with a phony heartiness, and the eyes crinkle up, vulture's eyes, with an extra set of bags under them. The upper set are dark, bulbous circles from lack of sleep. The lower set are worry bags, purple and networked with wrinkles. I'm out on a writ of habeas corpus, Mr. Chambers. Yeah, and uh, on a murder rap. They haven't got a thing now, on me. Now, just a minute, just a minute, pal. Let's get some of our facts ironed out. Your name is Charles Avon. Uh-huh. You're a druggist here in New York. Right. You're married and you've got no kids. Correct. Wife's name is Nancy. Lives 1688 Gramercy Park North. All right, now let's get to the meaty part. You're accused of the murder of one Alan Lewis. Yeah. Used to be a clerk in your drugstore. That's right. Please claim you killed him Monday, which is yesterday, Mm -hmm. yesterday evening Mm -hmm. at his Park Avenue... Park Avenue? Yeah, so they claim. Well, did you kill him, Mr. Avon? Absolutely not. Mm. And my job... Is to find out who did kill him, so that I don't have to carry that burden around, too. What's the other burden, Mr. Avon? Well, there are two sides to every question in my business. I don't... All right, we'll skip that temporarily. Now, let's see. The cops hold you in for the murder of your clerk. Ex-clerk. He hadn't been working for me for a year. Living off the fat of the land. Why they pick on you, Miss Ravon? Because I was supposed to be there last night at 8 o'clock. That's when it happened to him. And also, I'm supposed to have a motive for his murder. Well, did you have a motive? Well, if a guy's been blackmailing you for a year... Blackmail? What do you have on you, Mr. Avon? Well, now, I, I don't know that I... Ma, let's have it. Well, well, narcotics. Narcotics? We had a deal going, sort of, with uh, narcotics. The lawyer knows all about it. I want to know. Well, I, I was looking for easy money, and I'm doing all right. This this Alan Lewis, he learns about it. He was working for me, you understand, and, and he starts holding me up. And so last night, when he's murdered... The... I came there to talk with him, but he wasn't home. That's all. He wasn't home. Then last night, the police picked me up, and I don't even know what they're talking about. Who's your lawyer? Richard Evans. Dick Evans. Oh. You know him? Yeah, I know Dick. Mr. Chambers, I, you, you've got to help me out of this jam. Not the narcotics, pal. No, no, the murder. And it'll cost you 5,000 simoleons. Well, that's fair enough. Cash on the barrel head. I don't trust guys like you. Okay, but I don't have it on me. If you'll accompany me to the bank, well, hey, I... I can't say I admire my choice of companion. You're an insulting Let's one Let's go, I'm Mr. Avon. Sure. We'll discuss it on the way. You get to the bank and you're paid and you kiss him off like you'd kiss off a king cobra that just became a client. But if the guy's not guilty of murder, it's your job to prove it. That's what you're being paid for. So you get rid of him. And you go downtown to the offices of B. Richard Evans. Regal, legal, eagle. Hi, honey. Mr. Evans in? Uh, well, I'm well, in. I... All right, Pete. Come on. Ah. I've been expecting you. Hi, Dick. How are things going? Fine, fine, Pete. Come right on in. Okay. Dick Evans, boy lawyer. Black hair, beak nose, and cyclone cellar voice. A two-tone personality split at five o'clock. Tricky as a slippery bath mat before the deadline, but afterward, wide open and roaring. A wielder of martinis, 
like a good farmer with a pitchfork. What brings you, Mr. Detective? Charles Avon, Dick. How easy was it getting him out on that writ? Easier than getting stepped on in the subway. Because why, Counselor? Because the prosecution doesn't have a thing on him. Well, they got motive. Motive isn't murder, Mr. Chambers. Well, how'd that guy get it, that uh, Alan Lewis? Two bullets. One ripped through his right shoulder, rather unimportant. The second one pasted in over his right eye. Very important. Hmm. Prosecution got the gun? No, sir, they don't. All they got is motive, period. They gave him a nine-hour grilling, and all they could come up with was motive. Okay, okay, okay. Now, what about the other charge? What other charge? The narcotics. Well, I'm going to plead him guilty on that. He ought to get a light sentence because without Alan Lewis, they've hardly got a case. Well, here comes motive again for the death of Alan Lewis. Well, the police know all about that. How much good has it done them? By the way, uh, how do they know? Who told them? Uh, Frankie Tokers. Frankie Tokers. Uh, male or female? Female. But good and female. You're uh, going to like that when you come to it. I like it already, just from looking at your face. Uh, have another slice of motive, Mr. Chambers. This one's on Frankie. She was engaged to Alan Lewis. That's motive? Not yet it's not, but this is. She's the beneficiary on his insurance policy for $30,000. Plus, she's the one who informed the police that the Lewis boy was putting the touch on Avon for the blackmail. Well, how'd she know? Her boyfriend confided in her. Oh. Well, how'd she stand, uh, suspect-wise? Oh, she's got an alibi, don't they all? Frankie told me a very gorgeous number. He sings at the rumpus room with an equally gorgeous blonde partner with whom you will kindly have no truck. Why? Because that one is sort of reserved for me. Do <laughs> uh, you have this Frankie Tokers phone number, Dick? Got it written down somewhere. Name, address, and phone number. Ah, right, here you are. Thanks. Yeah, yeah. You can trick. That's Frankie. Miss Tokers? This is Miss Tokers. Uh, Collins from the insurance company. There's been a slight complication. May I come to see you? Oh, uh, well, when? Oh, right away. The sooner the better. Well, all right, if you insist. I should be here most of the afternoon. Ah, good. I'll see you shortly then. Bye, Miss Tokers. So you leave the lawyer and you go visit the lady. This is supposed to be the part the private eye enjoys, but don't make book on that. Because most of the dear ladies turn out to look like bats on a vacation from the belfry. This one happily doesn't. Uh, 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 Miss Tokers? <laughs> yes, I'm Miss Tokers. Uh, Mr. Collins from the insurance company. Oh, yes. Please come in. Frankie Tokers. She's wearing a hostess gown, a metallic number in gold. Imagine that wrapped around a dream-bunched figure. Frankie Tokers. Tall, with an oval face and wide, dark eyes that glint like brandy bottles under bar lights. You don't fool around with a kid like that. Um, Mr. Collins? <laughs> I'm sorry. My name's not Collins, Miss Tokers, and I'm not from the insurance company. My name's Chambers, Peter Chambers. I'm a private detective. And they tell me that you're on a spot. Get out. Now, just a minute. Get Mr. out. Get out, now, I tell look, you. look, 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 lady. I think you've got me pegged wrong. Please. Oh, please. You explain the situation and tears come up in the blackberry brandy eyes. Naturally, you put your arm around her. And just as naturally, she puts her head on your shoulder. A sobbing brunette close in the arms of the private detective. There you have the classic situation. But you've been paid 5,000 bucks to find out who killed Cock Robin, so <laughs> reluctantly you break it up. No, no, no. I know how you feel, Miss Tokers. You love the guy, but he's dead. Not true. Huh? I hated him. But you were engaged to be married, weren't you? That was going to end when I found out what he was really like. And um, whose idea was that $30,000 life policy with you as beneficiary? His. His, of course. But that was going to be finished, too. Mm. Mr. Chambers, I couldn't tell the police. But I will tell you. Why? Because I want you to help me. Look, sister, you didn't kill him, did you? Oh, no, no, no. Listen. Listen, last night, the night he was killed, I went there. I was going to tell him off and finish it off completely. What time? Nine o'clock. It was between shows. I'm a singer at the rumpus room. Yeah, I know. Anyway, when I got there, there was no answer. I kept ringing, but there was no answer, and I was worried. I went back to the club, and I called on the phone. No answer. 
Then I called the police and told them that there was trouble there. I didn't say who was calling. Oh, wait, now, wait, wait. Hold, hold, hold up just for a minute. First, why the police, just because the guy's not home? And second, how did you know there was trouble there? Because I knew that he had an appointment with Mr. Charles Avon for 8 o'clock. And it was going to be a long talk. And I knew what the talk was about. And what was it about? About more money. More blackmail money. Oh. Oh, oh I see. It figured for a trouble party, huh? Yes. And when the guy didn't answer at 9 o'clock, it was your idea that the trouble had exploded? Exactly. And one hour after the phone call, the police were at the club, investigating the murder of Alan Lewis. I told them everything I knew about the narcotics that Mr. Avon was dealing in and about Alan's blackmail. And about how he was going to raise the ante at this meeting between them. Well, that answers why Charles Avon was picked up. Uh, what about your alibi? I fixed that up with my singing partner. I arranged for her to say that I'd been with her all the time in our dressing room. But I'm scared, Mr. Chambers. I'm sick, scared inside of me. Help me. Please, help me. Oh, Miss Tokers, I'd hate it if you did put those slugs into Alan. I didn't. I didn't. Oh, I didn't. She's asking for it. And you answer. You take her face in your hands, put your lips on hers, and you leave them there. With excellent results. But then you quit. You crash out of there and you're heading for police headquarters. But you detour for Charles Avon's drugstore. Good to see you again, Mr. Chambers. Hi, I was uh, thinking I might want to drop into your home tonight. Uh, would you be there perhaps later on? No, but my wife will. Oh, you don't know her. Oh, oh. she's here right now. I'd very much like to have you meet her. Nancy? Yes? Yeah, my dear, Peter Chambers, the gentleman I told you about. Uh, my wife, Nancy Avon. She's a small blonde, too young and too pretty for Charlie Boy. She's wearing gold-rimmed black men's goggles and you can't see her eyes. She's smooth-skinned and good-looking. But jumpy, nervous as a lion tamer who's lost his whip. Did, did, did you wish to speak to me, Mr. Chambers? Uh, very much, but I don't have the time now. May I speak with you later? Of course, but I'm leaving for home now. Well, may I call you there? Well, it's a little upset. It's made day off, but if you wish... I wish. I wish. See you later. Bye, Mr. and Mrs. Avon. And so you're riding your broom again, making time for police headquarters, and then you're there. Come in. Come in. Well, Pete, to what do I owe the honor? Charles Avon, Louis, a paid-up client. So? Maybe you think you can do more than cops can do. Huh? I doubt it, but I can try. Detective Lieutenant Louis Parker, homicide. Thick, set, and sturdy like a brand-new refrigerator and just about as enthusiastic. But a good cop. And mostly a good friend. What's the pitch? I'm being paid $5,000 to find out who put the chill on Alan Lewis. Well, $5,000 to do what we'd do anyway. Huh? Brother, yours is one business. Mm -hmm. Okay, what do you want? Help. <laughs> That's hot. You're getting five G's. What do we get? Well, any information that happens to fall my way, and no byline, you get all the credit. You buying? What do you want, kid? Well, I'd like to see the inside of Alan Lewis's apartment. I'll buy that. In fact, I'll go with you. Got a cop staked out there? Nobody's staked out there. I've got better things to do with cops than having them sitting around getting fat. <laughs> okay, what else? Well, anything else that's not too terribly confidential? <laughs> not this case, Petey. We got us a nice fat group of nothing. Uh, well, then that's it, Lieutenant. Let us go look at apartments. <laughs> Alan Lewis's joint turns out to be the usual bachelor's flat fitted out to please the ladies. Parker snoozes in the bedroom while you poke around like a critical matron seeking dust in the upholstery. In the library, a book sticks out like a sore thumb in a working pickpocket. You pull it out and an envelope drips to the floor. You pick that up and examine it. It's slid on top and it contains a letter. It's addressed to Mrs. Nancy Avon, 1688 Gramercy Park, North New York City. You don't stop to read the letter. You stick it in your pocket and you're ready to leave. Then Parker comes into the room yawning. <laughs> Finished, Sherlock. All done. Let's get out of here. Oh, uh, by the way, I assume you guys gave this place a going over. Yeah, most of last night. Been through this apartment with a fine tooth comb. Yeah, a fine tooth comb. Hey, is that a crack? No, no crack intended, Lieutenant. Leave us, leave. Yeah, leave us. Outside, Parker goes off, and you're left alone. Frankie Toker's place is nearby, and. Well, maybe you're looking for an excuse to go back. 
Hello, Mr. Chambers. Oh, may I come in? Please do. You bring her up to date, you take the letter out of the envelope, and you read. Dear Nancy, finished is finished. Now you've got it in writing. I don't see the sense, but if you insist, you can come over Monday at 7.30. You can't stay long. As it happens, I have a date with Charles for 8 o'clock. Yours, Alan. The date matches. Monday, yesterday. The night he was killed. That letter puts her right in the middle, doesn't it? Say, do you know anything about these two, Nancy Avon and Alan Lewis? She was sweet on him, and he encouraged her. Oh. Charlie Avon didn't even know it was cooking, but she was planning to divorce him. And then Alan Lewis cooled off. You mean, uh, when he met you? He'd have cooled off anyway. That's the kind of guy he was. Real loyal. Shot through with integrity. Hmm. Well, how'd she take it, you know? He told me. She was plenty worked up over it. Okay, Miss Tokers. Uh, Frankie. Mm-hmm. Well, you cross your fingers, and if I'm lucky, you're out of a jam. Oh, I'd appreciate that. Would I appreciate that? You figure your next stop for your last stop. 1688 Gramercy Park North. Oh. Oh, Mr. Chambers. Please come in. Mrs. Avon. She's dressed in Chinese type lounging pajamas and she's not wearing the dark lens specs. You look at her eyes and a chill goes through you like winter has suddenly gotten into the marrow of your bones. Wild eyes, quick-moving, darting, half-mad eyes. The pupils dilated almost to the rim. Something, Mr. Chambers? Uh, a few questions. Questions? Why questions of me? Well, I've got a hunch I've stumbled on something the police don't know. Like, like, like what? Well, like you had a thing going with Alan Lewis. I... Your husband, you hope, didn't know about it. But I, I... There are letters. You saved them. Right, Mrs. Avon? Yes, you were there last night? Yes. I'm sorry, Mrs. Avon. Now, where's the gun? Do you have it? You, you, you say the police don't know. Perhaps, perhaps, I mean, I have Look, money. I'm one of the dumb ones. I'm allergic to bribery. Now, where's the gun? I, I have it. It's hidden here, 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 hidden in the apartment. Will you, will you get it, please? Yes. Yes, I'll get it. it it's my own gun. <laughs> You wait while she goes for it, and you don't like it. But you haven't got the time to work it out now. Because she's coming back, and she's carrying the thing. A chunky, nickel-plated item. And she's holding it, business end forward. You get a scratched hip and a hole in your pants. And you're all ready to slug her, but you don't have to, because she slides down in a faint. You get the gun away from her, find brandy, pour a lot into her, and a little into yourself. And finally, she starts coming, too. I... I fainted. You certainly did, lady. I'm ill. I'm under the care of a psychiatrist. Uh, Gunshot. The sound of gunshot. One shot, and I pass out. Even if I do it myself, I pass out. What happened last night? Almost like it happened here. I was there before he was, and when he came, we argued. I brought the pistol. I was wearing my gloves, and I shot him. And then I fainted. When I came to, I saw he was dead, and I got out of there. Just a minute, just a minute. You say you were there before he was? How'd you get in? I... I have keys. You get her to an easy chair, and you call down to Parker at headquarters. You put in a request for a lot of law, and also for Mr. Charles Avon. Pretty soon, the place is crawling with cops, and you point a finger, and to Lieutenant Parker, you say... I give you a murderer, Lieutenant. But you've got it wrong. You're mistaken. No mistake. It's just where my finger's pointing. I give you, Lieutenant, Mr. Charles Avon. This guy's nuts. A lot of things he is. Nuts he ain't. Go on, Pete. Here's a guy who comes in and hires me for $5,000 for something the New York City police can do much better and for nothing. You're stealing my lines, chump. But the guy's not crazy. He's got a purpose. He's also got a large contempt for the thoroughness of the police, which I haven't. Start making sense, Petey boy. Read this. You toss the letter to Detective Lieutenant Parker And the room is as quiet as a cemetery Until he's through reading it So? I found that letter 
from Mrs. Avon to Alan Lewis. I found it in Lewis's apartment. Now, wait a minute. We gave that place an extra special going over. That letter wasn't there. You don't have to convince me. Convince Charles Avon. That baby goes and sees the wrong movies. He's got no confidence in cops. No wait. question. The letter wasn't there. But I found it there. So it adds up to plant. Somebody planted it there. Wanted it found there. Somebody wanted to implicate Mrs. Nancy Avon. Who? Who had access to her mail? Huh? Friend husband, that's who. No. Why do you think he hired me? So I could bumble around and find a few things he wanted me to find. Like frustrated love, like that letter, like like maybe a confession from Mrs. Avon, which I got. She confessed? Doesn't mean a thing. Let me do it chronologically, will do you, Do it any way you like, pal. Nancy Avon goes there at 7.30 to keep her date. Yes. She brings her gun because the young guy's giving her the air. She waits for him, he comes, they argue, she shoots him, and she faints. One shot. But the guy had two bullet holes in it. Correct. But here's how he got the second. Charles Avon's got a hate for both of them. For Alan and for Nancy. Alan's been blackmailing him, plus the wife is sweet on Alan. He's been sleeping open her mail, and he knows she's going to meet him last night. So he oh. follows. He follows, hoping against hope for action, and action happens. And then he gets in there, he sees Alan bleeding from the shoulder wound, and the wife in a faint on the floor. He picks up the gun, finishes off Alan, wipes the prince off, puts it back in her hand, and vamooses. She comes to, sees the dead Alan, and she gets out convinced that she killed him. And then we pick up Charlie on the strength of Miss Toker's story, but the lawyer gets him sprung on a writ. Right. So this morning, he goes to Lewis's apartment, and he sticks that letter where it can't be missed. No, no, I... Real contempt he has for the efficiency of cops, hasn't he? Anyway, he hires me so I can clean up some loose ends and lay the whole deal in the lady's lap. The minute I saw that letter, I knew it was a plan. It happens that I've got respect for cops. They never miss that kind of evidence. Uh, one great big catch. Now, I know what you're going to say. What? How did he get in there twice? Once to croak the guy and once to plant the letter. Correct. Mrs. Avon had keys. Mr. Avon made duplicates. He figured he'd have use for them sooner or later. Well, he used them all right, and by now he's disposed of them. But he hasn't disposed of the key maker. Meaning what? Meaning that when a guy swipes his wife's keys to make duplicates, he doesn't go far. So you can demonstrate to Mr. Avon about the efficiency of cops by producing and with dispatch. The neighborhood key maker who did the job and that, that will put the final finger on Mr. Charles Avon. No, no, I didn't. All no, right, Mr. Mr. Avon. That does it. Charles Avon goes white and topples and when he gets up, the manacles are around his wrist and he's babbling his brains out. Lawyer or no lawyer... This time, he's going to get locked away for good. Nice work. Great A job, Petey. Congratulations. <laughs> well, now. Appreciation from a detective lieutenant to a private eye, that's sweet music indeed. But you start breaking out of there because you're heading for Frankie Toker's place. Appreciation from detective lieutenant Parker, good enough. But appreciation from Miss Frankie Toker. Well, no. And there you've had crime and Peter Chambers. Dane Clark was starred as Peter Chambers. Crime and Peter Chambers transcribed was created and written by Henry Kane. Bill Zuckert was heard as Lieutenant Parker with Leslie Woods, Edgar Staley, and Lawson Zerby. It was directed by Fred Way. This is Fred Collins inviting you to tune in next week, same time, same station, for Dane Clark in Crime and Peter Chambers. Hear the Oppenheimer story on Heart of the News, tonight on the NBC Radio Network. Crime and Peter Chambers. Created by Henry King. Transcribed and starring Dane Clark. A private investigator, duly licensed and duly sworn. Peter Chambers. You're a private eye. That's your business. Anything else? That's for laughs. There are no laughs in this one, not unless you're a ghoul. 
because you're strolling in a graveyard at midnight. You're walking in a cemetery out on Long Island. That's the job of work you're being paid for. You've got a package in your left hand and a flashlight in your right. Your imagination is starting to do nip-ups when you get an interruption. What about the flashlight? Uh, uh, yes, sir. Now reach back and hand me that package. Well, you're supposed to give me the word. Word? Well, them's my instructions, pal. A real melodramatic bit. You're supposed to say a name. Abner Reed. Well, that's the jackpot answer. Reach and grab your prize. And notice, please, I've still got my head turned. And it better stay that way if you don't want holes in it. And you stay the way you are for the next five minutes. But you don't stay the way you are for the next five minutes for two reasons. One, five minutes in a graveyard is like, say, five years on the French Riviera. And two, you're blessed or is it cursed with a large lump of curiosity. So you turn, and you don't turn a moment too soon because you drop. You look to where Mr. Invisible disappeared, but you don't try to go after him because he's gone. And all the way back to town, you ponder about why the guy took pot shots at you. You didn't see him. He made sure you didn't. So why the extra precaution of a spray of bullets? Well, he missed you, so you shrug it off, and pretty soon you're in town at the fancy Fifth Avenue mansion of Mrs. Abner Reed. Well, back so soon, Mr. Chambers. Mission accomplished, milady. Come in. Please come in, sir. Mrs. Abner Reed. Born Florence Fleetwood Lovejoy. Thrice married and rolling, you should pardon the expression, in mucho dinero. Worth maybe 25 million bucks and reputed to be stingy about the whole thing. Here's your fee, Mr. Chambers, as per agreement. One thousand dollars. Thank you, ma'am. And now, may I know what it's all about? You know what was in that package? <laughs> Goulash for ghosts. Two hundred and fifty thousand dollars. What? A quarter of a million dollars. Uh, look, Mrs. Reed, you have a reputation for being, well, eccentric, but... Business transactions in the middle of the night in a graveyard. That That's... wasn't exactly a business transaction, Mr. Chambers. Well, what then? It was a delivery of ransom money. What? You mean I'm mixed up in some kind of a cockeyed kidnapping? Not exactly mixed up. You were an instrument of delivery. A chore for which you've just been paid. The, the police know about this? Not yet. Not yet? Well, when do you expect to inform them? Tomorrow morning. Look, what happened here? Well, last night, my husband stepped out for a newspaper. Huh? He, he didn't return for, for two hours. Naturally, I was perturbed. Well, naturally. I thought, well, perhaps he'd stepped into a tavern for a drink. But then I got a phone call. He'd been slugged, rendered unconscious and kidnapped. Well, how can you be sure? There was no doubt. It was he himself who was talking to me, with a gun pointed at his head. I see. I was told they'd call back this morning. And they did. Would you be able to recognize the voice? They're too smart for that. They put him back on the phone. Oh. The arrangements were made, and then came the question as to who would make the delivery. You're very well known, Mr. Chambers, and yours is an excellent reputation. Well, thank you. They're supposed to return him to me during this night. Quarter of a million dollars. I'm regarded as, a, well, a, a rather frugal person, but this is... Different. We've only been married six months, and I believe you know from the newspapers, my husband is 20 years younger than I am. Uh, yes, uh, Abner Reed, I read about it. And I suppose you want me to clear out of here. Frankly, I do. But you are going to the cops with this. Definitely, tomorrow morning, whether he's returned to me or not. At least then I'll know that I've done what I could to effect his release. <laughs> they warned me that I was being watched. That if I called in the police, they'd... They'd kill him. Uh, easy, easy, does it, Mrs. Reed? Easy, easy. <laughs> Good night, and thanks. <laughs> so, you go home. You feel sorry for the old gal with the young husband. You think she's nuts not to contact cops, but... You can't creep into another person's soul. You go home and you have a bit of scotch and you chase it with another bit of scotch. 
You've had a tough evening, and you're ready to wrap up this day and put it to bed when... In the middle of the night, you've got a caller. That's the life of a private eye, about as much privacy as a parakeet in a kindergarten. But it can always be a client. Somebody's turned off the car to lights, and it's pitch black out there. And suddenly, the blackness is punctuated with blazing light. Oh, oh, oh. You're hit. And you don't know how bad... To get to the phone. Oh. Hello? Oh, operator? A hospital? A hospital? Emergency? You're under sedatives for a day while they probe for the bullets. And then you're sitting up in the hospital bed raring to go. But they tell you five days. Five days before they'll let you out of there. And then you get a caller. Amiable, but worried looking. Hi, Detective. Hey, you're coming around real good. Hi, Lieutenant. What brings you? As if you didn't know. He stares down at you. Detective Lieutenant Parker, New York City Police. Stern, square. And a friend. That Abner Reed shindig. I hear you were an innocent bystander in the cemetery. Did they return the guy? Yeah. None the worse for his experience. Newspapers got it yet? No, we're trying to work it through before it gets any publicity. Well, what kind of a guy is he, this Abner Reed? Oh, nice enough kid. He used to be a dancing instructor. That's how he met the lady with the bucks. Oh. She been liberal with him? Mm, liberal as she can be, I suppose. Rich, but plenty tightwad, that one. What did he do for amusement before uh, before he got married? He ran around a lot. Nightclub stuff and things. Handsome kid. Figures for a lot of gals. Why this uh, line of questioning? Huh? I'm trying to get an idea as to his background. If it was hard guys that he used to run around with, it might clue us to the brains behind the snatch. It's all been done, my lad. And what uh, we've come up with is a large selection of zeros. Now, uh, <clears throat> let's hear your story, huh? You give it to him. The whole deal, and his face furrows up as he ponders it. <laughs> what makes you a target, Pete? I wish I knew. First the attempt at the cemetery, then the attack at your apartment. You sure you told me everything? Everything I know, Louis. But I'm going to know more. Somebody sets me up as a clay pigeon, and it becomes my job to find out who's taking target practice. Any objections, Lieutenant, to my sticking my nose into it? <laughs> if my objections could keep you out. Thanks, pal. Okay, then I'll beat it now. You get your rest. But remember, when they let you out of here, we work this one together, huh? Sure enough, Lieutenant. <laughs> anger and well-being seem to run hand in hand. And as your health improves, so your anger mounts. By the time you're out of the hospital, you're tense as a piano wire and fit to bust wide open. You run around and ask questions. You see Mrs. Reed several times. The husband's in the mute of recuperating, but Parker's interviewed him time and again and has squeezed every possible fact out of him. And now the husband's back in town, but you're not wasting your time there anymore. Parker's an expert, and Parker's already wrung him dry. So now you're sitting in your office and thinking about your next move. And then your next move is made for you. Oh? Chambers. Peter Chambers. Yeah, this is he. My name is Sandra Mantell. I live at 1786 East 54th Street, apartment 2, downstairs. Yes, Miss Mantell. Okay, I want to talk to you about a kidnapping. Hmm? The kidnapping of Abner Reed. What? What's that? I'm involved in it. With my idea, really, I dreamed it up. What? I was supposed to get a third. One third share. I'm not getting it, so I want to talk. Yes, yes, Sandra. I want you to make a deal for me, Mr. Chambers. If I spill, I want to be able to cop a plea. If I turn in that, that state's evidence, I want a suspended sentence. Well, why are you calling me? Because I know you're mixed up in it. Because I want you to go to the cops and tell them I'll spill the whole deal. Nobody's going to cross me and get a word. Hello? 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 The address she gave you is near, near enough. You slam out of the office and you run all the way. And then you're there, apartment two. And you're in the presence of death. 
A blonde with blood on her face. But there's another blonde standing by, and this one's very much alive. <laughs> Who are you? Peter. Peter Chambers. Now, this girl was talking to me when that happened. You... You didn't do it, did you? No. No. Who are you? Betty... Betty Royal. My name's Betty Royal. I, I'm her roommate. I've, I've only been her roommate for a week. Did you call the cops? Yes. Yes, I phoned. <laughs> A well-stacked blonde. A beautiful blonde. A live one. The dead one must have been pretty, too. You prowl around and you see the gun on the floor. You see that the receiver's back on the hook, too. But that figures. Betty Royal said she called the cops. Let me tell you. Let me tell you what Look, happened. Wait, 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 wait. Let me ask the questions, Miss Royal. Now, that gun on the floor. Is that yours? No. No, uh, no. It's not fine. Easy, I found it. Easy, easy, does it. Easy. But I... Now, just tell me. Tell me what happened. I was coming back from rehearsal. Yeah? I, I, I'm a ballet dancer. And, and as I came into the hallway, I, I heard the shots. I hurried forward. The door opened and a, a man came running out. We went up into each other and, and that's when the gun dropped to the floor. He struck me and ran out. What did he look like? I have no idea. He, I came in and I found her. Like that. <laughs> she was dead. And then? I, I went out in the hall for the gun. I remembered about not touching things. Fingerprints. I, I, I kicked it with my foot. I kicked it along until I worked it into the apartment. Good girl. Then then I picked up the dangling receiver and I called the police. <laughs> she's in tears again. And you go to her and you hold her. And she's a cuddly little package. And you think about how sweet this could be under different circumstances. Cops. Lots of cops. Tons of cops. And they're in charge of Detective Lieutenant Louis Parker. Never fails, huh? When there's a corpse, there's you. It's mixed up with the other thing, Lieutenant. What other thing? You straighten them out on current events. From the phone calling your office to right now. You wearing a gun, Pete? Yeah, yeah. Good. Now listen to me. For once, will you listen to me? Don't I always listen, Lieutenant? Okay. There's some kind of crazy killer loose, right? Right. And he's mixed up with that Abner Reed snatch, right? Right as rain, Lieutenant. And you're still unfinished business on his list, right? Right as a real down So go Louise. home, go home and lock the door. You stay there. Now, what are you going to do in the meantime? I'm going to work at my trade. But I'll come up and see you, Pete, as soon as I get loose from all this, and then we'll knock it around some more. But don't open your door to anybody but me. So you go home. You're a good little boy and you've listened to Papa. You sit around like an old lady with lumbago. But you sit. You do some home cooking and some home drinking. But you sit. Finally, at two in the morning. Who is it? Louis Parker. Oh. Bit of the cup that cheers, Lieutenant? Yeah, I can use a little cheer. There you are. Thank you. It's the right spot. Well, look, let's get down to Cases, Lieutenant. Ah, there's my boy. Always in there pitching. Cases, Louis. Well, Petey boy, that gun on the floor was the murder gun. Good. And we've got a gorgeous set of fingerprints off it. Only prints on it, as a matter of fact. Good. So, now we come to the catch. There's got to be a catch. The prints match nothing that we've got on file. Don't match anything out of Washington. Where's that leave us? Way out in left field on a rainy day, but there's no ball game. Guess who is her boyfriend? Guess who whose boyfriend? The dead doll? That's Sandra Mantell. Oh, by the way, you know what her business was? I don't know nothing. Pooch dancer, burlesque. Pretty good at it, too. I'm thrilled. Now, who's the boyfriend? Nikki Darrell. What? Nikki Darrell. Oh, that was a rhetorical what, Lieutenant. It was a what of amazement, a what of astonishment, a what of shock. Okay, all right, stop picking Nikki on me. Nikki Darrell, huh? Well, don't you call that a lead? We had him in, we questioned him, we did the fingerprint bit. Total reaction negative. We had to release him. What time is it? It's, uh, 2.30 in the morning. Let's get out of here. Out. Where are you going? Work. You? I'm going to sleep. Pete? Yes, Lieutenant. Be careful. Nicky Darrow. A hoodlum with big ideas. Ex-gunman, ex-con, ex-crook. Gone real respectable now. Owner of a fancy saloon. Caterer to Cafe Society. Big wheel with the theatrical folk. 
For way down deep under, deadly is a two-headed rattlesnake bent on mischief. You get to Nick's place, which is hopping, and you jostle through the happy people to Nick. Well, the private eye for a long time no seesaw. Can I talk to you, Nicky? Sure, talking with you. Nicky's liable to get educated. <laughs> he's big, he's arrogant, he's power drunk. He leads you through to the back and he sits you down. There you are, Pelzo. Real nice and comfortable. Have a drink, huh? At a house. Okay? Thanks, Nicky. Waiter, a couple of drinks here. Scotch for the eyeball. That's his drink, Scotch. Was it tickling your pal? That kind of tickling, you can die laughing. What are you talking about? Bullets. You on my back, Nicky. Me? I don't even know what you're beginning to think you want to talk about. Somebody's blowing spitballs at me, Nicky. Any idea who? No, sir. I got no idea who. No how. Good enough. Now we shift the gear. Girlfriend of yours died today of unnatural causes. Yeah, so I hear. Any ideas on that? Like uh, who done it? No, but I'm going to find out, pal. This is one time I'm working on your side. Okay, now we shift to high. You beginning to stick your dirty mitts into kidnapping, too? Talk nice to Nicky. I talk the way I want to talk. To whom I want to talk. Yeah. <laughs> You're a sweetheart kind of guy, a lot of guts. I like a guy with a lot of guts. The answer is no. No to what? You have a little sense, pal. The snatch racket is out for any guy with brains. There's easier ways to turn a buck. That's all. Bye now, Nicky. Live it up. Have fun, big shot. Hey, there's drinks coming. We'll skip it this trip. So you're back where you started, fresh out of Leeds. And it goes on like that for the next few days. Long days, lumpy ones, slow moving. And you're wearing your hardware and you're turning to look over your shoulder wherever you are. You've called on Betty Royal a few times and you like that. You like that very much. And now you're calling on her again for no reason at all except uh, that you like that very much. But you find her breathless with excitement. I found something, Mr. Chambers. I think it could be important. Pete. Pete, not Mr. Chambers. Pete, remember? Yes, Peter. <laughs> a little black book. It belongs to... Well, it belonged to Sandra. She must have put it into my bag by mistake, and that bag's been in my locker at rehearsal hall. Let's see it. A little black book with a lot of names, and not one that means anything to you. But they may mean a lot to Parker, so... You latch on to the lovely Betty Royal, who's as lovely and as regal as her name, and off you go, a chattering twosome, downtown to police headquarters, downtown to Detective Lieutenant Parker, and you barge in without knocking because you think you've got right, only to find that he's got company, so you start backing out again. Come in, come in, Pete, Miss Royal. Thank you kindly, Governor. Thank you. Companies, a tall young man with a bruiser's shoulders and an angel's face. Lieutenant Parker, I found a little black book. I found it in my locker. It, it, it doesn't belong to me. Mistaken uh, bags. It, it's Sandra's. Sa- Sandra Mantel's. This, Mantel. this I, I... is the little black book, Lieutenant. Yes. Prattling is guards given right to a beautiful girl. Well, thank you, Peter. Uh, by the way, let me introduce Abner Reed. I don't think you two have ever met. Uh, Abner Reed, Peter Chambers, Miss Betty Royal. Oh, how, how do you do? How do you do? Well, I don't know you. Well, Lieutenant, as we were saying... Wait a minute, wait a minute. Situation... What did you say your name was? Well, I just told you. I'm asking him. Come on, fella, keep talking. What did you say your name was? My name? As the lieutenant told you, Abner Reed. Abner Reed, of course. You jump him right away. You don't wait. He's big and you want the first punch. And you get the first punch in, but he takes it standing up and let's do a few of his own. All right, stop it. Break it up. What the devil's going on here? You slip by a couple of his lefts and then he's wide open and you come up with one off the floor and he catches it clean on the button. And now he's down and out. And he'll stay out until someone brings him to. You're crazy, man. That's assault and battery. You're, you're going to do time, fella. Yeah. Boy, you really flipped your wig this time. Here, let me help Stay you. away from him. Now, look, Peter. Look, you and I, Lieutenant, we've thrown a lot of questions around. There's a couple of answers coming up right now. Like what? Like why I was shot at at the graveyard and shot up in my apartment. Like why Sandra Mantell was killed. Like why she called me in the first place. Like why that gun has fingerprints. Easy, easy, easy. One at a time. Oh, huh? let's take the last one first. Fingerprints on a gun. Yeah. 
A guy dropping it when he collides with a dame. Panicking, running out, leaving it there. Does that sound professional? Not especially. Well, a rule's out of pro. What does a rule in? An amateur. So? So let's do it right side up now. Now, here's a guy, Abner Reed. He married a large hunk of dough. But he can't reach too much of it because she's frugal. So? So at the suggestion of a friend of his, Miss Sandra Mantell, and you'll find, I'm sure, with a good deal of digging, that those two had a close sub Rosa association. Well, never uh, mind what I'll find out. Let's get this over with first. On her suggestion, they figured out a beauty. The guy kidnapped himself. Remember Mrs. Reed talked in the alleged ransom discussions to nobody but him on the phone? Yes, yeah. He knew the old dame. She'd pay and play ball, which she did. But why? Why were you attacked there in the cemetery? Well, because Reed didn't want any remnants hanging around. But, Pete, how did you tab him so quick? He never bothered to disguise his voice in the graveyard. He figured to leave me there for dead, and this was the first time I've heard it since. So he punches bullets at you in your apartment, and that time he almost made it. And then, then when, when he wouldn't abide with Sandra, she decided Everybody's, she... everybody's a detective. Although you're 100% right, Betty Lass. She called me, knew where to call me, because she was in it from the very beginning. He caught her in the act and uh, finished her off. And if you will kindly use the fingers of that comatose gentleman for the purpose of making fingerprint impressions, I don't have a doubt in the world what you'll find. <laughs> And so, one hour later, Abner Reed is booked for murder and extortion. And you're strolling in the joyful sunshine with Betty Royal clinging to your arm tightly and proudly. And what prettier termination can there be to so unfortunate a circumstance as murder? And there you've had crime and Peter Chambers. Dane Clark was starred as Peter Chambers. Crime and Peter Chambers transcribed was created, produced, and written by Henry Kane. Others in the cast were Bill Zuckert, heard as Lieutenant Parker, with Evelyn Barden, Patricia Wheel, and Roger DeCoven. It was directed by Fred Way. This is Fred Collins inviting you to tune in next week, same time, same station, for Dane Clark in Crime and Peter Chambers. Visit with Fibber McGee and Molly tonight on the NBC Radio Network. Crime and Peter Chambers. Created by Henry King. Transcribed and starring Dane Clark. Private investigator, duly licensed and duly sworn, Peter Chambers. You're a private eye. That's your business. Anything else? That's for laughs. It's one of those dark brown nights, dirty with rain. You're home and you're doing calisthenics with a scotch bottle. It isn't so much that you enjoy a drink, but, after all, you're a private eye. You might get waved out of the league if you didn't keep in practice. You're contemplating a warm shower and an early go-to-bed when... Hello? Mr. Chambers. Peter Chambers. At your service, ma'am. If it's service you want. Oh, I'm glad. I'm so glad I was able to reach you. Oh, I'm glad you're glad, lady. What is it, please? My name is Doyle. Mary Doyle. I own a rooming house at 801 West 53rd. That's quite near. Perhaps ten minutes from where you are. Now, look, Mr. Chambers, it's kind of kind of a bodyguard job for tonight. Tonight? Oh, lady, it's murder tonight. It's pouring rain. I know it, sir, but this is... It's kind of an emergency, sir. Oh, better be. A hundred thousand dollars in cash. She's got a hundred thousand dollars up... Oh! Hello. Hello! <laughs> Fine night to be making a house call, but emergency, the lady said, and it certainly sounded like the emergency had bust wide open. So, you're fighting the rain, making tracks for a rooming house at 801 West 53rd. And then you're there. And you shove at the buzzer. 
and you get no answer. And you turn the knob, and you're inside. Inside is a spacious downstairs room, a flight of steps going up. There's a phone on a corner table, and its receiver is dangling. And there's a lady seated in front of it, about 40, red-haired, buxom, quite attractive, if uh, you're thinking in large terms. She's wearing silk lounging pajamas with shoes to match, and she's out like the proverbial light. You go to her quickly, and you slap her back uh, to life. Uh, uh, All no, right, there. No, come, no, on. Stop. come on. Stop. Easy does it, lady. Uh, uh, you coming around now? Uh, oh. All right? Yeah. Oh, somebody slugged me, but good. Miss Doyle? Or uh, is it Miss Doyle? Yeah, Miss Doyle. You, who are you? What are you doing here? Who are you? Peter Chambers. You were talking to me on the phone. Oh, good. Look, I'll be with you in a moment. Wait Please a don't go hey. away. Uh, here's a new gimmick. You find an unconscious woman, and when you bring her around, she shoots off like a rocket come Mardi Gras. Well, Screams to a private detective are like spurs to a racehorse. You fly up the stairs and you find Mary Doyle in a room with an open door. And there's a lady on the floor, quite rigid. And near her, a small instrument of large consequence, a nickel-plated revolver. Dead. She's dead. They shot her. There's the gun. Don't touch that. But, but the gun. Just leave that lie. Now, what's all this about? Just a minute. Well, what are you looking for now? A little black bag. A little black bag. What's that got to do with this there whole... There's $100,000 in it, cash money. And it's gone. Look, one thing at a time, lady. Who's the, uh, corpus delicti? Al Godino. And who that? An opera singer. Middley. She was here in this country for a year. Oh, Al Godino. Oh, great soprano. What was she doing here? Uh, she didn't like hotels. I run a very correct theatrical boarding house here. The best. How long did you We were good friends. Look, you better go downstairs and call the cops, and you and I, we'll pick it up after that. All right. All right, sir. Whatever you say. So now you go for the gun, only you lift it with a pinky through the trigger guard. But all your careful care is wasted because there's an interruption slightly from mayhem and the mayhem is directed at you. Get it off. All right, people. You still got the gun. You got me with my hands up in the air. So what's our next move? What are you doing here? What kind of a boarding house is this anyway? Let me tell you. I'm sure I can come up with a good answer if I think about it. And now you get another interruption. But this one's of the opposite gender. She stands in the doorway, blue-eyed, red-lipped, blonde and statuesque. And you'd be wildly interested if it weren't for uh, a slight matter of murder. You with a gun. What's between you and Mr. Brown? Who uh, wants to know? My name is Joan Bradley. Well, I do a low bow, Miss Bradley, except I've got to keep the gun pointed at our friend here. At Mr. Brown? Well, Mr. Brown to you, maybe. Bill Cragg to me, a hood from Louisiana hiding out from a grand jury investigation. Mr. Brown? Just a little misunderstanding. Never mind him. Now, take a look at this, miss. <gasps> Olga. Olga Dino. Very dead and very murdered. No. You live here? Yes, sir. What do you do? I'm a lady magician. Uh, who else lives here? Mr. Brown, Alga, Ralph Hardwood, me, and Miss Doyle. That all in the entire house? It's being renovated. Well, that's all she could accommodate at this time. Okay. Now, my name is Peter Chambers, and right now I'm in charge here. Yes, Mr. Chambers. Is Ralph Hardwood at home? Well, yes, he is. All right, then, my dear lady magician. A favor, please? Yes. Make yourself disappear. And tell Mr. Hardwood to stay in his room, and you, you stay in yours. We'll come to you in due course. All right, sir, if you say so. And now you're alone again with a corpse and Mr. Bill Cragg sporting around under the name of Brown in a theatrical boarding house in New York. Bill Cragg, 
Tall, rugged, shrewd, and rotten as a wormy apple. Any questions, paper? Oh, a lot of them, pal. Well, as you know, I'm hiding out from a little uh, heat in New Orleans. Hmm. So I'm here as Bill Brown, retired actor. That's a crime? I don't know. Maybe it ain't. But what's with jumping me and tussling for that gun? Simple. It's my gun. Hey, that's a pretty frantic admission for a wise guy. That figures to be the heat of that deheated Our Lady here. I got the same figure. So? It's my gun, period. Took a look at my suitcase a couple of minutes ago. My gun was lifted. And I'm coming down past this open door, see the dead dame, see you with a gun, and it begins to add. Maybe I lost my head. But I can't use trouble, brother. And how I can't use trouble. Where were you this evening? Took in a movie. Lousy one. Cops and robbers. When'd you get back? About a half an hour ago. Ask Miss Doyle. I called down for coffee maybe five minutes after I got in. You know anything about a little black bag? Yeah, sure. You know what was in it? A hundred thousand cash bucks. How do you know? Everybody in this house knows. Look, Bill, you didn't kill this dame, did you? No. But I got a hunch that whoever did used my gun to make it look like I did. Uh, this, uh, Joan Bradley, did she know about that little black bag? I told you, everybody knows. What am I wasting my time with you for? I can get the same information and she's prettier. It's your time, people. You get Bill Cragg back to his room admonish him that a run-out powder would be a clean admission of guilt, and then you mosey along to Miss Joan Bradley, who keeps growing on you by leaps and bounds. Come in, Mr. Chambers. Make yourself at home. Hey, you're awfully pretty. I wish I had the time. So do I. Really? Well, you're sort of pretty yourself. (laughs) Well, let's make a date, then. For when? As soon as this thing is over. You... Twisted my arm, Mr. Chambers. I sort of like the way you twist arms. <laughs> okay, then. Let's uh, get back to cases. What's with a little black bag? Oh, well, we were talking about it at dinner today, all of us. Where? Here, downstairs. Miss Doyle was serving. All right, all right. Let's have it, huh? Well, it begins with Algadino. Fine, sweet woman. About how old? Oh, about 45. She had $100,000 in a vault, and tomorrow morning at 9, she was taking the ship to return to Italy. They were going to be married on board They ship. lives here? Yeah, they met here. Young English actor. So? So, she drew the money out of the vault today. She was taking it with her, and she had it in that little black bag. Everybody in the house knew about it? Oh, that was Olga, sweet and trusting. That was the way she was. Never had a bad word for anybody, never a, a bad thought. She felt that the money was just as safe here as in the bank vault, but Mary, Miss Doyle, kept after her all day. Kept after her how? Well, Mary Doyle insisted that Olga hire somebody, sort of a custodian, bodyguard, somebody properly trained and equipped to, to act as custodian until tomorrow morning when they got to the ship. She kept after her all day. Uh, and by nighttime, she probably convinced her. Mm, meaning what? Meaning me. I, I don't understand. It'll be explained to you. There'll be lots of cops here Please. shortly. Uh-huh. Meet Chambers. Come on down here. <laughs> Downstairs, the place is crawling with cops. Detective Lieutenant Louis Parker, friend and gentleman, is in charge. Louis is involved in the interrogation of Miss Mary Doyle and a fine-looking young man who turns out to be Ralph Harwood. You turn the gun over to Louis, and you bring him up to date on your end of the affair, and then he returns to his questioning. Well, two things we got established definitely. The dame is dead, and that bag of loot ain't in the house. That's definite. Now, you, Hardwood. Yes, Lieutenant. That Algadino was 15 years older than you. Was it love or was it money? Love, Lieutenant. With the dame 15 years older than you? Oh, she was younger than any of us, Lieutenant. All right, with the Lieutenant. Let's not make with the metaphors, huh? Were you out of the house tonight? Yes, Lieutenant. I was visiting my sister. Got back about three quarters of an hour ago. After the rain started? Yes, sir, after the rain started. Miss Doyle? Yes, Lieutenant. What about that Joan Bradley? Was she out too? Uh, She was at a rehearsal. She returned about 15 minutes before I called Mr. Chambers. Everybody was out in the rain tonight, huh? Except me. 
Mm. You're sure there were no strangers around here? Very sure. I wasn't out of the house for a minute. Cassidy, get the rest of them down here. Well, soon the whole quorum will be gathered. Uh, Pete, come over here. You and me alone. So, what do you make of it? I don't make a thing yet, Lieutenant. Crazy artists carrying their loot in a bag, begging to get knocked off. It figures that Bill Craig's gun was a weapon. Oh, I'm sure of that. Three bullets out of the gun, three in the dame, but uh, he's already produced a license for it, so don't give us no office to hold him. Yet. You think he'd kill for a hundred Gs? Mm. You know, he's pretty much of a big shot. Never tell with them, any of them. Well, how do you make it? Well, the facts we've got, Mary Doyle is calling you. But somebody doesn't want a bodyguard around. So she gets conked on the cranium, put out of commission. Then that Alga gets knocked off and the bag of loot is stolen. Gets taken out of the house. Our murderer returns before Miss Doyle recovers consciousness, joins the rest of the boys and the girls. Yep. Then you show up and the deal busts wide open. Uh, there's the rest of them. Yeah. Let me go and make a speech. Speech away, Lieutenant. Well, all right, ladies and gentlemen, I'm going downtown to the lab to see what the science boys may have dug out for me, but my cops stay here. Is that understood? Uh, sure. sure. Yes, Lieutenant. All right, nobody leaves. It's clear. Uh, what about me, Lieutenant? <laughs> Sooner you leave, the less trouble we're likely to get into. Now, now, Lieutenant, you're beginning to sound like a uh, lieutenant. <laughs> no objection to my moseying around a little, is there? No objection, provided you report your findings to Papa, and I'm Papa. Yes, sir, Papa. Well, bye now, everybody. Try to act like good little murderers. Well, now, the first step in the mosing around apartment. Anybody uh, hear the shot? Oh, that would have been quite impossible, Mr. Chambers. How do you know my name? Miss Doyle told me. Now, let Miss Doyle tell the rest. Why would it be impossible to hear a shot, Miss Doyle? Because I've been soundproofing the house. It's a theatrical boarding house, you Yes, see. yes, yes, yes. Step number two. Are all of you dressed as you've been dressed, say, for the last couple of hours? Yes, well, yes, of course. Of course we are. Oh, good. Now, step number three. Get your shoes off. All of you. Oh, really? Well, now, look here, old man. It's a rather oh, high-handed man. procedure, don't you think? Shoes off, all of you. Under the supervision of the good officer here, Mr. Cassidy. Now, come on, come on. Off, 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 off there. Now, lay them there on the table. Good, that's good, very good. And what now, sir? And now you all go upstairs, each of you to your respective room. Come on, come on, off you go, my barefooted brigade. Come on, let's go, let's go. Really, a most high-handed procedure. And so, under the rather astonished eyes of Parker's policemen, you do the old Sherlock. You examine the shoes... You feel them, you touch them, you bend them, and you put them back. Then you wriggle into your raincoat and you wave goodbye to the taciturn gentlemen of the law. See you around, fellas. And remember the lieutenant's orders. Nobody comes, nobody goes, except me. And now you're walking in the rain, trying to think. An idea is beginning to glimmer in your mind, and you're waiting for it to catch fire. And a block away, you see a subway station. And a fire in your head has started. You jog down the subway steps. But you're not going anywhere. You've got no train to catch. And downstairs, you see an object of interest. A tall section of public lockers. You go near and insert your dime. But you don't check a thing. Then you prance up the stairs and you make for the nearest tavern and a couple of drinks. But this time they have a purpose to ward off pneumonia because you're wet through and through. And then you're back in the boarding house and you're greeted. Well, 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 the return of Sherlock Holmes. Parker's got them all downstairs again, but none of them are wearing their shoes yet. <laughs> my orders. Look, my dear friend, I like my murder suspects wearing shoes, if it's all right with you. It's not all right with me. Not yet, Lieutenant. Boy, when a private eye goes nuts, it's a matter for the paddy wig. Look, I'm just trying to put two and two together, Lute. You certainly got a crazy way of adding, boy. I'm attempting to produce the murder of Al Godino. Well, produce away, Detective. Pray don't let me interrupt. Well, sir, first off... We've got motive. One hundred thousand motives, all green, and all stuffed into a little black bag. Right. Also, we've got a small but select group. Ranted. 
So when do we produce some oil? Gently, Lieutenant. Gently, gently. Come here. Dig these shoes. Jay, I'm a hipster. I dig these shoes. The most. Uh... Notice? They're all damp. What did you expect them to be? Dry? It's pouring out, remember? Contain yourself, Lieutenant. I... I am contained. All right, let's get back to the beginning. Mary Doyle called me on the phone. Purpose? To protect Algadino's little black bag. Yeah, and the killer heard her and had to act fast. He slugged her, then knocked off the opera singer, then clipped the bag all before you got here. How long did it take? About ten minutes. Okay, so uh, what's with the damp shoes? Joan Bradley's figured to be damp. And mine didn't take? Didn't mine? Why don't you... No, 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 he's right, Lieutenant. His figured to be damp, too. And so did Bill Craggs. They were all out in the rain. But not Mary Doyle. What? You weren't out of the house. Were you, Miss Doyle? That's what you told the lieutenant, remember? Not for a minute, not you. What are you trying to say? I'm asking you to explain why were your shoes wet. Now, look, you. You're not going to push me around with your smart aleck private cop politics. Maybe the shoes are wet. So what? I got a leaky pipe in the kitchen. The floor is damp. Oh, that's a hot one. Explanations for wet shoes. Look, Look, your shoes are wet from the rain. That's a lie. Were you out in the rain, Miss Doyle? Absolutely not. Oh, yes, she was. Can you prove it, Pete? Certainly I can prove it. But she's the one that called you. The one who was most worried about that opera singer and her loot. Strictly a cover-up, Lieutenant. Let me do it right side up for you. First, she knocked off Al Godino up there with the door closed in the soundproof room. And then she called me. Lie, lie, lie! Now either you be good, lady, or I'm going to have to put you under restraint. Let me get you straight, Pete. According to you, she sort of conked herself on the head. You found her like that, supposed to be uncut. And she made sure to leave the outside door unlocked so I could get in. And you got here during that ten-minute period from the time she called. That's when she got her shoesies all wet. You're going to have to prove those statements, Mr. Wise Guy, because I'm going to sue you. I'm going to drag you into court and teach you a lesson. It's about time one of you guys got a lesson. Shut up, lady. Will you please shut up? Now, wait a minute, Pete. About the shoes. She could have changed them, couldn't she? No, no, she couldn't. They're lounging shoes that go with her outfit. If she changed the shoes, she'd have to change the entire getup. She simply didn't have the time. Remember? Ten minutes. So? So she wiped the shoes as best she could, which left them damp. Yeah. She had to work fast in those ten minutes. While you were down the lab with your bright boys, Lieutenant, I was out in the rain, figuring angles. What did you come up with? A subway station. What? There's a subway station a block from here. Downstairs, they've got a flock of those dime parcel check boxes. Now, that figured to be the closest drop. Remember, she was in a hurry, so she checked the little black bag. That's a lie. Oh. Check boxes have little keys. I got no key. Search me. Search the house. There'd be no key here. <sighs> Backing down, huh? Figured I'd break down under your phony third degree. You want to know why? Why what? Why there's no key here? Yeah. Why? Tell me why. Because I've got it. See? Right here. In my hand. What the heck is all this about? She used the oldest gag in the world. Probably thought it was new because she dreamed it up. They all do. Who all do? Amateur criminals. Sure, she didn't keep the check key on a person. Too risky. Instead, she put it in an envelope and she mailed it to herself. The old mailer room. It's a lie. Miss Doyle, you made one mistake. Under certain circumstances, mail can be intercepted. And that's exactly what's been done. You see this key? That's the final bit of evidence that's going to fasten you to the electric chair for murder. The rest is easy. A bit of expert prodding from Parker and she breaks down and they cart her away. The police open that panel of lockers and find a little black bag. Downtown, she confesses that she mailed the check key to herself, care of an aunt in Brooklyn. And one hour later, you and Miss Joan Bradley are at your place, munching corned beef sandwiches and drinking beer. You've kissed her a couple of times, but you've gotten very little response. So, you ask why. Because when my mind is troubled, I can't concentrate on kissing. But, uh, what's troubling you? That... Malarkey about intercepting the United States mail? <laughs> Malarkey is precisely correct. 
Mary Doyle was a type who would fight back until you had her convinced. Even if they found the bag in that locker, they still have to tie it up with her. So, I had to dream up a ruse to convince her. But where'd you get the key? That wasn't the key. It was a key. But of exactly the same type, out of exactly the same group of checkboxes. I went there, I paid a dime, I checked nothing, and came away with the convincer. <laughs> Very good. Very good indeed. Thank you. <laughs> and for all that work, not even a fee. Well, everything isn't measured in dollars, my sweet. <laughs> You've got all the right answers. Come here. Mm. Your mind still troubled? No, sir. Not a trouble in the world. Can you concentrate now? You try. Find out. Uh, mm. Uh, mm. Pete, there's one more. Quiet, thing. please. Man at work. And there you've had crime and Peter Chambers. Dane Clark was starred as Peter Chambers. Crime and Peter Chambers Transcribed was created and written by Henry Kane. Bill Zuckert was heard as Lieutenant Parker with Bryna Rayburn and William Griffiths. It was directed by Fred Way. And this is Fred Collins inviting you to tune in next week, same time, same station, for Dane Clark in Crime and Peter Chambers. This is the United States Armed Forces Radio and Television Service. Peter Chambers. <laughs> Created by Henry Kane, transcribed and starring Dane Clark. A private investigator, duly licensed and duly sworn, Peter Chambers. You're a private eye. That's your business. Anything else? That's for laughs. This one figures for laughs, a lot of laughs. Because you're making yourself comfortable on a bar stool and you're asking for... What'll it be, Mac? Milk. Milk? You heard me, pal. Yes, sir. Milk it is. It's a great, big, beautiful bar. The Peacock Room. And down at the far end sits a blonde. Quite a blonde. You like the beige suit and the scarlet blouse and the long beige gloves. And the swell of the blonde hair on her shoulders. You like the queer cut of her eyes upswept at the edges and the green from where you sit. You like the curved red, wet lips and the clean line of the eyebrows. But best of all... You like the glass of milk that's sitting there in front of her. What's with the milk today, Mac? Search me. You want to chase her? Maybe heavy cream, homogenized? Uh, do me a favor, pal. Yeah? Go be funny somewhere else. Will you please? 
Well, sure, Mac. No offense. You know how it is. Milk. The bartender toddles off, and the blonde, pushing off her bar stool, toddles forward. Toward you. Sitting as she was with the bar hiding half of her, you've been wondering about her legs. Now you cease wondering. No complaints. Are you Peter? Peter Chambers? That's me, lady. Doing a workout in the latest bottle-fed formula. On my request? Yes, ma'am. And if I'd have known it was you who was requesting it, I'd have really gone to town. Double milk. <laughs> I want to talk to you. Somewhere alone. Uh, no objections to that. We're uh, somewhere alone. Um, my place. How's that? Fine, if you tell me where your place is. Hotel Baldwin, Suite 518. Good enough. We go now? No. No, I'll go first. You come there about, about five minutes. Oh, real mystery-like, huh? Well, I suppose that's the kind of business I'm in. Uh, one slight, unimportant bit of information. Yes. What's your name? Abigail. Abigail Christenberry. See you later, then. You fiddle with the milk, giving her five minutes. Then you hustle out of there and make for the Hotel Baldwin. The elevator takes you up to five, and you're at Suite 518. Well, Mr. Peter Chambers... You're in a fancy sitting room. Abigail Christenberry looks just the same. Beige suit, scarlet blouse, beige gloves, only in these more intimate surroundings, she looks twice as good. Will you have a drink, Mr. Peter Chambers? <laughs> I will, Miss Abigail Christenberry. Only if it's milk, I pass. No, I think the milk routine is getting boring, though it had its purpose. Do you like scotch? Scotch I love. Good. Scotch, then, for both of us. She sets up the drinks neat. Whiskey in a shot glass and a tall glass of soda on the side. One combination for you, one combination for her. Then you're sitting opposite her across a coffee table and you're both sipping your drinks and sort of, um, uh, staring. So, just to shake it up, she drops a little bombshell. I've changed my mind, Mr. Chambers. You've changed your mind about what? About retaining you. Oh? There's no longer any need of your service. Huh? Fired before you get hired. Everything happens to the private eye. Here you are, sir, for your trouble. Hundred dollar bill. Well, that's most generous of you, dear lady. Now then, good afternoon, Mr. Peter Chambers. And a very good afternoon to you, Miss Abigail Christenberry. <laughs> So, with the hundred-dollar bill clutched in your little hot hand, you go back to the office and attend to business. You could have refused a scene note, but a lady's got to pay some kind of a penalty for having a guy sit around drinking milk at a cocktail bar. Anyway, you dismiss her as some kind of a gorgeous crackpot. But she doesn't stay dismissed, because you're home that evening experimenting with imported Swedish herring and well-buttered pumpernickel bread when... Evening, Pete. Ah, Louis Parker. May I come in? Detective Lieutenant Louis Parker, New York City Police, homicide. Good cop, good man, and good friend. Spending the evening in, Peter? Well, I was hoping to, Louis, but in my business, no. Drink, Lieutenant? No, thanks. I got gas. Hunk of herring, maybe? Same gas. Uh, got a little heartburn, too. Well, how's about some bicarb? Look. You know a dame by name Abigail Christenberry? Oh, not half as well as I'd like to. Well, you ain't gonna. Why not? She's dead. Dead? Abigail Christenberry, dead. And, my boy, they've got you tagged for it. Me? It's my case, Pete, and you'll notice I come alone. Now, if you've got an out, brother, I'd be the happiest guy in the world. Out? What the heck do I need an out for? I didn't kill her. Well, Pete, the maid comes to Suite 518. It's about 7 o'clock. 
Miss Abigail is under the bed in a kimono with the back of her head belted in, her face mashed up, but bad. You wouldn't know it was a face. Well, what's that got to do with me? First off, we find your name and address in her pocketbook. Uh, well, that's evidence. Gives us a peg, so we hang our hat on it. Glasses on the coffee table have fingerprints. We've got your prints on file downtown. We match them. They match. Well, is this evidence of murder? Ah, there's more, fella. More? The medical examiner says she got it between four and five this afternoon. We described you to the elevator operator, oh. and sure enough, you were there at about 4.30. Look, Louie, I can explain well, can that. Can you Just... explain this? Can you explain her diary? Diary? For the past eight months, it's about a guy named Pete. That's all. Guy named Pete. Well, about how cute he was, about how in love they were, and then... What a louse he is. How he's strictly working her for money. And finally that she's scared of him because he's threatening her. Now we call that evidence. Now, what do you call it? Evidence. Circumstantial, but evidence nonetheless. Pete, were you there at 4.30? Yes. Well, give me your side of the story. Did you know the day? Yes. Stop agreeing with me. Come on, talk it up. Let listen, me hear. Listen, Lieutenant, listen. This morning at the office I get a phone call. A dame. No name. She tells me she's got a case for me to meet her at the Peacock Bar at 4 o'clock. All right, so you go to the Peacock Bar. What do you do there? I drink milk. Milk? Oh, now, look. This is Louis Parker you're talking. A milk drinker, you ain't. Look, it was a way we'd identify ourselves. She'd be drinking milk, I'd be drinking milk. All right. Anyway, she talks to me. She wants a five-minute head start, and then I'm to meet her at her hotel, Suite 518. And? I get there. It must be, oh, about uh, 4.30. We have a couple of drinks, and then she bounces me. She says she changed her mind. And that's your story? That's it. And you better get your hat. We're going downtown. I'll have to book you. Look, Louie, why do you because have... Because we got affidavits, Pete, from all the help in the hotel. Affidavits? Well, what do they say? They say that Abigail Christenberry did not leave her apartment today. All day. Not once. <laughs> It was crazy, but it could jam you. If Louie takes you downtown, the DA's machinery jolts into action. With what they can prove, the grand jury will squirt an indictment at you faster than you could fall off a ferry boat. And suddenly, you got it. What is it, Pete? I hope it's good. Louie, look, you found my fingerprints on a shot glass of whiskey and a tall glass of soda. Right. And opposite that, there was another shot glass of whiskey and another glass of soda, and somebody been using them. Right. But you found no fingerprints on that second set. Now, how do I know that? Yeah. How do you know? Because that? the story I told you is true. The dame was wearing a suit and gloves. And she didn't take the gloves off. Yeah. If the dame hadn't been out all day like they told me, and she's found the kimono with her face bashed in, why should she be wearing gloves? Well, that's huh? the only logical explanation for her lack of fingerprints, isn't it? That's very good, Pete. I'm glad I came alone. I'm glad I had confidence in you. All right, now what? Now we go down to the Peacock Bar, so I can straighten you out on some of the truth. Peacock Bar it is. You slip on your holster and you clip your gun into it, and then you're riding across town in Parker's car. On the way, you ask questions, and Parker supplies the answers. Abigail Christenberry, a very rich widow worth millions. No family at all except one guy, a brother named Timothy York. Timothy York, huh? Yep. And he inherits the millions, is that it? He inherits, all right, but he's clear, Pete. He works for an ice cream company, but he worked all day. He even had his lunch sent in. Mm. There's an office staff of 30 people can back it up. What kind of a guy? Well, he's a mousy little type. Pretty old, too. Maybe 65. A rather young wife. No children. But we've already cut him out as a suspect. He just couldn't have done it. Physically impossible. Thirty full-grown witnesses. Uh, here's your peacock bar. Yes, sir, gentlemen. What'll it be? Scotch on two. Hello. Well, the milk drinker. Hiya, Mac. Hi. Oh, <laughs> my friend uh, <laughs> drinks milk. Huh? <laughs> Good way to cushion yourself for a bender. Drink milk in the afternoon. <laughs> <laughs> Go on, tell him about the other milk drinker. Uh... Other milk drinkers? Yeah, the dame. The beige suit, scarlet blouse, beige gloves. Dames? <laughs> we get a million of them. No, no, this was a special one. Beautiful blonde. She was sitting up there at the bar. She came and talked to me. She was drinking milk. I'm behind this bar from 10 to 10, 12 hours. You go out of your mind if you start picking out dames. It's, it's like a rancher with a hundred head of cattle. You, you can't pick out every guy. Try. It's important. Well, I'm trying, Mac. I, 
believe me, but it ain't no use. It's... I'm sorry. Okay, let's get out of here. So you're back in Parker's car trying to swallow that helpless, hopeless feeling. Where to now, kiddo? Figure I ought to visit Timothy York? He's been visited. Well, let me try. Sure, kid, it's your party. And you stay downstairs. Like I said, it's your party, people. It's a nice enough house, apartment 9G, and you stick your finger in the buzzer. <laughs> little guy opens the door. Little old guy that looks like he's falling apart, skinny as a pencil. Yes, what can I do for you, sir? Timothy York? The same. Chambers, police. But the police have already been here several times. And once more can't hurt. <laughs> True enough. Well, come in, sir. Please come in. Hey, nice place you have here. Yeah, thank you. How about your sister, Abigail Christenberry? Know any of her friends? No, we were never very chummy, Abigail and I. Is that the taxi man, Timothy? No, dear. A woman comes into the room. She's blonde and she's beautiful. She's got a clean line of eyebrow and red, wet lips and green eyes upswept at the edges. Your hair begins to crinkle and you can feel the sweat break out on your body because, according to Parker, you're looking at a corpse. The lady who comes into the room is Abigail Christenberry. Timothy, I thought you said it wasn't the... Sir, are you the taxi man? No, the milkman. Timothy, what's he talking about? He's from the police. Police? Again? Uh, Timothy, will you please close my suitcases in the bedroom? Their stuff's so full, I can't do a thing with them. Certainly, dear. And now that we're alone, uh, Mrs. York, remember me? Peter Chambers? Peter Chambers? Never heard of you. Hmm. Ever hear of Abigail Christenberry? Of course. Abigail Christenberry is my husband's sister. And she's dead. How would you know this? From the police. They've been here several times. I see. Now, what's with this uh, stuff about suitcases? I'm leaving for Florida. It's been planned for a long time. I'm leaving tonight. Right now, as a matter of fact. And the cops know about that? Of course. And they've absolutely no objection. I've been completely cooperative with them, and they have no need of me. They have the address where I'm going, if by chance I am needed. Your husband going? No, he's not. He's saving his vacation for much later on, and we intend to go to Switzerland, to the Alps. Now, is there anything else? That's all. Tell your husband goodbye for me. Back in the police car, you bestow a kiss on the damp and untranquil forehead of Detective Lieutenant Parker. Hey, what's that for? For having confidence in me and for having patience and for playing ball. Okay, ball player. Who's up now? You. How do you make that, Pete? Mrs. Timothy York is coming out any minute. She's on her way to Florida. I know. Only she's not going. Who's stopping? You are. Oh, now what? The look, devil... look, look, look. When she comes out, you pick her up and bring her to one of the precinct station houses. For further questioning or anything else you want to dream up. But just see to it she's detained. You sure you know what you're doing, Pete? I'm positive. Just play along with me a little longer and we're liable to knock one right out of the ballpark. <laughs> Mrs. Timothy York comes out and Parker does the old pickup. Suitcase and all. She gets hustled down to the nearest station house, gets racked up for further questioning, and then you and Parker are rolling again. Okay, fella, what now? What time is it, Louis? Uh, it's uh, almost ten. Peacock Bar. Again? The Peacock Bar, Louis. Now, look, we keep hitting that joint. Both of us are liable to wind up loaded. We're not going in this time. No? What are we going to do? Sit and stare through the window and watch the others drink? We're going to wait for that bartender. He says he quits at ten o'clock. And then? And then he and I are going for a ride or a walk or something. But wherever we go, I expect you to be close by. And if we go in somewhere, I expect you to be sitting around in your nice little police car just in case an emergency pops. <laughs> He stops the car near the peacock bar. You shift your 38 from the holster to your side pocket. You get out of the car and you wear out the sidewalk in front of the fancy tavern until high shoulders come strolling out. Okay, Dimples. What? 
What do you want? The lump in my pocket is a gun. And I'll use it if you make me. For sure, sure. You understand about guns? Yeah, I understand. Fine. Now, where are you heading? Home. How do we go? We... You heard me. We walk. It's nearby. You walk to a nice-looking apartment house, and up one flight he unlocks the door, and you don't wait. Just as soon as he clicks the light on, you smash the flat of the gun against the side of his face. He's given a lot of feeling. It opens a hunk of his face, but he's a big guy and strong, and he comes back swinging. Maybe he's good, maybe he's lucky, but he catches you one on the chin that lands you up against the opposite wall. But you're still holding the gun. And then you hear the click of the switchblade. And you see him throw it, and you roll over, and the knife makes a gong of the wall. You reach for it, and you sit there like a cockeyed arsenal. A gun in your right hand and a knife in your left. And you see him come at you, and there's no other way. You aim it low. Catches him in a thigh, and knocks him over. The rest is easy. Okay, pal. It's talking time. What? Anyway. What's your name? Ryan. First name. What's it to you? Look, Ryan, it's murder we're fiddling around with, and when you fiddle with murder, you play it rough, like this. <laughs> now, let's do it nice, huh? What's your first name? Peter. Peter. <sighs> Just like mine, huh? I don't know what your name is. That's a lie. Now, let's play the name game some more. Let's try Mrs. Timothy York. <sighs> I never heard of her. That's not what she says. What? Just in case you think she's on her way to Florida, give another thing. What? She's oh, in the pokey, pal, what? talking her brains out. Well, why do you think I've come after you? She sent me. She did her? She says it was all your idea that she says that you're number one. She's using a method. If you are number one, you get the chair and she gets off light. Now, whose idea was it? Hers. Hers, the dirty... He spills the story like he's leaking words. Then you go down for Parker and you bring him upstairs. And you also bring him up to date on current events. Uh, Meet Mr. Ryan, Lieutenant. Uh, Peter Ryan. Uh, That's the Peter that was mentioned in Abigail's diary. What, the bartender? Yeah, yeah, Dimple's over here. Our rich widow, Abigail Christenberry, sort of got stuck on him. But then he got tired of her, especially after he met her sister-in-law, Mrs. Timothy York. Who murdered Christenberry? Mrs. Timothy York. But she figured out a real cutie. Like how? Well, they knew about Abigail's diary, where she mentions Pete. So they look up the classified directory on the private detective, which is often confused for Fall Guy. And the first Peter they come to is me, Peter Chambers. And they elect you the Patsy. Correct. First, Mrs. Timothy York kills Abigail, mashes her face in, so I won't know the difference. Then she meets me at the Peacock on that milk deal. Then I'm to follow her right into the trap. She uses the stairs coming and going so no one sees her. But me, I use the elevator. Everybody sees me. Which puts you at the scene of the crime, which leaves your fingerprints all over the place, and which confuses you with the Pete in the... In Abigail's diary. And the dead Abigail is in the bedroom, dead for at least a half hour, with her face all smashed up. Then after you get bounced out, Mrs. Timothy York blows the joint using the stairs again, and nobody can connect her with the crime. Mm. And you think Mrs. Timothy York is really Abigail, and you can't tell the difference because the real Abigail is now minus a face. Sure, and with Mrs. Timothy York in Florida, I'd be in it up to my neck. Yeah, but if uh, these two knock off Abigail, what do they get out of it? Mr. York inherits... Mrs. York planned a trip to Switzerland with Mr. York. Mr. York would never have come back from there. He'd have tripped on an Alp or something. Then she'd get all the loot and she'd hook up with dimples here. And they'd both live happily ever after. So your namesake gets booked downtown and Mrs. York gets booked downtown. And they both accuse each other, which gives the cops a double confession. And then you and Louie Parker are sort of celebrating on the late shift at the Peacock Bar, and Parker is saying... Well, Pete, old boy, how did it come to you? Well, you're a good friend. That's how it came to me. You gave me a chance to run around a little bit. 
I saw Mrs. York, which I couldn't have if she'd beat her for Florida. And the minute I see her, I realize I'm in the middle of a frame job. Mrs. Timothy York, who told me she was Abigail Christenberry. And you tie that up with a bartender that forgets one of two milk customers in the same afternoon. He remembered me. How could he forget her? (laughs) So the moral of the story is don't lose patience and don't lose confidence in a friend, even if you're a cop. Mm. He's got another moral, Lieutenant. And that is? Don't drink milk at a whiskey bar. Not unless you've got an ulcer. (laughs) And there you've had crime and Peter Chambers. Dane Clark was starred as Peter Chambers. Crime and Peter Chambers transcribed was created and written by Henry King. Others in the cast were Bill Zuckert, heard as Lieutenant Parker, Elaine Ross as Mrs. York, and Joe DeSantis as the bartender. It was directed by Fred Way. This is Fred Collins inviting you to tune in next week, same time, same station, for Dane Clark in Crime and Peter Chambers. Peter Chambers has come to you through the worldwide facilities of the United States Armed Forces Radio and Television Service. Peter Chambers. Created by Henry Kane, transcribed and starring Dane Clark. A private investigator, duly licensed and duly sworn, Peter Chambers. a private eye. That's your business. Anything else? That's for laughs. And a lot of laughs tonight. You were pub crawling during the visiting fireman bit at the taverns and the bistros. You're on your way home now and you're going to stop off at Krause's newsstand for the papers. <laughs> Old man Krause, he's been there as long as you can remember. And then you see the commotion. Somebody's working the old man over, beating him to the ground. You get there as fast as you can. Oh, oh. Oh, oh, it's you, Mr. Chambers. Thank the Lord. Easy, easy, does it, Mr. Krause. 
help me. Come on, let me help you out. Up. Uh, uh, yeah. did, did you see him, Mr. Chambers? Did you see who it was? No, he ran off as he saw me coming. Did you get a look at him, Mr. Krauss? No, I was just close. He hit me from behind and then he jumped me. But, but why you? Where does a man like you fit in with a beating? Oh, it was more than that, Mr. Chambers. More than a beating. What are you talking about? Whoever it was wanted to kill me. Why? You're a peaceful man, Mr. Krauss. The thoughtful, peaceful, philosophical man. Everybody loves you. Uh, seems not everybody. Mm. Well... Look, I'm going home with you. Uh, no, 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 no. I'm taking you home. You need not bother, Mr. Chambers. I am not afraid. Oh, come along. Come along now, Mr. Cross. Come on. Come on. Uh, thank you. Thank you. You are very kind. He doesn't live far, and he's none the worse for his experience. And you get him home, and he's fumbling with the key in the old-fashioned lock. Ah, so these old eyes are not what they used to be. There. Uh, please follow me, Mr. Chambers. I will put the light on. But he doesn't have a chance to put the light on. Neither of you have a chance to do a thing. Uh, oh, no. oh. The guy who was inside waiting for Krause, he was in a dark room, but he was facing the light of the hallway. And that was all to the good. He couldn't see much of you or of Krauss, just your silhouettes, but you could see him. And better than that, you recognized him. Maybe Krause didn't know who his assailant was, but you did. Well, he's gotten clean away, so there's nothing to do now but find the light switch and look to Mr. Krause. Oh. Come on, Miss Krause. Oh. Mr. Krause, uh, you all right? Yeah. Now, look, I'll get a towel and some water. Yeah, yeah. Just stay where we are. Sure. Right there on the floor. Sure. I don't think you're hurt very badly. There. There now. Ah, it's nothing. It's nothing at all. It's a scratch, a bullet crease. Ah, you're as good as new. <laughs> Once more, let me help you up. Be my guest. Yes. Hey, uh, <coughs> lucky, pretty lucky. Twice in one night. And I'm still around to talk about it. Ah, I will sit here. Good. Why somebody should want to kill me? Uh, maybe a month ago, but not now. What's that? A month ago what? Uh, you ever hear of Big Benny Larson? Who hasn't? Big Benny, big goon. Well, there was a fight one night in front of my newsstand. Big Benny knifed a man, uh, Mr. Snuffnose Angelino. I saw it all. Oh. While Mr. Snuffnose was in the hospital and they were wondering whether he would live, the police assigned protection to me because I was the only witness. Then Mr. Snuffnose pulled through and he didn't press charges and Big Benny was released and the protection of police was taken away. Uh, there's no reason anymore for Big Benny to harm me. Mm. Then who else? I have no idea, Mr. Chambers. Look, you ever hear of the dancer? The dancer? Slick Hood from Chicago. His name is Danzig or something, but they call him the dancer. I have never been to Chicago, Mr. One of those tall, slender, handsome guys. Beautiful, but deadly as the front end of a loaded gun. Oh, murder that one for the ladies. But what does this have to do with... Nothing, nothing, nothing. Just started a train of thought. Now, look, Mr. Krauss... You're going to the police with this? Oh, no, no, no. I've had enough now, of police. Wait a... I have a gun and a license now, listen, for it. listen, I, I... I am not afraid. It is only that I do not understand it. Oh, do you have a family, Mr. Krause? Uh, just a daughter, an adopted daughter, Irene. She is married now to a lawyer, Frank Buckley. Well, you're going to tell her about this? Uh, no. Why not? Uh, well, we are not really friends anymore. She has gone away from me. I hardly see her anymore. Well, do you mind if I talk with her? Well, I, I cannot stop you. Well, that sort of wraps it up, I suppose. Look, I'm getting out of here, Mr. Krauss, but you bolt that door after me and use that gun if you have to. Uh, thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. Chambers. And please, do not worry about me. But you do worry. You go home and you try to sleep, but it tampers with your dreams. Where's the connection? Why should a doll boy like the dancer be looking to eradicate a peaceful citizen? The old man said he never heard of him. And you believe, Krauss. You sleep finally, but it's like sleeping under a winking neon light. And in the morning, you're looking up an address in the phone book. Frank Buckley. It's on 57th Street, and it turns out to be a combination of home and office. 
A lawyer that's plugging at his business. Nothing more. No rich, big estate guy. Yes, Mr. Chambers. Please sit down. Make yourself comfortable. Frank Buckley. Bald, thin, angular, 50-ish. A lot of loose skin hanging under his jowls. Would you like a cigarette, Mr. Chambers? No, no, thank you. Not now. Uh, Mr. Buckley, it's really your wife I want to talk to. So? Why? Well, sir, I'm a private detective. Private detective? Well, this is not in the line of business. I'm a friend of an elderly gentleman, a Mr. Krauss. Oh, yes, yes. My wife's father. Well, an attempt was made on his life last night. He won't go to the police with it, and I thought perhaps if I talk with Krauss's daughter, your wife... My wife and I have been separated for the past six months. Oh? She's already instituted divorce proceedings. I'm sorry to hear that. But I... um, in a matter like this, uh, well, uh, she's now living at Eastburn Apartments on 74th. Oh, thank you, sir. How is the old man? <laughs> Working, as always. Well, he won't have to work long. He'll be quite independent in a short... Old man Krauss, independent? You mean rich or something? How come? I'm sorry. Slip of the tongue, sir. Matter of my profession. Attorney and client. Privilege okay, communication. Okay, okay, okay with me. All I want her to know is where I could reach Irene, uh, Mrs. Buckley. Yes, of course. And if there's anything I can do for the old gentleman, please don't hesitate. All right, then. Good morning, Mr. Buckley. And a very good morning to you, sir. <laughs> Next stop, Eastburn Apartments. Not too swanky, not too slummy. About in the middle. But the occupant of apartment 7G. Nothing in the middle about that one. The word is gorgeous. Not soft gorgeous or mushy gorgeous, but hard like granite. Glittering gorgeous, like a diamond. But gorgeous nonetheless. Well, ain't you the handsome one? Mrs. Buckley? I'm using my maiden name, Irene Cordoni. I thought it was Krauss. Hmm, should have been, but it ain't. I was in show business before I got married. How would you like this? And now, ladies and gentlemen, Miss Irene Krauss. Black hair, black eyes, and a loose red mouth. Young and quite a figure. She's wearing high heel lounging shoes, white shorts, and a white bandana. And that's about it. Like a drink, Mr... Mr... Chambers. Peter Chambers. <laughs> Would you like a little drinky, handsome? Well, it's a little too early in the morning for me. Oh? Look, uh, Miss Cordoni. Mm-hmm. I wish you'd talk to your father. Father? Oh. What's with him? A couple of attempts were made on his life last night. The old man? Well, somebody, somebody near to him ought to tell him one of two things. Like What? Either he goes to the police, or he kind of stays holed up, at least until this thing clears. What's your interest? I'm a friend. Well, if you're such a good friend, why don't you tell him? I've told him, but he's stubborn. Stubborn with you, stubborn with me. Furthermore, the old man and I, well, we kind of don't see eye to eye anymore. Hmm. When'd you see him last? Mm, I haven't seen him uh, well, since I broke up with my husband. Maybe six months. Been in Chicago, maybe five months of that. Only got back a few weeks ago. I still think you ought to talk to him. Quite a busybody, aren't you? Well, some say yes, some say no. <laughs> but you're cute. I'll say that. <laughs> you know, I'm a sucker for a good-looking man. Uh, Are you uh, sure you won't join me in a drink? Uh, some other time, sister. Oh, make it soon, brother. <laughs> sure, sure. I'll, uh, be expecting you. A man-eater, that Irene Cordoni, Buckley, Krauss. You take your leave, slightly reluctant, but you take your leave. You figure you've done your bit and you've got your own work to attend to. Like pulling open the office window and letting the air in and looking over the mail... But you detour to pick up the papers at Krause's. But Krause's newsstand is closed. So you're on your white horse again, making for Krause's apartment. Ah, uh, come in, Mr. Chambers. Just got back myself. Where have you been, Mr. Krause? A funeral. Funeral? The old lady, Regina Kent. You must have known the old lady. Regina Kent? Her funeral? Yeah. Well... Look, you can't take that so hard. She must have been past 90 years of age. Death must come, Mr. Krause, sooner or later. Sure, but not by murder. Murder? 
The old lady? Look, you're not making sense, Mr. Krause. It is sense. I wish it wasn't. When did it happen? A couple of days ago. She was coming from the movies. Bang. Shots in the head. You mean a mugger, a thief, one of those things? Nothing was stolen. She was killed. The kind old lady killed meaningless for no reason. Oh, that's too bad. She was a good friend of yours, wasn't she, Mr. Cross? Oh, yes, yes. Twenty years she is a customer. And many evenings we talk and talk for hours. A fine, wonderful old lady. And rich, too. Reputed to be worth, oh, maybe half a million. Riches, my boy, is in the heart. Well, it doesn't hurt in the pocketbook, either. <laughs> That is true, too. Hey, wait a minute. You're not quite as impractical as you sound. Didn't you once tell me that you recommended a lawyer to her? If she didn't think you had a practical side, she wouldn't have asked your advice for a lawyer. Yes, yes. It's a long time ago. Recommended my son-in-law, Frank Buckley. Oh. And she was very satisfied. Remained his client all the way till now. Hmm. And what about your problem, Mr. Krauss? Problems? Me? Well, last night. Ah, oh, crazy people, crackpots. Somebody must be making a mistake. Now, look, you're not going back to work, are you? Sure, I'm not afraid, Mr. Chambers, not at all. And do not worry, you see? Oh. I carry, how do you call it, the neutralizer. <laughs> I have it from the first war yet. And you're not going to talk to the cops about it? No, no. Do not worry about old Kraus. Ah, you are a good, kind man, Mr. Chambers. <laughs> So the good, kind man starts minding his own business. You go to the office and pull up the window, and let the air in and read your mail. Then you listen to the ball game. Then you call downtown to headquarters to Detective Lieutenant Parker, but they tell you he's out of town and won't be back until 10 in the evening. Client falls in and you're busy for the rest of the day, and pretty soon it's nighttime after 10... And you're at headquarters because that Krause thing is buzzing around in your head like it's a beehive. Well, always a pleasure, Mr. Private Eye. You bring the breath of springtime into this dank old office, or is that the breath of scotch? Detective Lieutenant Louis Parker, aces all the way. Good friend, good cop, good companion. Well, seriously, Pete, you uh, look a little worried. Something I can do for you? Maybe. Just tell Papa Parker anything to get the creases out of your forehead. Old man Kraus. Guy owns a newsstand up your way? Yeah. Has he got anything to fret about? Well, like what? Big Benny Larson or his goons? No, not a thing. Snuff nose Angelino is a rabbit, afraid to sign a complaint. Puts Big Benny in the clear, and Benny's not looking to make trouble for the old man. Benny makes trouble only when he has to. Mm -hmm. That's one worry off my mind. Oh, you got more? Got a little curiosity. Huh? Fire away, friend. Regina Kent. Oh. Little old dame, 90 years of age, gets knocked off with a bullet in her brain and strictly a professional job. Real peculiar deal. Has it got any angles? No, not yet it ain't. Unless you call bafflement an angle. Well, you got an idea about the torpedo? We got better than that. Got a full and perfect description. Now, what's holding you back? Haven't got anybody that fits the full and perfect description. Uh, this is confidential, Pete. Of course, Louis. We got a witness to that Regina Kent killing that nobody knows about, not even the newspapers. Lady by the name of Benson. Benson? Hmm. She was sitting in her bedroom. It was dark. She couldn't sleep. Happens to have the next apartment to this Regina Kent. She saw our torpedo? Saw him clear and saw him long. He was hanging around for quite a time, waiting for the old lady. Mrs. Benson kept watching him. Then when Regina Kent appeared, she saw the actual shooting. Saw him jump into a car and drive off. And she looked over your rogues gallery. Looked over everything. Most cooperative. Furnished us a full description, ready to identify the guy whenever we pick him up. Mm -hmm. Let's hear that description, Louis. Well, he's a good-looking boy, about six feet tall. Parker talks and your heart starts rapping at your chest like a fist on a door. Because what you're listening to is a perfect description of the dancer. I wonder they can't find a guy to fit the description. This is a Chicago guy. A guy who was never arrested, never printed, never mugged. What are you getting excited about, Petey? Stick around, pal. Why? I may be of some help. So why should I stick around? Why shouldn't I go with you? Because that's the way I wanted this trip. Oh, the private eye and his various moods. Okay, Detective, I stick around. What do I stick around for? Phone call. From me. Uh, like a little more dope? I'd love a little more dope. 
Your friend Krauss. He's going to be rich. Uh, that's the second time I've heard that. This time it's authentic. Regina Kent made a will. She leaves all her dough to charity except $200,000. Now, guess who gets that? I give up. Old man Krauss, yeah. 200,000 solid smackers. But remember, it's still confidential. The will ain't been probated yet. We got to see it on police business. See, there's got to be a lawyer. Huh? Who made that will for her? Who was a lawyer? A guy by the name of Frank Buckley. <laughs> That's it. Goodbye, Louis. Hey, what's your hurry? Where are you going? Hey, people. So, back to 57th Street. You rouse Frank Buckley out of his dreams and you set him up on the facts. He tries to make with the legal palaver, but you shake him out of it. And finally, you throw him the jackpot question. Did your wife know about Regina Kent's will? Well, I... Uh, uh... Unanswer me, Mr. Buckley. Yes, yes. I told her when the old lady originally made the will. I thought it'd please her to know that someday her foster father... After all, she was my wife then. We were living together, husband and wife. Next up, Eastburn Apartments. And the lady herself answers. She's wearing tight silk slacks and a tight silk block in her hands. You shove in before she got a chance to oh. shove you out. Easy. You asked me to come back, remember? Oh. You said you'd be expecting me? Well, you're a little premature, sweetie. Right now, I'm expecting my future husband. The dancer, huh? Well, he sent me with a message. Messages, messages. He's due her any minute and he sends... Me... Hey, how do you know about the dancer... What are you doing here anyway? Catching up with a little hunk of murder. Get out. Get Relax, out. Relax, lady. You get out before I fling this glass at You'll you. You'll fling what? <laughs> she misses, but it gives you the excuse to do what you were going to do anyway. You clip her under the chin. Not too hard, just enough. And she sighs <sighs> and slides to the floor. Then you go into action with the adhesive bit. The underworld teaches the upper world a lot of little tricks. You find the tape in the medicine cabinet and you wrap her wrist behind her. Tie her ankles tight and put a gag across her mouth. You carry her to the bedroom and lock the door and then you're back in the living room. And you're waiting for a murderer. You open the door for the dancer and you hit him first. And you pull him in afterwards. Then you take his gun away from him and you slap him back to consciousness. What? Come on, there. What's going on, Ed? Nothing, nothing except a little chit-chat before you get hauled off. Hauled off? Where? First police headquarters. And after that, there's a hot little chair up at Sing Sing. Why, you... Careful, fella, careful. You're looking at your own gun. And I take it, it's loaded. Who the devil are you? I'm a busybody by the name of Chambers. Nemesis to you. So what's it all about? One, the murder of an old lady, Regina Kent. Two, the attempted murder of old man Krauss. You're nuts. Ah, I got a witness by the name of Benson says I ain't... Why should I want to bump an old woman? All right, let me tell you. A doll by the name of Irene Cordoni shows up in Chicago a few months ago. She goes for good-looking guys, and you're a good-looking guy. You're also a hard guy, and she makes you a proposition. Like what? Like this. She knows from her former husband that an old lady made a will leaving 200,000 clams to old man Krauss. Krauss happens to be this doll's foster father. He's got no other family but her. So? So if the old dame, Regina Kent, if she dies, old man Krauss gets 200000 But if after that he dies, dear old Irene Cordoni Krauss, she inherits from him. So? so the doll propositions the dancer, knock the two of them off in that order, first the old dame, then the old man, then the doll and the dancer get married. And they live pretty good. And they can pay their rent for quite a while with $200,000. Yeah, good story, but go prove it. Don't start bullying me about no Benson who's a witness. Uh, I'm bullying you, kiddo. Sure, I'm bullying you. Let me show you how I'm bullying you. See? First, you pull the phone over, like so. Then you dial O for operator, like so. Then you say, like so, into the phone. Police, quickly. <laughs> And so, a few days later, you're back at Krause's newsstand. You see, Mr. Chambers, I do not wear the gun anymore. <laughs> well, there's no need. And I see by your papers that the grand jury's already indicted those two. First degree murder. Uh, ah, people are so crazy. 
You, uh, going to retire on that 200000 Me? Retire? I die. No. Maybe a few vacations, perhaps. But Kraus works. Kraus loves to work. Uh, by the way, Mr. Chambers, there will be a fee for you. Hmm? Certainly you did fine work. Uh, you will send a bill, eh? No. Send a large No, 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 no. No bill, Mr. Kraus. This one was on the house. Oh, I'm tired. I think I'll take the news and mirror and so to bed. With the news and mirror? And there you've had Crime and Peter Chambers. Dane Clark was starred as Peter Chambers. Crime and Peter Chambers transcribed was created and written by Henry Kane. Others in the cast were Bill Zuckert, heard as Lieutenant Parker, Guy Rep as Krauss, and Rita Lynn as Irene. It was directed by Fred Way. And this is Fred Collins inviting you to tune in next week, same time, same station, for Dane Clark in Crime and Peter Chambers. Crime and Peter Chambers has come to you through the worldwide facilities of the United States Armed Forces Radio and Television Service. Chambers. Created by Henry Kane, transcribed and starring Dane Clark. Private investigator, duly licensed and duly sworn, Peter Chambers. You're a private eye. That's your business. Anything else, that's for laughs. You're sitting in a little French restaurant enjoying the onion soup. 
But it's not the onion soup that brought you here. Rather, it's a prospective client. He asked you to meet him here at La Grande Maison, third booth to the right. Mr. Chambers? Peter Chambers? You, uh, Dr. Burns? That's right. May I sit down? Dr. Philip Burns, tall, black-haired, black-eyed, and he looks more worried than Papa when his teenager hasn't met her curfew. I'll begin quickly, Mr. Chambers. I asked you to meet me here because it's near my office and I can't get away for long. Well, you're the client. Case history, then. I'm married, wife and two small children, who, at the moment and for the next three months, are vacationing in the White Mountains. And I'm a dentist. And you're supposed to have quite a lot of money by inheritance. Yes. Now, about this Grace Chandler. Oh, yes, you mentioned her when you talked to me on the phone. Right. A patient of mine, with whom I've become rather well acquainted lately. I understand, Doc. Now, uh, where do we fit the prosaic private eye into this? Well, about two weeks ago, at nine o'clock in the evening, I was home. My family had already left on vacation, and I was about to go out for a date with Miss Chandler. Oh? I I saw no harm in it. We were just good friends. Yes, of course. I received a phone call from an important patient, uh, uh, Mrs. Griffin. She said it was an emergency. I asked her to meet me at the office, and I rushed over there. And this is what happened. I got to the office, walked into my operating room, and there was a man, a strange man, sitting in the operating chair. He had a gun in his hand. This is a nice little thirty-eight you got, Doc. Is that mine? It's yours, all right. Got it out of your cabinet over there. What do you want? What are you doing here? I'm going to use the gun, Doc. And I'm going to use it on you. That's what I'm doing here. But, 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 uh, I don't understand. You know a Grace Chandler? Yes. I'm her husband. Now do you understand? He rose up out of the operating chair. A tall man with white hair and a white mustache. He lunged toward me and suddenly the lights went out. But I grabbed at him and we fought furiously. And then... Then, somehow, I had the gun. But his his fingers were at my throat, throttling me. In self-defense, I pulled the trigger. I got up and groped in the darkness. I tried to find my flashlight, but it was gone. Finally, I reached my work table. I I found smelling salts and used them on myself. Then I stumbled around until I got back to him. And I kneeled down beside him. He was dead. I got up. The gun was still in my hand, and finally I found the phone on my desk, and I tried to use it. But that, too, was dead. I ran my fingers along the wire. It it was cut. I left the gun on the desk, and I got out of there. Somehow I got out of there. A block away, I found an open drugstore, and I called the police. They used their flashlights, found a loose fuse, fixed it. The lights came on. But there was nobody on the floor. There was no dead body. There was nothing. And my gun... That was gone, too. I absolutely thought I was crazy, Mr. Chambers. Now, look, Doctor, was there a dead man on the floor? No question. That man was dead. Oh, I I admit the terrible misgivings. I've been trying to get up enough courage to put myself in the hands of a psychiatrist. And you've been wrestling with this problem for two long weeks, huh? Yes. But yesterday, yesterday, finally, I knew that I was sane. Well, because why, Doc? Why suddenly yesterday? Well, I had a new patient. One Slocum Blackstone, who prefers to be called Blackie. That's when I knew I wasn't crazy. I was drilling his tooth. Blandly, he said, Dr. Burns, you killed a man, didn't you? Why? That's what he said. He told me that the police had fished up a body from the river. That the face was battered and the rest in fairly good condition. He said that that was the man I had killed and that he could prove it. And what else did he say? He refused to speak any further. He told me to think about it. He said he'd be back tonight to talk business. Oh, good old blackmail, huh? Mr. Chambers, before I make up my mind on this, I I want somebody, somebody experienced and somebody trustworthy to advise me. You're that somebody, sir. Huh? Good enough. Now, what time is this Blackie coming to your office for that talk? At 8 tonight. Okay, I'll be there at about 7.30. And to anybody, anybody at all, I'm a new patient. I'm, uh... Now, let me see. I'm, uh... 
Martin Barnett. All right, Mr. Chambers. Uh, Barnett, anything you say. He gives you a few of the less pertinent facts, like addresses and things, and then the good doctor takes his leave. You order another onion soup, but you're no longer an epicure. Everything tastes lousy to you. So you pay and you blow. You have a short visit with a rich witch by name of Griffin, and it causes a lifted eyebrow. And then you're downtown at headquarters for a chin fest with good old Louie. Well, Petey Chambers, the private Eiffel. It's good to see you. Things were getting a little boring down here. Detective Lieutenant Louis Parker, homicide. Strong sinew of the New York police force. A good cop, a good citizen, and a mighty good friend. Well, you got some crazy questions for old Louis. Things have been rolling so normally around here, we've begun to miss you. <laughs> crazy clients, crazy questions. <laughs> Well, since I pride myself on being a gentleman, I won't add crazy private eyes. Well, got any crazy corpses around your morgue? <laughs> That's my Pete. Never fails. Have you? Crazy corpses. Like how? Oh, like maybe one that likes to walk around after he's dead. Or that maybe has a special passion for stealing a gun from a dentist. You're building up to something, Pete. Or that maybe has three bullet holes in him. No face. Just a minute. What do you know about what we've got in the morgue, pal? Don't know nothing, pal. Why you here, pal? Because I love you, pal. Now look, Pete. Now look, pal. If it so happens by some peculiar circumstance you're harboring a corpse in your public morgue that meets with the specifications laid down by the uh, private eye, then as a favor, the private eye would like a look-see in the public morgue. And what else? Oh, a little chop-chop. Chop-chop? You know, talky-talky. All right. Trouble, trouble. <laughs> Let's go to the morgue. Talk. A morgue is a temporary stopover for dead bodies. They keep them in refrigerated cabinets. And after autopsy, they're either claimed or buried in Potter's Field. Parker produces the one you're interested in. There's your baby. White hair, smashed up face. You look over the hands, they're the hands of a mature man. Had enough, Petey boy? Oh, yeah, yeah, I've uh, had enough. Let me shove him back. He's our prized possession. Nobody knows him, nobody claims him, nobody identifies him. Fished him up out of the river. Dead by drowning? No, no. Dead before drowning. Oh? Three bullets in him from a thirty-eight, And we've got the bullets. They were still in him when we found him. Now all you need is a gun the bullets came from. And whoever owns that gun. Hmm. The only additional information a medical examiner could give us was that that battered face had had a mustache. White mustache. Ah, that's right. A white mustache. Hey, you know this guy? No. Now, I want you to level with me, Pete. Okay, Lieutenant, let us level. I've got a case that might involve our Mr. Unknown. So far, it's confidential. But, well, let me spread my wings a little and I'm liable to fly right back to you. So, at 7.30 that evening, you keep your date. You're seated in the operating chair at Dr. Philip Burns' office, which is on 86th Street. One flight up, and the good doctor is drilling. There you are, sir. Rinse, please. Uh, Janet, would you fill Mr. Barnett's cup again? Yes, doctor. Here you are, sir. All in all, I'd say you have an excellent set of teeth, sir. Thank you, but the drilling I can live without. Spoken like a good, normal American citizen. <laughs> Uh, doctor, do you want me to make out a card for Mr... Uh, Mr... Barnett, uh, Martin Barnett. Mm -hmm. oh, Mr. Barnett, my nurse, Miss Janet West. How do you, Miss West? How do you do, sir? Janet West. A tall brunette with eyes like saucers. And going from saucers to saucy. That was her expression. Saucy, pert, and very cute. There's no reason to keep you this late, Janet. I'll take care of the paperwork, the card and things for Mr. Barnett. Thank you, doctor. But if you wish... Uh, no, I'll... no, run along now. 
Let me see now. By cuspid, upper molar. Doctor, we uh, talk now? Rather not. She'll be ready to go in a second. Oh, here she is now. Good night, Doctor. Mr. Barnett. Good night, Janet. Good night. All right, now, where'd you keep that gun? Right there, in that cabinet. Do you have a license for it? Of course. And your flashlight? Right here, in this drawer. Uh, have you come up with anything at all, Mr. Chambers? Well, two things. There's a stiff down at the morgue that tallies with what Mr. Blackstone told you. And I checked with Mrs. Griffin. She never called you that night. Doc, uh, what's in this uh, room back here? Well, that's my work room. Connects directly with the operating room here. Will I be able to listen from in there? Oh, sure. Where's that from? Outside the waiting room. What time is it? Eight o'clock. Uh-huh. That's our boy. Okay. Lock me in here. That's it. And remember, listen him out and stall him. We're alone, Doc, ain't we? Of course. You think I'm crazy? Oh, not you, Doc. Crazy like a fox, that's you. The way you stall them cops. And you with a dead pigeon here on the floor. <laughs> How do you know? Hey, just listen, sweetie. I own a pool room downstairs. Right downstairs from here. Yes? Business, you should pardon the expression, it stinks out loud. So that night, I'm outside getting a bit of the ozone when I hear them shots up here. And then I see you come tearing out, I figure it, for some kind of hassle. So what have I got to lose going upstairs for a gander? You found him here on the floor? Right you are, sweetie. So I figured I could lend what you call a helping hand. I goes down for my flashlight, and then I do the bit. I snatch the gun, and I lug him out of here. And like that, you're guilty of nothing. You know what I mean? Nothing. What did you do with him? Put him in my car and dumped him in the river. And like that, I'm in business. I... Don't quite understand. Yeah, well, just keep the ears picked up. I got your gun down in my bank vault. And the cops, they got a stiff with three bullets in him, and they got the bullets. If the slugs they got match the gun I got, <laughs> you know what you got? Trouble. By the bushel and the peck. Clear? Yes. So we're going to work it like an annuity. Just what are you selling? Life insurance, sweetie. On your life. And we'll make it an easy premium, $300 a week. For how long? It's a life insurance policy. You pay for the rest of your life. Ain't unreasonable, $300 a week, and you know it. And you can afford it. Think what I'm doing for you, Doc. Yes, I'm thinking. <laughs> you want to hear the funniest switch, sweetie? My one worry in the world is going to be your health. <laughs> Keep well, Doc. And if I don't agree to your demands? You'll agree. You're not one of them big dopes. You got brains, sweetie. Look, I give you a few days to think about it. Monday at five, I show up for my three bills, and then after that, every Monday like clockwork. Eh, goodbye, sweetie. <laughs> See you on Monday. Gun? Yes. Uh, real cutie, that one. Yeah, real cute. What are you going to do, Doc? Going to pay him. And what happens when he raises the ante? They always do, Doc. Well, what's your advice, Mr. Chambers? Oh, you mean I'm still working for you? Blackie stated the deadline, Mr. Chambers, for both you and me. <laughs> You're a good little detective working on a case, so you suddenly remember there's one party who should have been interviewed and who wasn't. Grace Chandler. She turns out to be an acrobatic dancer. A good-looking brunette with, uh, muscles in her arms. Yes, yes, what is it, Mr. Chambers? Well, just a couple of questions, ma'am, about your husband. Husband? Husband? Well, I won't take up much of your time. I've if you'll... got no husband. No husband? Nah. Bye now. Hey, say, where are you going? The rest of the day develops nothing. And so the next day, at about 7 o'clock in the evening, you're outside Doc Burns' office ready for a bit of a tail job on Janet West. 
She leads you all the way to Riverdale. And there, a fine-looking man opens the door for her. And what do you know? He's got white hair and a white mustache. Real nice face. You've seen pictures of him many, many times. Only when you saw them, they had numbers beneath them. Rogue's Gallery pictures. The mailbox in front of the house says Michael West, so you get to a phone booth and call down to Parker. Hello, yeah. Pete Chambers, look, Louie. Do you remember Mike Andes? The old confidence man? That's the one. Is he still in operation? Not lately. Not that I heard. Well, you're gonna hear. Do you have a daughter, that guy? Yeah. Yeah, chip off the old blood. Lastly, runs in the family. Well, come and collect them. What? What are you talking about? He lives up at the Marinette, 1897 Belmont Avenue. Lives under the name of West. Pick up both of them, the father and the daughter. Oh, now look, Pete. Way up there, I'd be happy to do you a favor, but I'm homicide, remember? I got more important things to do than worry about confidence. Louie, how is the stiff in the morgue, the one with the bullet holes? Well, he's still stiff, still unidentified, still a puzzle to me. Well, I'm in the process of solving that puzzle, Lieutenant. Well, Pete, you mean... Yes, I mean. Pick these two up and deliver them to the office of Dr. Philip Burns, 86th Street. Pick up Doc Burns, too. Have him there at 10 o'clock. Keep the old man downstairs out of sight till I show up. And don't give anybody any explanations whatsoever. Okay. I'll see you in Doc Burns' office. I'll have the doc there and the girl there and the old man stashed away outside. Goodbye now. Gotta go and get the old horse and buggy. And so close on to 10 o'clock, you're visiting a pool room on 86th Street, and business certainly is lousy because you're the only customer. There's one guy there, tall and husky in his shirt sleeves, and he's got even bigger muscles than Doc Burns' acrobatic dancer. Also, he's got arrogant black eyes that are bolder than a burlesque dance in Union City. Looking for somebody, Jack? You the boss? Yeah, I'm the boss. You Blackstone? Yeah, I'm Blackstone. Blackstone. You know, that was a great jurist once. Jurist? What's a jurist? A judge, a lawyer. Look, sweetie, I got a mouthpiece by the name of Rabinowitz. He'll spot your Blackstone ten points and your boy won't even know he's been in a tussle. Now, what do you want here? You. What? What's that? We're going to do a little talking, pal, about a body and bullets and a river. You the law, Jack? The private law. Oh, Fink. Well, sweetie, here's what I think of Fink's. <laughs> And here's what I think of muscle guys. Now, get up. Get up, sweetie. Hey, hey, Come on. Please. Where are we going? We're going upstairs and see the dentist. There's a couple of cavities that need filling. Upstairs, you join the cast of characters, and Parker shakes hands with you. Hiya, Pete. Everything taken care of. Who's your boyfriend? What? What's going on here? They're all there except old Mike, plus a lot of cops. And Doc Burns' eyes are popped like he's studying Grace Chandler's muscles. Mr. Chambers, what's the meaning of all this? I, I had your word. It, it was in the strictest confidence. That's just what happened to you, Doc. Confidence. Only add the word game to it confidence game. Uh -huh. And there stands number one, Miss Janet West. What? Or whatever her real name is. My nurse? We... You're crazy, man. That's ridiculous. Ah, uh, they figured out a beautiful blackmail deal. They? Who? Lights going out while you're fighting, phone wires being cut in advance, your flashlight disappearing. What about oh. my corpse, Petey? With the three bullets in it. We'll come to that, Lieutenant. Now think, Doc, think. Who knew you had a gun and where you kept it? Who knew where your flashlight would be? And who knew you had an important patient, Mrs. Griffin, that could be used as a decoy? And who knew that you were going out with Grace Chandler? Come on, Doc, think. Yes. Yes, Janet, but, Doctor, you... you I tailed her I... home. I tailed her home, and it turns out her father's Mike Andes, one of the top con men in the country. By the way, where is he, Lieutenant? Cassidy, bring up Andes. He'll be here in a minute, Pete. Mm. You, you, you got him all, huh? Now, look, I got conned into this, too. It was Mike's idea, all of it. Look, will it help me if I talk? Always helps if you talk. Well, the whole deal was... was... Uh, here's, uh, here's Mike Andes. <gasps> that, that, that's the man I killed. Thought you killed, Doctor. Just wanted you to identify him. That's all we'll need him for, Louis. Okay, Cassidy, get him out of here. 
Uh, the, the pink eyeball is right. The whole deal was a plant. Mike got a bright idea after his daughter got this job here. <sighs> Or only took the job because she knew the doc was plenty well healed. Oh, you dirty, miserable little squeaker. Where did you get the fall guy? Oh, I picked up a bum off the Bowery. Picked out one that looked like Mike. We brought him here and Mike pumped three bullets into him from the doc's gun. Then we cleaned up and me and the stiff were parked in the workroom. Also, we reload the doc's gun with blanks. Hmm. Then Janet called Doc Burns and gave him the emergency bit about Mrs. Griffin, huh? Yeah, Fink. Then right away, hey. the doc comes here to his office and Mike's sitting in his chair holding the gun and saying he's this Chandler's husband. And during the fight, you turn off the fuse for the darkness, huh? Correct, Fink. Hey, the name's Chambers. Hey, Mr. Chambers. Then in the darkness, after the doc thought he'd shot him and while he was stumbling around, we pulled the old switcheroo. Switch the real stiff for Mike. And the phone wire was cut so that he'd have to go out to make his phone call. Right, uh, Mr. Chambers. Which gives us time to lug the stiff out. We mark up his face and dump him in the river. And the whole deal would have worked except Mike got stubborn. Like how? Well, I begged him to get out of the state. But he figured this one was such a wrap-up, he'd stay home and take it easy. Eh, uh, any time you think you're smarter than cops, you're dumb. On which philosophical note, Lieutenant... I'd say it's time to transfer our transgressors to more appropriate surroundings. Say, like, uh, the Who's Gal? And there you've had Crime and Peter Chambers. Dane Clark was starred as Peter Chambers. Crime and Peter Chambers Transcribed was created and written by Henry King. Others in the cast were Bill Zuckert, heard as Lieutenant Parker, Ed Bagley as Dr. Burns, Leon Janney as Blackie, and Ann Diamond as Janet. It was directed by Fred Way, and this is Fred Collins inviting you to tune in next week, same time, same station, for Dane Clark in Crime and Peter Chambers. with us again next week at this same time for another adventure by Peter Chambers in Crime and Peter Chambers. This is the United States Armed Forces Radio and Television Service.
Created by Henry Kane, transcribed and starring Dane Clark. Private investigator, duly licensed and duly sworn, Peter Chambers. You're a private eye. That's your business. Anything else, that's for laughs. You're strolling along Fifth Avenue on a beautiful spring afternoon and you stop at the window of Fitch's department store for a peek at the styles. And then suddenly, she's there beside you. A tall blonde with curves, an electric blonde with voltage. She looks undecided, seems as though she wants to say something and, well... Maybe spring has gotten into you. So you start the ball rolling with a deathless piece of dialogue. Beautiful day, isn't it? Yes, lovely. And uh, and the weather, the weather, it's uh, perfect for strolling. Yes. Um, may we stroll? Yes, yes, of course. My name is Angela Wentworth. I'm uh, Peter Chambers. We're going to call on my uncle, Mr. Chambers. We'll go there directly, if you don't mind. Uncle, she says. We're going to call on my uncle. Well, it's springtime in Manhattan and the squirrels are out. But if that's the way she wants it, she's far too beautiful to argue with. So you accompany her to Madison... And in the elegant hotel, you ride up to the tower apartment, and she nibbles with delicate knuckles on a thickly impressive door. My uncle isn't well. I don't want to wake him if he's sleeping. Uh, do you have a key? Yes, as a matter of fact, I do. Well, then let's use it, huh? Oh, yes. Yes, I shall. Inside, you get a back view of an old guy snoozing by an open window. You can't see his hands there in his lap. Angela taps you and you tiptoe behind her into another room. She sits down and crosses her legs and you've got trouble keeping your eyes away from her knees. But you manage. Well, do you have it? Uh, 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 I beg your pardon? Did you bring it? Bring what? The earring. Earring? What? Oh, where's my handbag? Handbag. Well, here it is. Oh, thank you. Yeah. Here. Read this. A clipping which I tore from the personal column of the Times. Please read it. Out loud. All right. Let me see now. Um, if the lady who lost an earring at the art student's ball Friday evening will meet me in front of Fitch's department store Tuesday afternoon between 2 and 2.30, I shall be happy to return... <laughs> now, do you understand? Yes, yes, I do, and I'm I'm terribly sorry. Sorry? But why? You... Look, look, Miss Wentworth, I didn't insert that ad. You didn't, but... No, no, you... I just happened to be there, and, well, you were there, and, well, conversation sprang up. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> it's funny. Yes. Really funny. But I do think you ought to go now. She sort of starts you on your way, but on your way, you get another look at the old man, and suddenly you don't like it. He hasn't moved, and there's a white waxiness behind his ears, and you go near. What? What is it, Mr. Chambers? He's dead. (sighs) She passes out in a faint, and you let her lie. You go around to the front of the old man, and you take a look. He's got a gun in his hand and two bullet holes in his stomach. You're working at your trade now, and you work quickly and carefully. The room's in perfect order, absolutely no sign of a tussle. The old man's still warm, hasn't been dead an hour. Then, toward the middle of the room, you see it. A round red spot that sort of blends in with the russet color of the rug. You touch it. It's blood. Then you go back to the old man, you dig around in his pockets. You come up with a beautiful triangular emerald earring. And just then, Angela Wentworth starts stirring. 
Oh. Easy, easy does it, Miss Wentworth. Oh. Come on, come on. Let me help you up. Oh. There. Oh. There you are. Oh, my uncle. Uncle. He's dead. He appears to have shot himself. Oh, no. Now, look, look, look. Let's go back to the other room, huh? All right. Come on. Oh. Now, there, will you sit down? Thank you. I'll use the phone. <laughs> Operator. Police headquarters. Emergency. I only left him perhaps an hour ago. Hello? Hello, I want to report a death. That's right, a death. 598 Madison Avenue, a hotel, the Tower Apartment. All right, now, Miss Wentworth, there's nothing we can do but wait for the police. Oh, it, it's terrible, terrible. Look, I uh, found this, this earring in your uncle's pocket. Oh, thank you. It's the mate of the one I lost. Well, what was it doing in your uncle's pocket? That clipping. A person said they would return the lost one if I could identify it. So I brought the mate here to Uncle. Left it with him and intended to bring the finder here with me. Show him the mate to the earring, which would be perfect identification. Is it valuable? Each earring is insured for $20,000, but... Oh, look, Mr. Chambers, may I... May I please call somebody? Well, sure. Who do you want to call? Oliver Hartford. My brother-in-law. He's married to my sister. He came here with my uncle. They... Live way up in New Hampshire, all of them. Mm, what about you? Well, I live here in the city. May I call Oliver? All right, where's he staying? Right here, this hotel. One of the downstairs suites. Well, let's call him. Would you connect me with Mr. Hartford, please? There you are. Oh, thank you. Hello, Ollie. Come up to Uncle's suite. Quickly, please. <laughs> The guy shows. Oliver Hartford, big, young, and brawny. He sort of takes over in the comfort department for his sister-in-law. And presently, there's an onslaught of cops, medical examiner, fingerprint men, and the works. And boss man of the works, your good friend, Detective Lieutenant Louis Parker. Looking a little harassed today, but working with his usual competence. And then, after they're all done, and the medical examiner has made his report, and the body has been taken out... Parker takes you aside, and you fill him in on your end of the deal. Well, they got me working today. I got three unfinished cases. Now this thing pops up. Well, it never rains. Medical examiner says suicide. The girls identified the gun as the old man's. Emmy says time of death, 2 o'clock. Door was locked. Who else had keys? Nobody but the old man. He lent his to the girl, and she was with you when the thing happened. Check. Suicide, period. Boy, I am busy today. Now let me go in and talk to those two, the relatives, and then I'll beat it out of here. Sure, Louie. Let me go talk to them. All right, then, Miss uh, Wentworth, Mr. Hartford. Oh, by the way, Mr. Chambers here is a private detective. And one of the best. Oh. So, just in case either of you are not satisfied with the way the police may be oh, handling Oh, well, we're, we're perfectly satisfied, Lieutenant, of course. All right, then, let's get some of the facts out of the way. Hmm? Name of deceased, Robert Wentworth, a rich man, ex-oil man, worth many millions, retired widower. Hmm? Yes, his only two living relatives, his nieces, uh... Miss Angela Wentworth, of course, my wife, Marie Wentworth Hartford. Where's your wife now? Why, uh, she's at home up in New Hampshire. See, I came in with Uncle Robert last week. Okay. Medical examiner says suicide, and every external item points to suicide. Time, 2 o'clock. Now, where were you at 2 o'clock, Mr. Hart? In my room, napping. And you, Miss Wentworth? With Mr. Chambers on Fifth Avenue near Fitch's department. I'll corroborate that, Lieutenant. Thank you, Mr. Chambers. You're very welcome, Mr. Yeah, Chambers. Yeah, all, all right, all right. Uh, Sorry, lost my head. <clears throat> now, this suicide thing, would Mr. Wentworth be disposed to suicide? Oh, oh yes. yes. No well, one at a time, that. now, please, one at a time. Huh? You, Miss Wentworth. Well, Lieutenant, my uncle was very ill. He was here for an operation. The doctors gave him very little chance. Did he know that he had this very little chance? Yes, of course he knew it. Better than any of us. Yeah, Seems to be clean cut, no loose ends. Mr. Hartford. Yes, sir. Would you accompany me downtown? I need a member of the family, many little items of routine. Why, yes, of course, Lieutenant, of course. And so you're alone again with Miss Angela Wentworth. You take her home to a cute little apartment on East 34th, and there... Thank you, Mr. Chambers. You've been very kind. Not at all. Uh, look, Angela, ours was a, well, a chance acquaintance, but there's no reason why it should end there. 
No. No reason at all. I... I like you very much, Mr. Chambers. And, um... I like you. Look. A lawyer was mentioned back there. Was that the only person your uncle would want to see to arrange his affairs? No, there was another. And much more important. Algernon Sacco, his business advisor. Sacco? He has an office down on Pine Street. Bye now, Miss Wentworth. I'll be in touch with you. Yes, please do. Now, here's a brand new wrinkle. Algernon Sacco. Crooked as a country road. A big operator and a shrewd one. You tangled with him a few times, but that was way back before he acquired respectability and a few rich clients. An old cackle voice guy, but smart as a brand new whip. So, you're down on Pine Street. Old stone and steel. No pines. No pines at all. Yeah. Who do you wish to see? Mr. Sacco, and tell him I'm in a hurry. Nobody's in a hurry with Mr. Sacco. I'm in a hurry. Use that little intercom of yours and tell him Peter Chambers. Just a minute. Yes? Mr. Sacco, a gentleman here to see you. Says he's in a hurry. A Mr. Peter Chambers. Who, who, who did you say? A Mr. Peter Chambers. Oh, of course. Send him in at once. See what I mean, baby? I'm a real VIP. That's all to your right, Mr. Chambers. Well, 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 good to see you again, my dear private operator. Now, Jimmy boy, I shall not mince, as they say, words. To the point, then, Peter. Robert Wentworth. Oh, excellent client. Loaded? Twenty million dollars. Oh, boy, are you going to be sad to hear this. Yeah, what? He's dead. Dead? You're kidding. I never kid when it has to do with death. Now, look, I want the rundown on this guy, and I want it fast, and I want it all. Do you have a will? Uh, yes. Well, come on, come on, let's hear it. The, the will left his entire estate to his two nieces, Angela and Marie. Wow. Ten million dollars each, huh? And who was the executor to this will? Me, Algernon Sacco. Pretty piece of change involved for uh, Algernon Sacco. Uh, yes, now that he's dead, before he changed his will, I learned that pretty piece of change. Fees and commissions, it bounced up, it bounced up. Now, now, wait a minute, wait a minute, yeah. wait a minute. You just said before he changed his will. Did he have any intention of changing it? Well, uh, well, uh, Come on, look, pal, there might be a motive here for murder. Oh, you mean I... It's got its angles, but if it gets to the cops, it gets to the newspapers, and all your background gets washed up. Now, you can't use that algae, not the new, respectable algae on Sacco. Uh, but, uh, what do you want to know? Well, you know what the man says all the time. The facts, pal, the facts. Well, he came in late last week and discussed changing his will. He felt that his nieces were well provided for. He was making up his mind to leave his entire estate to medical research. Did you like that? No, I did not. So what did you do about uh, it? So I got in touch with Oliver Hartford. After all, a change of will meant a loss to Mr. Hartford's wife of ten million dollars. And when your wife loses, you lose. What did his Hartford do about it? I don't know. But he was going to tackle the old man and see if he couldn't talk him out of it. Okay, Algie, thanks for the information. Keep respectable, uh, pal. Uh, Peter Chambers! You're working now. You're beginning to smell what you suspected. Murder. You get up to Angela Wentworth's place and she opens the door for you and your eyes pop. She's wearing blue silk lounging pajamas and she has a pony of brandy in her hand. Blue silk lounging pajamas. They were born to be worn by Angela Wentworth. It's good to see you again, Mr. Chambers. Likewise, Miss Wentworth. You, uh... Seem to be rolling with the blow. Well, I've been thinking about it. Uncle Robert was an old man and very ill. Perhaps it was for the best. Look, at the ball you attended when you lost your earring... Would you like some brandy, Mr. Chambers? Well, I'll take a rain check on it. Now, that ball you attended, who went with you? I mean, uh, who was your escort? Oliver, my brother-in-law. Uncle insisted. I think I had one cocktail too many at that ball. That earring was gone before I realized it. Mr. Chambers? Mr. Chambers, where are you going? You're going to pay a social call on Oliver Hartford. You knock on his door and he opens and you pull your way in. Hey, what's the meaning of this? What's the matter with you? Nothing, nothing. Just got no manners, I suppose. Get out of here. I'm going, but you're coming with me. I'm going with you? 
Where? Downtown, police headquarters. And just what are we going to do there? I'm going to accuse you of murder. Oliver swings, you duck. You swing, Oliver ducks. But he doesn't duck good enough. He goes down and out. And as you finish the pivot of your swing, there stands Detective Lieutenant Louis Parker in the doorway. Real nice form, Pete. You're starting to get your shoulders into it. Huh? Thanks, Louis. Incidentally, uh, apologies to the private eye. From whom? From me. I'm not busy anymore. So? So the old guy was murdered. He wasn't a suicide. That's my Louis. Got finished with the press of business. Had time to think. If there's a spot of blood in the middle of the room, how come we find the old guy in the rocker by the window? Exactly. He was shot in the middle of the room. Yeah. Then he was pulled over to the rocker. The gun was wiped and put into his hand. Furthermore, downtown, a paraffin test shows the old guy never fired the gun, and that clinches it. That figures. Where have you been till now, Louis? Backtracking after you. Saw that psycho guy, saw that Angela, read that newspaper clipping. Mm. He took it to the ball, Oliver did. Sure, and he stuffs her full of cocktails and clips the earring. And sticks that phony ad in the paper. So he can get her out of the way. Mm. Then he goes in to see the old man, bumps him with his own gun, fixes it for suicide, and leaves. And the door locks on the clicker, so we got a, a locked room in the bargain. Well, what's our next step, Louis? Well, we take this bum downtown. Let's get him back to consciousness. We take him downtown and see how he acts under a bright white light. Oliver Hartford at headquarters gets closeted with Detective Parker and a host of excellent interrogators. You wait across the street in Luke McCool's Lonesome Bar and Grill. You sip on a stinger and you ponder. It figures for about two hours. Brother, when cops know you've done it and you're an amateur, you're a blustering wise guy for part of the way, but pretty soon you break wide open. Unless you're very smart or very stubborn. And you've got a feeling that Oliver may be very stubborn. So you're off and running and you're making tracks again for Angela Wentworth's place. Come in, come in, Mr. Chambers. You're becoming quite a regular visitor. And I like it. You like it too, but you don't have the time. I offer brandy. Again, Mr. Chambers. And again, I've got to refuse. Double rain check this time, Miss Wentworth. Now, look, look. That earring, may I have it? The earring? Ange look, may I call you Angela? Oh, please do. Well, you can trust me with it. I had it once and I gave it back to you, remember? Yes, but why... Please, please, let me have it and I'll return it to you. And when I do, I've got a hunch I'll have the time for, um, uh, perhaps a brandy or two. All right, Mr. Chambers. Here it is. And so you're back in Luke McCool's lonesome bar and grill across the street from headquarters, and you're trifling with stingers again when Parker shows up. And he hangs a face in front of you that's longer than a lover's kiss. Pete, boy, we've got us a tartar. Meaning who? Meaning that Oliver Hartford. Tough boy. That's tough. The guy killed Uncle Robert so that his wife could pick up 10 million solid simoleons. There's no one else, Louie. No one else could possibly have done it if nobody with motive. You're so right, boy. Angela, she was with you. Sacco, no question, he was in his office all day. The other niece, Oliver's wife, we've checked it. She's in New Hampshire. No question, we've got the right pigeon. We've got him right up to the breaking point, but he won't break. Pete, all I need is a gimmick, one little thing to shove him over. And I've got it for you, Lieutenant. Got what? The crowbar that'll topple the rock. Only this crowbar is green, it's shiny, and it's worth 20,000 bucks. Here. Look. Hey, that's a beauty. Where'd you get that? Out of Oliver Hartford's suite. No. Yep. So, Louis, my lad, take this earring and shove it down his throat. Gimme, pal. So you're alone once more, and you've got your fingers crossed. Psychologically, it fits. But if it blows up, you're going to be in the middle of the explosion. If it blows, it'll blow all over you. But 20 minutes later, Park is back and he's beaming. He returns the earring and he claps you on the back. And a clap on the back from Parker is like a jolt of the jaw from Marciano. Got him, got him, got him good. Full confession, the works. Broke him down completely. 
Oh, and now he's up the other alley pleading for leniency. Uh, you tricked him, Louis. I tricked him? No, not me. That's my pride. I'm a straight cop. I tricked nobody. I know, I know. So I had to trick you into tricking him. What? What are you talking about? The emerald earring. What about it? It's the wrong one. It's the one out of Uncle's pocket. The mate to the one that disappeared. The wrong one? Well, then where's the right one? Well, it must be where, uh, psychologically, it ought to be. Now, you had the guy on the brink, Louie. There wasn't time to go looking for the right one, so I used the wrong earring for the right purpose, and it worked. So now... <laughs> Let's go find the right one. You accompany Parker and five of his best boys to Oliver's suite, and they give it a professional going over, and they come up with the earring. Inside, a cake of soap. <laughs> Amateurs are all alike. They think they've discovered a brand new hiding place just because they thought of it. Parker gives them to you, the pair. Go ahead, kiddo. You return them. You may as well get something out of this. Glory, at least. And so the private eye in proper tradition is back where he belongs. In the beautiful lady's apartment. He partakes of a bit of brandy... And then he presents her with a complete set of emerald earrings. Oh, Mr. Chambers. I... I don't know how to thank you. Think nothing of it, ma'am? A fee. Would you perhaps accept a fee? No, thanks. Nothing as mundane as a fee. Oh, but I... I just don't know how to thank you. Well, you think about it, Angela. Just sip your brandy and think. Come here, Mr. Chambers. Oh, I'm coming, ma'am. I think I know what you mean. Something like this? Mmm. Oh, Mr. Chambers. And there you've had crime and Peter Chambers. Dane Clark was starred as Peter Chambers. Crime and Peter Chambers transcribed was created and written by Henry Kane. Others in the cast were Bill Zuckert, heard as Lieutenant Parker, Joyce Gordon as Angela, and Bernard Grant as Oliver. It was directed by Fred Way. And this is Fred Collins inviting you to tune in next week, same time, same station, for Dane Clark in Crime and Peter Chambers. Crime and Peter Chambers has come to you through the worldwide facilities of the United States Armed Forces Radio and Television Service.
Farr and Peter Chambers. Created by Henry Kane, transcribed and starring Dane Clark. Private investigator, duly licensed and duly sworn, Peter Chambers. You're a private eye. That's your business. Anything else? That's for laughs. It's 5.30 in the afternoon and you're at a cocktail party on Park Avenue. Right up to now, you've been bored. But that was right up to now. Before you saw her. Now you've seen her. And she's about as beautiful as anything you've ever seen in your life. She's seated at a piano, idly doing improvisation. Uh, may I, uh... Oh, is it all right? May I sit here beside you? Why, yes, certainly. I'd been hoping you would. Well, now. You're Peter Chambers, aren't you, honey? The detective type fella? Oh, I love that hominy grits accent. My name's Lenore. And I love that name. Mr. Peter Chambers. I just couldn't perk up enough nerve to approach you, but I did so want to talk with you. Hmm. Mr. Peter Chambers? Uh, oh, that's for you, uh, isn't it? Look when. Uh, here, I'm uh, Peter Chambers. Uh, uh, telephone call for you, sir. Where? Uh, just follow me, sir. All right, I'll be back, Lenore. Don't go away. I'll be waiting. You're right this way, sir. Thank you. Here you are. Thank you. Hello? Pete? Hello, Pete? Oh, no. It's Louie Parker, Detective Lieutenant Parker. Oh, can't I lose you anywhere? Here I am at a park in your shindig, yeah, Louie, and... Yeah, it's a good thing I knew where to find you. It's murder, Pete. Well, what else when Parker of homicide is involved? Look, one of our suspects is a kid by name of Jack March. Jack March. I know that boy. Yeah, he won't talk to cops. But he says he will talk to you. He'll talk to Peter Chambers only. Well, if that's the way it is, Louie... When do you need me? Right away. High View Apartments on Sutton Place. Apartment 16A. Hey, very fancy. And who lives there? The Contessa La Fresso. Wow, that's real fancy, too. Is she there? She's here. And she ain't here, if you know what I mean. She's dead. All right, I'll be there. Good boy. Bye now. <laughs> Detective Lieutenant Louis Parker... When he asks a favor, you jump. Because with you, as with everyone else, Louis Parker rates. Only with you, he rates special because you don't only respect him as a cop, you respect him as a friend. So you get to Sutton Place, the apartment of the Contessa La Fresso. Park is there. A lovely red-headed maid is there. Jack March is there. And one other guy. A tough baby by the name of Stoney Carter. Uh, how long are you going to... You know everybody here, Pete? Hi, Mr. Chambers. How are you, Jack? I'm lousy. I think I'm in the middle of a quick frame. Just hold it, young fella. Pete, uh, you know Stoney Carter? Me and a shamus, we have met now and then. I've always preferred the then to the now. Go with the play on words. (laughs) Stoney Carter. A hoodlum from way back. An easy money guy that's always stayed inside the law. Not so young Jack March. A good kid turned wrong and then turned right again. He's done a stretch and he's been paroled and you're one of those who made character for him. He's driving a cab last you heard. But the redhead's more attractive than both of them put together. And you're beginning to debate between the redhead and Lenore, but uh, uh, you stay faithful to Lenore. Pete. Yeah? Notice all I've got is three uniformed cops here. My staff is on the way. We haven't really got started yet. And already you've garnered two suspects? Yeah. Come in here, the bedroom. In the bedroom, Parker pulls down a sheet and shows you the Contessa La Fresso. Dead. Knife to death. He points out a switch knife lying on the dresser. The dresser's also got two vases on it. One with gardenias and one with orchids. The flowers wilted and tired. 
Red-headed maid came back and found her like that. Came back from where? Let me get the sheet back over the Contessa. Yeah, she doesn't look very pretty now. Okay. Denise, will you come in here, please? Oui, monsieur. Denise Monet, Peter Chambers. How do you do? How do? Denise, would you uh, tell Mr. Chambers just what happened? Well, it was about ten minutes to five. Madame was in bed napping. I knew she had an appointment at five, so I woke her. An appointment? With whom? Uh, with Monsieur Stoney Carter for five o'clock. The other one was for five thirty. What other one? The other appointment. What other appointment? The one with uh, Monsieur Jacques Marsh. Okay, Miss Denise, so you woke her up. Oh, she was very tired. We only came home today from a week in the country. There was shopping to do, and she told me to go and do it, the shopping. But I say, madame, you will have a guest shortly. And what did she say? She yawned and say, so he will wake me up, leave the door unlocked. Which is just what she does. She leaves the door unlocked and blows. She comes back at 20 after 5, she finds your friend Jack March standing in here. Knife is in his hand, and the Contessa, she's dead. So quickly I call the police, and quickly the police come. And what does Jack March do in the meantime? He stands like, um, oh, how you say it, um, uh, petrified. Hey, petrified is pretty good. And we find him like that, knife in his hand. And, of course, he clams. The poor kid. He don't trust cops. He starts wailing for Peter Chambers. He don't trust law, but he trusts Peter Chambers. Look, he's a good kid, Lou. Good kid, schmood kid. He's got a knife in his hand. He's here on the scene. What does he get for that, the purple heart? And that bum out there, the first appointment, the five o'clock guy, Stoney Carter. What about him? Well, the minute Denise gives us the story, one of my boys picks him up at his place. Where is his place? Hotel Bilton. He'd hardly got there. Still had his hat on. Okay. So, I suppose you want me to talk to the kid? Yeah, I wish you would. For his sake. All right. But let's sort of do it in a hurry. I've got to get back to a party. Oh, business deal there, Pete? Well, not exactly business. Uh, uh-huh. Well, yeah, if you want to put it that way. Now, look, Miss Denise. Uh, oui, Monsieur Chambre. Ooh, aren't you the cute one? Mm, oui, Monsieur Chambre. Oh, you Denise, you. You know, if there wasn't a Lenore... Uh, uh, Lenore, there is perhaps, but Lenore's... Oh, poof, there are many... There is but one, Denny. You know, I got a small hunch. You're right, honey. Well, look, lover boy, break it up, huh? What did you, what did you want to ask you? Uh, sorry, Louis, lost my head. Now, these flowers here, Denise, what are they? Orchids and gardenias. A bow of the contest he gives them last week. Mm, but they're all wilted. Of course. It was last week. Oh. And we have been away all this week. Now, look, Pete, uh, you want to talk to the kid now? I'll talk to both of them. Stony Carter first, if it's all right with you, Louis. Yeah, sure. In here or out there? Out there. French maid. Stoney. At your service, Lieutenant. Tell Mr. Chambers your tale of woe, huh? Tale of woe. <laughs> hey, simple. Okay, let's hear it. I got a date with the Contessa for five bells. I come. I knock. No answer. I try the door. It's open. I goes in. Finds her asleep. I wake her. We chop chop. But she ain't in the mood for no company. She's sleepy. So I blow the joint. How long did you stay? Oh, maybe 10, 15 minutes. And then? I get back to my hotel. And ain't there maybe a minute when wham, banging on the door. Cops. They lug me back here. That's it. Okay, now you, Jack March. Your personal private eye is here. You want to unclam now? Or you want a personal private trip downtown? Easy, Louie, easy, will you? Jack. Yeah? You trust me, don't you, kid? Yes, sir. Mr. Chambers? All right, tell me what happened. Look, they, they railroad me. I've been in the can once. I don't want it. I don't want it no more. Look, Mr. Chambers, I'm driving a hack. Special OK from the hack bureau. I'm doing it all right. Now I got to get caught up in this. What happened, kid? Well, I had a date with her for 5.30. Yeah. I come early. Like Stoney says, the door was open. Only I don't find her asleep. I find her dead. And there's a knife on the floor. I like a dope, I picks it up and then the maid barges in. What am I going to do? Me with a ship in my hand? Stab her and make a run for it? So I just stand there like the big dope I am and that's it. A dead dame, a knife, and me in the middle. 
You didn't kill her, did you, kid? You think he'd tell you if he did? Yes, Louie, I think he would. I didn't. I didn't kill her. Why should I kill her? Pete, uh, come over here a minute. Huh? Parker takes you aside and thanks you. The staff will be here soon, and they'll take over on the scientific aspects. So, since there's nothing left for you to do, you tell Parker to keep you posted and that you're going back to that Park Avenue shindig, and back there you go. Hi, Mr. Chambers. Hi. It's so good to see you again. I told you I'd be back, Lenore. Uh, Lenore, uh... Stanhope. Oh, beautiful girl, beautiful name. Another beautiful name happened to me just a short while ago. Denise. Oh, honey. There are so many Denises. But there's only one little old Lenore. <laughs> you, know, you two must have studied in the same book. But, Lenore, my love, I am faithful unto you. Let us go <laughs> gather cocktails. You're just the man for a criminologist to meet. Who needs criminologists? I've got you. I... <laughs> Mr. Chambers? Oh, oh, here's that man again. All right, here, here I am. A phone call, Mr. Chambers. Thank you. Oh, what's your name? Livingston, sir. Lead me to it, Mr. Livingston. And Lenore, once more, my apologies. This way, Mr. Chambers. You go to the phone, and guess who? We've got developments, Pete. Look, I'm working on a few developments myself, Louis. We're booking your boy, but there have been a couple of interesting developments. Oh, uh, like what? Well, that's not for phone talk. I'll wait for you if you promise to come over to the apartment, but pronto. All right, I'll be there as fast as I can. Don't go away. I'll be here, but do it quick, huh? So, once more, you do the apology bit for Lenora Stanhope. You tell her you'll be back, that you'll call her even before you come back. And then you tear yourself away. And you're on your shuttle again. You're back at Sutton Place in the Countess's apartment. And there's nobody there. Not even the body. There's only Parker, or a couple of cops, and Stoney Carter. Where's everybody? Well, your boy's downtown being booked. Body's been picked up by the basket boys, and my staff has departed. Well, there was one little bright light down here who was conspicuous by her absence, that Denise. What happened to her? <laughs> you turned on her like a refrigerator, so she kind of shined up to one of my young cops who went downtown with him. Mm-hmm. You going to brush her up on uh, criminology? Mayhap, my lad, mayhap. Well, there's always Lenore. Lenore? Who that? Private lieutenant. Private for the private eye. <laughs> now, what's with the developments? Well, first, we've got a little motive, finally. Like what? Robbery. There's a brooch missing from a drawer of that dresser in the bedroom. The one with the flowers on it? Mm -hmm. The wilted orchids and gardenias? Yep. Top drawer. Kept the jewelry there. Insured, but the brooch is gone, and it's worth 100,000 bananas. And you mean the dame woke up while one of our two suspects was kind of helping himself to this, uh... Diamond brooch, yeah. Uh -huh. Figure she woke, squawked, got stuck. So? Who stuck her? We say your boy, Jack March. Fingerprints on knife, only one set, his. What about fingerprints on the dresser drawer? Got a smudge, which could have been a fingerprint. And then we got a fingerprint, which turns out to be Stony Carter's. Then why are you holding my boy? Because, one, your boy was caught red-handed with the knife. Two, only his prints are on the knife. And three, the smudge could have been his print, only it got smudged, and that happens often enough. Now, how does dear old Stoney explain his print? Let him talk for himself. Huh? Sure, Lieutenant. I am happy to oblige. Oh, I love these oily, obliging guys. Okay, big shot. Oblige. It's like this. I get here. She's sleeping. She wakes up. We chat. These flowers are all wilted. The petals are all over the dresser. Dropped from these here flowers, you see? I'm a neat guy. Always been a neat guy. So, while we're chatting, I'm kind of cleaning up these petals with fell, you see? I'm shoving them into the palm of my hand. You see, I'm going to dump them down the incinerator. All right, do it a little faster, Stoney, huh? Oh, yeah, yeah. Well, the top drawer's a little open. Some of them petals I'm cleaning up, brushing them together like some of them fall in there. So I pull a drawer open, take out the ones that fall in, dump the heap into the incinerator. Like that, my print maybe gets on a knob of that drawer. Well, simple enough to be perfectly logical. Time. Time to go into a huddle again, Lieutenant. You and me, alone. Yeah, sure, Pete. Come in the bedroom. It's empty now. You holding that bird out there? I haven't got on what to hold him. And he's wise enough to know it. He's beefing for his lawyer already. But you're holding the kid, aren't you? A kid who's trying to straighten himself out, driving a oh, cab. Now, he's... look, be sensible. We got him with the goods. Fingerprints, witness, the works. 
But what about the brooch? Well, our fast figure is he got rid of it somewhere first, and then back here, he's about to clean up on the knifing deal when the maid shows. Now, wait a minute. So he plays it dumb, you see. Stands here, he doesn't make a run for it, and he says he picks the knife up off the But it could be true, can it? Only his prints are on it. But it's possible that the knife was wiped, and then he picked it up. Oh, everything's possible, but we got a case against him. Against the Stony, we haven't got a thing. You're going to look over his place at the Bilton? Well, we haven't got a right. You need a search warrant for that. We haven't got a thing to base a warrant on. Yeah, but I don't need a warrant. What does that mean? The thing blew wide open fast, and you picked up Stoney at the Bilton. He'd hardly gotten into his place yet. You said yourself he had his hat still on his head. So? So? If maybe he did cop that brooch, it'd still be there. He just didn't have a chance to move it. But I can't get a warrant. I got no grounds for it. Good enough. So that's where little boy private eye fits in. Where? Listen, Louie, hold him here for half an hour, and then let him go. Give him a five-minute head start, and then you call on him at the Bilton. Strictly a social call. What'll you be working on in the meantime? Me? Be working on trying to get young Jack March out of the can. If I'm wrong, I apologize. If I'm right, a good kid gets spared a lot of grief. Bye now, Louie. So, off you go on your scooter. First stop is an old friend, an elderly Greek gentleman who owns a florist shop. You have a bit of discourse on the subject of flowers, including orchids and gardenias. And you come away with some edifying results. Then at the Bilton, you learn that Stoney's place is 426. So you pace the fourth floor corridor waiting for him. There's a phone booth and you use it. Uh, Mr. Livingston, I presume? Uh, this is Livingston, sir. Mr. Chambers, Livingston. Uh, Mr. Chambers? Oh, at the other end of the wire this time, sir, eh? <laughs> oh, very funny. Would you page Lenora Stano, please? Uh, no need to page her, sir. She's right here at this end of the wire. Oh, you're killing me. Put her on, will you? One moment, please. Uh, Mr. Oh, thank you, kindly. Hello? Lenora? This is Pete. Peter Chambers. Oh, Sweetie, I thought you'd plumb forgotten. Oh, swell chance. It's just that I've been torn between what I want to do and, uh, uh, what I want to do. You're not quite coherent, are you, Peter? Uh, later I'll be coherent, honey. Special for you, I'll be coherent when I get back. But, honey, when will that be? Soon, honey. Very soon now. You'll wait, won't you? Well. Oh, come on now. Please wait. I will if you say so. But I'm beginning to lose patience. You're... You're so gossamer. One moment you're here, the next moment you're gone. Oh, I'll be back, baby, and this time I'll stay. All right, then. We'll wait. You hang up, you mop your brow, and then Stoney comes tearing along like there's a tailwind behind him. He gets his key in the door, he gets in, and you jump him. All right. Catches you with a couple of wild ones, and you let fly a few wild ones on him. But then he runs into a real beautiful bouquet of knuckles. Oh. And now Stony is real Stony. He's also rigid, stretched out on the floor like a welcome mat. You close the door and you get ready for a search, but no real search is needed. You come up with that brooch faster than a racehorse breaking from the barrier. You just pick it up out of a desk drawer where you dropped it when Parker's cops had come to pick him up. Then there's a rapping on the door. Detective Lieutenant... Hi. It's me. Just dropping in for a social call. Here's your brooch, Louis. Uh Uh-huh. Mm-hmm. Well, maybe it'll clear you, kid. But without a search warrant, this bum will accuse you of planting it here. So will his lawyer. Well, where would I have gotten? From the kid... They'll say the kid slipped it to you, which they'll say is the reason the kid wanted you in the first place. Uh, that's right. That's right. Here, help me up. You had it right, Lieutenant. A plan. It's strictly a plan. It's not going to work, Stoney. Well, say about that. I got lawyers. Lieutenant, that story he gave you about how his print got on that dresser drawer. You got a statement on that? Oh, yeah. Sworn statement. Good, because that statement and this brooch here, together, they'll sit him in the hot seat. But good. I told you about those flowers. 
I told you how I cleaned up the petals from those gardenias and those orchids. They was all wilted. You saw them yourself. Some of the petals dropped in the drawer. I took them out. That's how the print got on there. Keep talking, pal. You're killing me. And better, you're killing yourself. I don't get it, Pete. You just talk to any florist, Louie, and they'll tell you. Tell me what? That there's a certain special feature about orchids and gardenias. Special feature? Neither gardenias nor orchids shed their petals regardless of age. What, Pete? They wither and they'll wilt. But petals, they just don't shed. What? You're a liar! No, I'm not, Stoney. Wait till he gets to your lawyer. He'll convince you that this is one time you talked out of turn. That's nice work, Petey. And you, let's go. Downtown, for you, special, I'll fix up your cell with petunias. And so, breathless but determined, you're back at the cocktail party. It's begun to thin out, but Lenore is still there. Ah, the good Mr. Chambers. We were beginning to lose hope. Uh, what's with the we? I thought she said we over the phone, too. What is that, an editorial we? A queenly we? A... Oh, no. Purely a grammatical we. Huh? We. Myself and my husband. What? You see, my husband is an amateur criminologist, and he's somewhere about drinking, of course, and when I tell him about the prize catch I have for him... Husband? Did you, when I did tell you... him that you're here and a what? man with your wealth of experience is willing to sit around with him and discuss the various topics... Ju- ju- just, just, uh, just a minute, please. Yeah, yeah. Did you say husband? Yes, I said husband. Oh, that's what I thought you said. Oh, that Denise. Oh, my aching back. But, honey, child, my name's Lenore. Yeah, I know, Lenore. But I'd have sworn you said Denise. I know just what I said. Well, I gotta go now. Bye. Again? And this time, honey, child, I ain't a-coming back. But no how. And there you've had Crime and Peter Chambers. Dane Clark was starred as Peter Chambers. Crime and Peter Chambers transcribed was created and written by Henry Kane. Others in the cast were Bill Zuckert, heard as Lieutenant Parker, Ralph Bell as Stoney, Donald Buke as Jack, and Anita Anton as Lenore. It was directed by Fred Way, and this is Fred Collins inviting you to tune in next week, same time, same station, for Dane Clark in Crime and Peter Chambers. And Peter Chambers has come to you through the worldwide facilities of the United States Armed Forces Radio and Television Service.
Crime and Peter Chambers. Created by Henry Kane, transcribed and starring Dane Clark. Private investigator, duly licensed and duly sworn, Peter Chambers. You're a private eye. That's your business. Anything else? That's for laughs. It's mid-afternoon, and you're in a nightclub on business. There's nothing more ghastly than a nightclub in the daytime. It reminds you of the whitewash inside of an unfinished coffin. Anyway, this one's called a Cafe Tropical, and in the nighttime, when its tinsel isn't showing, it's considered quite swanky. Mr. Chambers? Yes? I'm Bruce Eldridge. I'm delighted that you could come. Bruce Eldridge, prospective client. He's one of the owners of the Cafe Tropical. About 35, well-dressed, and quite good-looking. And quite composed, except his eyes are nervous. I take it uh, that you know what happened here last night? Well, your partner, Paul Maxwell, he caught up with a slight case of lead poisoning. He was shot to death right here in the club. Mm, So I've read in the newspapers. Observe the architecture of our little nightclub here. Mm. Now, there's this narrow little room where the bar is. Yeah. And off there, there, there's the archway which leads into the club proper. That's where we have our entertainment. And uh, this stairway right here? Now, that leads upstairs where Mr. and Mrs. Maxwell have their apartment. Oh, the guy that was killed? Yes. He and his wife, Claire. This was, well, sort of their town apartment. Mm, Very cozy. Last night, uh, our entertainment was in full blast. Uh, Paul, this Paul Maxwell, was seated out here at the bar alone. He was shot and killed. Mm. He slumps over. Nobody's the wiser. Tobias, the bartender, thinks Paul has grabbed a little catnap. And it's definitely established by the police that he was shot from the main room, through the archway. Now, what about the gun? Well, sir, one of our patrons, the distinguished book critic, Mr. Charles Morris, felt something strange in his tongue. Wait, wait, wait. Don't tell me that turned out to be the murder gun. Yes, yes, it did. In the rush of the crowd, the culprit probably slipped it into the first strange pocket he found which turned out to be Mr. Morse's. And what did this uh, Charles Morse do? Well, he turned it over to the management, which in this case was Mrs. Maxwell, uh, Claire Maxwell. The new widow. Mm -hmm. Mm Well, how many people in this management? There were three. Paul, myself, and Claire, equal partners. Claire also acted as hostess. So what happened then? Well, Mr. Morse uh, waited for the police, told them the story, and that was that. The police, of course, uh, now have the gun. Okay, Miss Eldridge, where do you fit me into this? I... uh, I have reason to believe that it was my gun. What? I owned a gun like that. I have a license for it. Two days ago, it disappeared from my apartment. Now, Mr. Chambers, I want to retain you right now to find out who stole that gun and who murdered Paul Maxwell. Well, don't you think the cops will attend to that? That's just what I'm afraid of. They'll attend to it. And they'll come up with me. Guns can be traced, can't they? Mm, I see what you mean. There's a $500 fee in it for you, sir. All right. Now, just where were you about the time Paul Maxwell was killed? Inside, in the main room. I was seated at a table with Claire Maxwell, Charles Morris, and Ruth Benson. Who's Ruth Benson? She sings here in between shows. What were you people doing at your table at the time? We were watching the show. New act, uh, Calvin Cole, a wizard on the Afro-Cuban drums, and a dancer, Menage. All right, now, explain to me how a guy can get shot from the main room to this bar here without anybody hearing the shot or seeing the flash. Well... Mr. Chambers, you see, there, there was a show. Good afternoon, Mr. Eldridge. Well, hello, Mr. Chambers. Uh-huh. Oh, you know our bartender, sir. You know Tobias? Uh, he knows a lot of bartenders. I used to serve him when I worked in PJs. Toby Tobias, lank and thin, with a shock of hair falling over his forehead. And the wise old ageless eyes that seem to be the trademark of bartenders born to be bartenders. Well, Toby, would you explain to Mr. Chambers how a shot can be fired and a man killed during our entertainment without anyone being the wiser? That'd be my pleasure, Mr. Eldridge. Uh, you know who we got here, don't you, Mr. Chambers? Yeah, Calvin Cole, they tell me, and his Afro-Cuban drums, and uh, Manaja. Yeah. Oh, now, here's how it works. The lights go out, you see, with a small spot on Calvin. Now, he wraps them drums like gunshots. Then this Manaja comes out in a wild veil dance, and they work the lights like flashes of lightning around us. So, a shot from a real gun... It gets covered by Calvin Cole's drumbeat gunshots and then flashes a lightning around this menagerie. Oh, I get it. Mm-hmm. Is uh, Mrs. Claire Maxwell upstairs? Uh, yeah, she is. Is it okay, Eldridge, if I go up and see her? 
I don't see why not. Well, thanks. It's the door at the head of the stairs. Yes, who is it? Mr. Eldridge said I could speak with you. May I come in? You may. She sits down, crosses her legs, and lights a cigarette. She's blonde, blue-eyed, on the sunny side of 40, and uh, she's got her points. She's also got a pretty good temper, it seems. What is it, please? Uh, my name is Peter Chambers. I'm a private investigator, and I've been requested to look into the events of last night, so... Uh... Oh, you've been requested, huh? Yes, ma'am. Well, listen, you private eyes in books, private eyes in radio, fine, a lot of fun. When it comes to real life, I don't go for it. We got the police, and the police are working on this, and I'm cooperating with them fully. So do yourself a favor, young man. Get out of here. You do yourself the favor, and you get... You get all the way downtown to police headquarters, to the office of Detective Lieutenant Louis Parker, cop, gentleman, and good friend. Hiya, Peter Piper. Afternoon, Lieutenant. Oh, oh, I detect a real sweet note in your voice. (laughs) Okay, what... Client is paying you how much for you to find out from us what he could have found out for himself. Huh? Uh, you know the usual cry of the private eye. It's confidential. <laughs> All right, young fellow. What are you working on? I'm working on that shooting last night at the Cafe Tropical. Did you uh, trace the murder gun yet? No, but we're working on it. Real interesting case, Pete. Hmm? How so? Know the details? I know he was shot from the main room all the way out to the bar while the drum guy was working. The dame with the lightning was dancing. Yeah. One bullet, one shot. It finished him. You know anything about trajectory, Pete? An angle of entrance? Hey, 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 them's fancy words. Uh, I got them from my science, boys. Trajectory tells you about the flight of a bullet. Angle of entrance tells you from what direction the bullet came. And my science boys measured it perfectly. It eliminated everybody in that main room except a group around one table. And what table was that? The one Bruce Eldridge was at. There's no question the bullet came from that room, from that table. No powder marks on the body... Distance estimated, trajectory, angle of entrance, perfect, everything. Well, all you had around that table were Bruce Eldridge, Claire Maxwell, Charles Morse, and Ruth Benson. Mm -hmm. And one of those is eliminated. Which one? Ruth Benson. She left the room while Maxwell was still alive, went upstairs, powder room. Well, does she know that she's eliminated yet? No, no, Pete. I like to keep them all guessing, you know. Uh, Claire Maxwell, the wife, Charles Morse, a book critic, and Bruce Eldridge's partner. Well, it certainly narrows them down. To what? The wife? Why should she? She's married to a rich man. She's sitting pretty. The book critic? Why should he? If he were the murderer, would he plant the murder gun in his own pocket? The partner? Why should he? Paul Maxwell is the brains of Cafe Tropical, and the operation is making money. Well, how about prints on the gun? Yeah, smudges. Look, Louis, uh-huh. I might... Yeah, there's a request for a favor coming up. Huh? <sighs> well, two things. One, I'm going up to interview Ruth Benson. Can I, uh... Tell her that you've eliminated her as a suspect? Well, it'll make a real big Sherlock out of me, and it'll make for her cooperation. Yeah. Well, you talk me into it, Pete. <laughs> I have to break it to all of them sooner or later. What is the uh, second favor? Well, the addresses of the interested parties. Oh, it's an easy one for a change. So, armed with addresses and an affectionate pat on the back from Parker... You're riding your white horse again, and you're at Ruth Benson's neatly furnished apartment. I'd be glad to cooperate, Mr. Chambers. Please make yourself comfortable. A brunette with glistening black hair and glistening black eyes, and more curves than the Indiana Raceway. You give her Parker's dope about her being eliminated as a suspect, and you get what you want. Cooperation. Anything, Mr. Chambers. Anything at all. Well, uh, well... Well, first, uh, Bruce Eldridge. He used to own a gun once. That's a joke. I know about that gun. Would you break that down for me a little? Well, about two weeks ago, I was at his place. Bruce writes beautiful music, and I'm a singer, you know. And yeah, I understand. We were out on the terrace, and he brought out that gun of his, and by accident, went off. <laughs> and guess what? I give up. He fainted dead away. Guy's got a phobia. As a matter of fact, when Paul Maxwell found out I'd been at Bruce's apartment, he raised the roof. And what did he raise the roof about? Oh, well, Paul and I, we, um, sort of had a thing going. Uh-huh. And Paul and Bruce, uh, was this, um, thing what they argued about? Mm-hmm. But it's ridiculous. 
Bruce was perfectly innocent of any wrong intention. Of course. Well, Miss Benson, thank you very kindly. Not at all, Mr. Chambers. Next stop, the book-lined retreat of Charles Morse in Greenwich Village. I uh, welcome this visitor. I've always been keenly interested in the myriad and varied operations of the private investigator. Charles Morse. Tall, slender, great-templed, and distinguished. He's sipping brandy from an oversized snifter glass. A drink, perhaps, Mr. Chambers? No, 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 thank you. Well, shall we get on, then? Uh, Mr. Morse, are you a... Uh... Frequent customer at the Café Tropical? Frequent and uh, regular. An ardent patron, shall we say. Good. A man of your intelligence, it's a help. Hmm. How come you're so good a patron uh, of a saloon? Well, sir, it's difficult to put it into words, but I'll certainly try. Well, that's real sporting of you, sir. <laughs> Are you perhaps chiding me? No, 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 I ain't doing a thing except fishnetting for facts. Hmm. Well, about my being a patron of saloons, let me see now. A good many of us, you see, in my profession, uh, book critics, are frustrated writers, and I'll admit to being one of those. Our creative abilities just do not measure up to our desires. So, I'm a rather heavy drinker, and in consequence, an excellent customer of watering spots like Café Tropical. <laughs> good enough, good enough. Mm. Do you know anything of a scrap between Paul and Bruce Eldridge? No, no, I do not. All right, then, Mr. Morris, uh... Thanks for the use of the hall. Well, it was most stimulating, Mr. Chambers. I'm uh, at the cafe almost every night, you know, so if you have any further need of my assistance in any way at all, please uh, don't hesitate. So that night you're back at Cafe Tropical and the joint is jumping like they're featuring a strip dancer and handing out binoculars for free. You're greeted by Bruce Eldridge. Evening, Mr. Chambers. Hey, wow. Oh, nothing like a murder to drum up business. Uh, quite macabre tonight, aren't you, Mr. Chambers? Macabre. Everybody in this cast of characters makes with the big words. You, that Charlie Morris. You mind if I go in a bar and mix with a hoi polloi like Toby Tobias? Don't mind in the least, Mr. Chambers. Oh, hiya, Shamus. How's the Shamus business? Eh. How's with the bartending business? Ah, uh, it stinks, too. But if I play my cards right, I'm getting out of it. Well, uh, before we go any further in this colloquy, uh, point of order. Yeah? Scotch and soda. <laughs> Coming at you, Mr. Chambers. And now, what's with your imminent retirement? Uh, listen hard, Mr. Chambers. Because either I make it, or you make it. Look, Tobias, it's a little late for riddles. This is a moment of relaxation for me. It's uh, about this here case you're working on. Oh, well, well. Talk it up, Tobias, my lad. Now, if I spill the dope I got, this whole case becomes a hanger for you. So spill. Now, I ain't spilling yet, but I got a hunch I know just what this thing is all about. Now, that kind of information is good for a little uh, payola from a certain party. Enough payola for me to retire. So tonight... I make me play. I'm off tonight at 11. And then I make me little old play. If your little old play backfires... Then I'm calling on you at home. On the phone. And with the info I got for you, you're going to turn out to be a big hero. Mm. How much are you asking for, Toby? 10,000 smackers. Hey, hey. And the party's getting off cheap. Uh, excuse me for now, Mr. Chambers. I got to go to work. And don't forget to be home come 11 o'clock. <laughs> The crowd keeps pouring in like it's bargain day at Macy's, and the confusion mounts. And you like it, because right now you can use confusion. It gives you a chance to slip off your bar stool and slip up the stairs. The door to Clam Maxwell's room isn't locked. And inside you do a rapid search. And out of a dresser drawer, you come up with an interesting item. An expensive, heavy gold medal. On one side, there's an engraving of crossed pistols, and beneath that... The initials C.M. C.M. Claire Maxwell. The reverse side says Westchester Target Club competition, first prize, June 15th, 1953. You slip the medal in your pocket and you're ready for a further gander when... What's going on here? Claire Maxwell. Indignation in her eyes and much worse. An automatic in her hand. Big. Black. Deadly. Are you looking for something, Mr. Chambers? Nothing special, Mrs. Maxwell. Then get out of here quickly, please. I'm not finished yet, Mrs. You're Maxwell. You're finished or you will be. 
Look, I got a right to shoot. You're a trespasser here. Now, don't come a step nearer or I'll shoot. I'll, I'll... Now, I've got the gun and you've got nothing but, uh, let's say, a guilty conscience. Because you meant to shoot. Get out! Get out! A little lesson first, Mrs. Maxwell. Right here, see? You see? This is a safety catch. The gun don't go off unless the safety catch is unhooked. That's for next time. Now, for now, I take the clip out, throw your gun back to you like so, and I say, bye now. You go home, but you don't go to bed. You linger over a cup of coffee like a guy in a cafeteria killing time for a dime. Then at 11.15... Hello? Now, Mr. Chambers. Yeah? Toby, Toby. Now, look, oh. the party give me a belly ache, so now I give the party a belly ache. Where are you at, the Tropical? No, no. I'm in a little broken-down saloon on 3rd Avenue and 56th. I want you to meet me here right away. Oh, what happened to your retirement plans, Toby? I ain't going to retire, but the party is. The party is going to retire for good. But... Now, come on down here, Mr. Chambers, and listen to Toby make like a canary. The name of this joint... Hello. Toby. Toby! You get to 56th and 3rd fast, but not fast enough because the cops are there already. And the boss man is Louis Parker. You set him up on the facts. And it's directly connected with the other thing, right? I uh, couldn't be right, Louis. Any idea who that certain party was? No idea at all. Any witnesses this shooting? No, nothing. Now, look, Pete, it's late. No use you knocking yourself out on this one. Go home, go to sleep. We'll be in touch. Uh, I think you're right, Louis. Oh, uh, by the way, you traced that gun yet? Gun? What gun? You know, the gun in the other shooting, the uh, Paul Maxwell deal. But what's with guns? What's your interest? Nothing, nothing. Just ask. Look, stop bothering me with guns now. Huh? I, I got work to do. Good night, detective. So you're still at sea about Bruce Eldridge's gun. And that, after all, is your real interest. That's what you're going to be paid $500 for. Anyway, you go to sleep, sleep like a log. And the next afternoon, you're at the Westchester Target Club, asking questions and getting answers. You're back in Manhattan now and ready for the wrap-up. You put in a call of Parker, and comes nighttime, you're a saloon-goer again. Cafe Tropical. Any uh, news for me, Mr. Chambers? Sir Eldridge, could we uh, talk somewhere alone? Sure, come on upstairs. Mm. Charlie Moss show up yet? Expect him practically any moment. Do you, you want to talk to him, too? Don't mind if I do. All right, I'll leave word down here for him. All right, then, Mr. Chambers. Mr. Eldridge, why didn't you tell me there was bad blood between you and Mr. Maxwell? Well, I wouldn't. Over Ruth Benson. Good. Well, because I don't believe in washing dirty linen in public. Now, look, Mr. Chambers, I didn't kill Paul Maxwell. Well, I was told you people wanted to speak with Mr. me. Mr. Chambers, I said I didn't kill Paul Maxwell. I know that. I'm not accusing you. But I am, I... however, accusing I... him. What? Charles Morris? I'm accusing him of the murder of Paul Maxwell and Toby Tobias. Have you gone out of your mind, Chambers? Now, listen, my dear cultured book critic. You see this medal? See it? Which I found in Mrs. Maxwell's room? Well, that set me on the right track. The medal? The metal? initials on it are CM. I thought it was Claire Maxwell... But this afternoon, I learned at the Westchester Target Club that CM was for Charles Morse. And on the strength of that, you're accusing me... Only one of three people could have killed Paul Maxwell. Yes, that's right. The police have already informed us of that. Bruce Eldridge, no soap, a gun phobia. Claire Maxwell, no soap, because she pulled a gun on me yesterday. And she didn't even know how to flip the safety catch. Plus, our murderer had to be a crack shot. He killed Paul with one bullet. That, my good friend, leaves that us... That is all, Mr. Chambers. My compliments. Notice, please, I'm holding a gun. And as you know now, it's in the most competent of hands. Mm. And as long as you've got the drop on us, friend, you may as well complete the story just to satisfy our curiosity. No, but I will finish it to exonerate Claire Maxwell. She had nothing to do with Paul's murder. She had your medal, pal, and a rather expensive one. I loved her, and she loved me. We asked Paul, we begged Paul for a divorce, but he wouldn't accede, so... 
I figured out the next best way. I went to Baez with the big eyes, added two and two together, and tried blackmail. I was then compelled to dispose of Tobias, too. Hmm. And now, what kind of chance do you think you have now? I don't know, but I'll find out. I intend to make a run for it. So, I back to the door. And remember, gentlemen... Okay, okay Charlie, drop the gun! <laughs> Charles Morse may have won a medal, but Parker has won many medals. Anyway, in the exchange of gunfire, Morse winds up with a leaking shoulder, and Parker winds up with a wide smile. And the next day, seated in your office, you thank Louis Parker for his nick of time heroics, and you're back to your favorite subject. Louis, just for kicks, was that original gun traced yet? No, and I got it right here. My bet is he bought it in the hot shop. Hey, you see, every possible mark of identification has been filed off. Nobody can actually trace that. Oh, I don't know. I don't know. Some people have an intuitive sense. Some people can tell just by looking at things. Oh, meaning you. Huh? That's precisely what I mean, Lieutenant. <laughs> Look, Detective, if you can tell me where this gun came from, I'll donate $500 to the Damon Runyon Fund. Fair enough. But if you don't, you donate. Hmm? That's a deal. Now, look, Louie, I got big fat news for you. I couldn't tell you before, but that gun hasn't... Mr. Chambers. Mr. Chambers, I found my gun. You what? Yes, it had fallen behind some books on the shelf, you... and my maid in cleaning... Hey, what's this all about? Yeah, but nevertheless, Mr. Chambers, I owe you $500, and I want to write my check for it this very moment. Yeah, yeah, you write your check and make it out to the Damon Runyon Fund. Oh? And... Give it to the lieutenant here. Oh, well, now, that's very charitable of you, Mr. Chambers. Very charitable indeed. And there you've had crime and Peter Chambers. Dane Clark was starred as Peter Chambers. Crime and Peter Chambers was created and written by Henry Kane. Others in the cast were Bill Zuckert, heard as Lieutenant Parker, and Petoniak as Claire, Ed Peck as Charles, and Nelson Olmstead as Bruce. It was directed by Fred Way. This is Fred Collins inviting you to tune in next week, same time, same station, for Dane Clark in Crime and Peter Chambers. Crime and Peter Chambers has come to you through the worldwide facilities of the United States Armed Forces Radio and Television Service.
Crime and Peter Chambers. Created by Henry Kane, transcribed and starring Dane Clark. Private investigator, duly licensed and duly sworn, Peter Chambers. You're a private eye. That's your business. Anything else? That's for laughs. It's mid-afternoon of a wonderful summer's day, and you're seated on a bench in Central Park, drinking in the sunshine. As a private eye, you're notorious for drinking much more stimulating intoxicants than sunshine. But you don't figure to be fired out of the Union because there is a lush and beautiful blonde seated beside you. Her name is Bubbles Greco, and she owns, operates, and performs in a spot on 52nd Street called the Bubbles Club. Ah, Bubbles Greco. Ah, the air, the sun, the sky, the green trees. Mm. Oh, it takes a night worker to appreciate all this. <laughs> yeah, you and me both. Oh, don't you love it? Sweetie, as long as I'm near you, I love it. I love anything. No, no kidding, Pete. This... This night work, dancing in a club all the time, sort of gets you down. Well, it's a mood, sweetie. It'll pass. There's too much sunshine. You're just not used to it. Don't rib me. Oh, I wish I could. No glamour, that's it. Just work, work, work. Hey, you really got a bad this afternoon, haven't you? Bubbles Greco, probably one of the ten most glamorous women in the country. Great dancer, owns her own nightclub, independently wealthy. And she complains? What would you like to trade it all in for? You want the truth? Oh, what else, my lovely Bubbles? I'd like to be a private detective. What? <laughs> you switching the rib on me? No, no, it's the truth. I... I think you guys have got the best racket in the world. Always excitement, always activity, no boss to answer to. Action all the time. And when you feel like it, you just knock off and loaf. You know, I think you're serious. You're crazy, but I think you're serious. Honey, if you had just one case, if you experienced just one case... You'll be cured. Yeah? You want to bet? I'd love to bet. Good. You're the sporting type. Let's bet your fee against six months of free drinks in my plush saloon. Well, you talked yourself into a wager, except for one great big catch. Such as? What fee? Meaning? What fee? For what case? Beautiful as you are, irresistible as you are, you think I'd be sitting here actually letting the grass grow under my feet if I had a case? There is no case. There is no fee. Hence, there is no subject matter for our hypothetical wager. That's what you think. Huh? Do I, uh, detect a prospective client in the offing? You detect pretty good, detective. But there's one condition. Name it. Well, as part of our wager, since I'm to learn by experience, you got to keep me on the ball with this thing every minute of the time. i got to know from the beginning to the end. Sold. Now, who's the pigeon? Aristotle Skanos. Aristotle which? Aristotle Skanos, the Greek gentleman. He's only been in this country about four days. How do you know him? Well, I'm Greek, Pete, of Greek extraction. Anyway, this guy comes into the club, a very aristocratic gentleman. Comes in for a little relaxation, and we get to gabbing, and what do you know? He can use a private eye. For what? <sighs> Search me. I mentioned your name, and I know he's been checking on it. Anyway, you've got a date with him for tonight. Bubbles Club at midnight. And don't forget our wager. So it goes. Bubble dancer or senator's lady, you never know where a client drops from. Let's face it, you're in a business that's as screwy as a $3 bill. Anyway, at midnight, you're at the Bubbles Club and you're ushered down to a choice table and a tall guy gets up. You are Peter Chambers? Mm-hmm. And uh, you're Aristotle? Aristotle Scanus. Please sit down, Mr. Chambers. Tall and distinguished, Mr. Aristotle Scanos. Great temples, Van Dyke beard, and eyes as black as a smuggler's conscience. I'm drinking champagne, Mr. Chambers. What is yours? Who am I to refuse uh, champagne, Mr. Scanos, especially when it's a prelude to business? <laughs> You're quite charming, Mr. Chambers, exactly as I had heard. Well, that's a new type of recommendation for private eye. Charm. Well, to your health, Mrs. Scarnos. Champagne bubbles, bubbles club, bubbles Greco. Let's hope it's a profitable round robin. 
profitable for both of us. Mm. Mm, very good. I uh, hear you're in need of uh, assistance, shall we say? I'm in need of a good private detective. So you came to the Bubbles Club for a recommendation? I have found in Miss Greco wit, intelligence, and a clear, sharp mind. If that's all you found in Miss Greco, brother, maybe you ought to take another look. <laughs> no. But uh, seriously, the matter of a private detective came up as sort of a coincidence. Miss Greco and I were chatting in Greek. Were you aware Miss Greco is quite proficient in Greek? I'm uh, sure she's quite proficient in Greek. Well, anyway, your name came up, and answering to an impulse, I checked up on it very thoroughly. And you learned? That you are exactly the man I want. Clever, resourceful, sophisticated, and most of all, trustworthy. Well, thank you, Dad. Pardon? <laughs> nothing, nothing. Okay, okay, I'm a real big hunk of stuff. Clever, resourceful, and sophisticated. So where do we go from here? Mr. Sanders, I want you to come to my hotel. It's Stanley on Park Avenue. It is suite 704. The bill here is paid. I will leave now. I want you to join me in 20 minutes. There is something first that I want to procure from the hotel scene. Well, you're the boss. 20 minutes then. Goodbye. Oh, uh, by the way... Yes? What do you do? Pardon? Your business. I? I am a private detective. So he throws you that haymaker and then he leaves. To be substituted by Bubbles Greco, who pats a cool hand at your cheek and sits down. How are we doing, partner? Hey, do you know what that guy does for a living? Give up. He's a private detective. <laughs> yeah, I know. I don't like that, a Greek private eye. Do well, you think it's a monopoly? They got them in Europe, plenty of them. Go by all kinds of names. Private operative, confidential agent, assassin, soldier of fortune. Uh, sweetie. Hmm? About our wager, can't we, uh... Make it something more interesting than free drinks in a saloon. <laughs> well, you know, you're cute. <laughs> Maybe we'll talk about that sometime. But you don't talk about it now. Now you've got a date with a Greek private eye at the Stanley on Park Avenue, Suite 704. Who is it? Chambers. Peter Chambers. Come in. Come in, sir. Thank you. Mr. Scanos is holding an item that's got more flash than a tout's bankroll at the racetrack. It looks like a crown that a queen would wear, diamond encrusted and glowing with gold. Only it's half a crown. Beautiful, isn't it? Oh, that's an understatement, Mr. Scanos. You know what it is? Hey, let me hold it. Let me look. Huh? Sure. Oh, boy, that's really something. Do you know what it is? Well, it... Looks like half of a crown for a queen's head. Or a crown for a queen with a half a head. Here, you better take it. It is a tiara, Mr. Chambers. Half a tiara. Uh -huh. A priceless treasure fashioned in 1550 by Benvenuto Cellini, especially for Eleonora, princess of the House of Medici. It last rested in total, not half, but in total, in the Bargello, famous museum of old Florence. Well, thanks for the history lesson, pal, but what are you doing with it, or should I say half of it? The other half, Mr. Chambers, is here in America. Both halves together. This tiara from a proper collector could bring half a million dollars. Separately, each half has but intrinsic value, perhaps $50,000. It is part of my purpose and your purpose to bring both halves together. To the tune of half a million bucks, huh? Precisely, Mr. Chambers. Okay, my dear Aristotle Scanos, now let's have the pitch. It's... The pitch, the, the story on this. The story? Oh, yes, Mr. Chambers. Please, have a seat. Thank you. First, about the tiara. During the time of Mussolini, a good many of the Italian museums were looted of their treasures, and the Bargello in Florence was one of them. This tiara was taken. After Mussolini's death, it passed through many hands. I won't bore you with all of that. But finally... It came into the possession of a countryman of mine, a Greek gentleman by name of George Demetrius. George Demetrius. Uh, tell me, uh, did he come into possession of this thing, of uh, this tiara, in Greece or in Italy? In Italy. Uh -huh. George Demetrius was in Italy as a sort of quasi-political representative. He had a lady friend with whom he was very much in love. Oh. She was coming to America. 
that is when this theater was divided into. Uh, easy, easy. Do it easy now, Mr. Scarnos. It's beginning to sound a little complicated. Not complicated at all. Money is in America. A fortune could be realized for a tiara in this country. George loved his lady fair. What was her name? Anna Marina. But he did not love her enough to entrust it all to her. He sawed the tiara in half, gave her half, and retained half. And planned to join her in America as soon as he could get free from his political entanglement. And where do you fit into this, Mrs. Connors? <laughs> right about here, sir. Anna Marina did not go directly to America. She stopped off in Paris, which is where I make my office. And there she retained me. For what? Well, this may sound a little brutal to you, but... Uh, come on, come on, let's have it, Mrs. Connors. She wanted me to kill George Demetrius and obtain the other half of the tiara. Oh, that's a real sweet dame. And uh, what were you supposed to get out of that? Fifty percent of what we would realize by selling the whole tiara. Or wouldn't a boyfriend have given that to her? He might have. Might not. After all, the tiara by right of possession was his. She had no claim. Mm. So this way, she's sure of half, plus she's rid of a used-up boyfriend. I could not have put it better myself, sir. Oh, yeah. So, uh, just uh, casual-like, did you uh, kill this guy? No. No, but I did get to him finally, and I did get possession of his half of the tiara. Hmm. Okay, I don't have to look into a crystal ball to figure out that you want me to find this Anna Marina for you, but how come you can't find her yourself? Well, first, this is not my country. Of course, I do not know quite how to operate here. Second, for reasons I will not bore you with, I am a year and a half late coming to this country. I see. Well, Anna was supposed to be living at the ambassador. Did you check the ambassador? Yes. She did live there almost two years ago. Lived there for three months, then vanished without a trace. I did all the usual checks, and now you. And, uh, if I may be so bold, what's in it for me? Well, sir, upon the sale of the full tiara, half would belong to me, which should be around figure about $250,000. 10% of that would be your fee. Hmm. Okay, Aristotle, you've hired yourself a boy. You go home and you go to sleep, and you have nightmares about foreign assassins and slinky lady spies and daggers and tiaras and poison in a vegetable soup. But the next morning, you're out in the sunshine again with Bubbles Greco, and as per promise, you bring her up to date. Oh, it's so exciting. You can just bust. And what's the next step? Cherche, as the boys in the pool room say, la femme. Yeah, but how? Did you ever hear of Perry Quimby? You mean that fancy jewelry store on Madison? Well, that's the front. What's the back? Quimby's the top fence in this country. There ain't been a hot huck of jewelry of real value that hasn't passed through good old Quimby. Now, that dame's been here practically two years with her half a tiara. She must have wanted some wood on it. And so you're going to see Perry Quimby. When? Right now. Hey, as a matter of fact, I'm late for my appointment already. Bye, Bubbles. Good luck, honey. Perry Quimby, smooth, suave, delicate, well-mannered, but a guy with more contours than a pretzel. You get ushered through the glittering shop to a back room that's fitted up like a hideaway for a sultan. Ah, the good Mr. Chambers, please come to the point quickly, sir. Perry Quimby is an extraordinarily busy man. Perry Quimby, round blue eyes like an innocent baby. Perry Quimby, about as innocent as a wrought-up rattlesnake. All right, Mr. Chambers, you said it was important. You, uh, in the market for half a tiara? I don't know what you're talking about. Hmm. Did you ever hear of a dame named Anna Marina? I still don't know what you're talking about. Okay, Mr. Quimby, let's you and me get into a huddle and I'll throw some signals at you. You ready? Mm Mm-hmm. Tiara, Benvenuto Cellini, Eleonora, House of Medici, the Bargello, famous museum in ancient Florence. That's about it, Mr. Quimby. Now, do we talk about that or about the New York Giants and my special boy, Willie Mays? We talk about a tiara. Well, glad to have you aboard, Mr. Quimby. Have you, by some freak of chance, located the other half of that masterpiece? Let's first get your half on the record. Well, I've seen it, and I've advised against its sale. Half, it can bring perhaps thirty, forty thousand 40,000. Whole, intact. That's different. It's an item of rarest value. I have a standing offer from the collector, $600,000. If you can produce that other half, Peter, my lad, 
We can both earn a handsome commission. I can produce, but I produce my way. And what would be your way, my boy? I want to get to that lady. Mm. After all, this is her affair, not yours. Mm. Now, what are you worried about, Quimby? Any deal that's made, it's got to be made through you. Reasonable, logical, and incontrovertible. I'm a man of quick decision, Mr. Chambers. Anna Marina is now known as Alicia Maritza. She owns a bookshop in Greenwich Village. So you're doing the scooter again. Down to Greenwich Village to the address Quimby gave you, and you meet Alicia Maritza. Or Anna Marina, or whatever her real name is. Turns out to be a sultry dame with a hefty figure and a seductive look. You state your business, and she leaves the shop in charge of another and takes you to her apartment just above her shop. And there she calls Perry Quimby, and he must have given you a perfect write-up because she comes back glowing. Mr. Chambers, I believe we are in business. Good, Miss Marissa. Mr. Quimby tells me I can trust you implicitly. Therefore, I shall deal directly with you. You can tell that to Aristotle Scanos. I shall have no reason to see him. You will be the complete intermediary. Scanos won't complain. All he's interested in is his half of the proceeds. And he shall receive every penny of that. The plan, then, is this. I go to my bank vault right now, obtain my half of the tiara and return here. You go to Scanos, obtain your half and also return here. Then together we go to Mr. Quimby and the first step of the transaction shall be completed. Good enough. Then go, Mr. Chambers. Time is of the essence. You hitch up your scooter and you're flying again. From Scano's hotel suite and with Scano's lending an ear, you call Perry Quimby just to keep everything kosher. And it checks perfectly. Quimby's waiting and the lady's on the level. Scano's wraps the tiara for you and you're off again down to Greenwich Village. And the lady practically drools as she caresses both halves of the tiara like they're a couple of newborn twins. Ah. Uh... Oh, it is like a miracle. The tiara de Medici, the tiara of Cellini. Is it not beautiful, Mr. Chambers? Is it not a work of art? Yeah, but 600,000 bucks, I wouldn't pay for it. Oh, would that I could afford to keep it. But I cannot. Quimby's waiting, Miss Merkson. Oh, yes, we must go. I suppose the money will be on hand within a few days. Mr. Quimby is most meticulous that way. Quimby's as good as a bank. Plus, he earns his commission two ways, from the purchaser and the seller. Who can object? And we shall arrange that 50% of the proceeds go to you as representative of Aristotle Scanos. I want to be meticulously honest in this transaction. Oh, you betcha. Yes. Yes, who is it? Scanos. Aristotle Scanos. Aristotle Scanos. After all, he's your client. You don't let him cool his heels outside. You open the door. And there he stands... And surprise, surprise, he's got a fistful of Luger in his right hand and he's pointing it, business end forward. He moves in and slams the door shut. Oh. I am welcome, my trust. Miss Maritza, you know Mrs. Scanos. That, that is not Aristotle Scanos. Not Scanos? Are you kidding? He's the guy that hired me, the guy that gave me the second half of the tiara. My name, Mr. Chambers, is George Demetrius. George Demetrius. You mean... that guy? You, you mean you too? Yes, we too. This lady, the light of my life, turned out to be, as you say here in your country, a filthy double-crosser. But what you told me about this... Uh, Scanos, he... Most he... of what I told you was true. She hired him to assassinate me and to steal what was mine. No, no, please, please, George. He tried, but he failed. The tables were turned. I killed him in self-defense. But before he died, he told me all. Told me all. Then I took his credentials, but I could not leave Italy, not for a long, long time. But finally, I am here. And as Aristotle Scanos, I sought my lady love. And now... Now I have found her. George, George, please, please, George. What are you going to do? George! I shall do to you what you wanted to do to me. Now, look, just I a minute. I shall kill you, I... my lady fair, and then I shall take what is mine and return to my country. There is a plane leaving tonight. I'm prepared to take now, it. Now, just a minute, Mr. Scanos, or Mr. Demetrius, or whatever your name is. Mr. Chambers, look, I... you have been most kind and most efficient. 
For the time being, I shall have to bind you and gag you and keep you here so that I may leave this country. That is, after I have attended to my lady fair. But someday when the tiara is sold, you, Mr. Chambers, shall receive your full and just commission. That's real sporting of you, pal. But at the moment... A dame like that is probably entitled to every bullet in the Luger. But the Boy Scout and you just can't let it happen. So you throw a body block out. Down you both go. And the Luger is the most important item in the scrap. He, he uses it before you can get to it. Oh, oh, and wings you. But then you do get to the gun. And you club him. Senseless. <laughs> And you've got Skanos on the floor, or uh, is it Demetrius? And you're pointing the gun at Miss Maritza, or is it Miss Marina? And you drag yourself to the phone, and pretty soon the place is flooded with cops. And then you're home, with the slug out of your shoulder and a bandage around it, but Bubbles Greco is making like a nurse, and that sort of evens it up. You bring her up to date on current history. Oh, it's all so exciting, so exciting. Yeah, well, let me give you the final deal on it. Demetrius is getting deported to be tried for the murder of Skanos. And Miss Marina is getting deported to be tried for hiring Skanos to murder Demetrius. Uh, <laughs> it gets a little mixed up, doesn't it? Well, and that tiara? Well, that goes back to the museum in Florence. Well, where does that leave you? Well, with a slug in my shoulder and no fee. And right now, I'm willing to trade in that six months of free drinks for, um, well, let us say, a bit of special attention for my gorgeous nurse. Something like this? Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, it's a pretty good sample. Tell me, Bubbles, do you still want to be a private eye? <laughs> no, sir. <laughs> From here on in, Bubbles sticks to bubbles. Oh, yes. And so do I. And there you've had crime and Peter Chambers. Dane Clark was starred as Peter Chambers. Crime and Peter Chambers was created and written by Henry Kane. Others in the cast were Roger DeCoven, heard as Skanos, and Bryna Rayburn as Bubbles. It was directed by Fred Way. This is Fred Collins inviting you to tune in next week, same time, same station, for Dane Clark in Crime and Peter Chambers. This is the United States Armed Forces Radio and Television Service.
Crime and Peter Chambers. Created by Henry Kane, transcribed and starring Dane Clark. Private investigator, duly licensed and duly sworn, Peter Chambers. You're a private eye. That's your business. Anything else, that's for laughs. No laughs now because you're working on a case, and the case happens to involve a little matter of murder. And there ain't no laughs in murder, despite the Broadway playwrights and arsenic and old lace. There just ain't no laughs in murder no how. Your client is an insurance company that stands to lose 300,000 solid simoleons, and you're down at headquarters at the office of a good friend by name of Detective Lieutenant Louis Parker. Frank Reed, wealthy manufacturer of dolls, senior partner in the firm of Reed and Carson, dead by reason of an infusion of bullets in the office of his factory on 23rd Street. Happened last night at 10 o'clock. Now, what's your interest, Peter Pan? I've been hired by the insurance company, Louis. Huh? What insurance company? Samson Indemnity. Insured Frank Reed for 150000 Double indemnity, which is 300000 in case of accidental death. Frank Reed's brother is beneficiary under that policy. Correct. Gent by name, John Reed. Mm, quite a guy, this John Reed. Poet, dreamer, highly sophisticated hunk of nothing. Look, Louis, this guy stands to pick up 300,000 big ones. Frank took out that policy only four days ago, paid one premium. The company's going to get stuck, and get stuck heavy. Exactly why have you been hired, Pete? Well, overall, to help solve this murder. But if it turns out that John Reed knocked off his brother, the company saves 300,000 bucks. So they hire a private eye. Well, sort of an investment. Mm. All right, what do you want to know? Uh-huh. To coin a phrase, the facts, pal, the facts. <laughs> yeah. <clears throat> See, now, the doll factory's on 23rd. Office on the ground floor. Windows face out to an alley. Mm. Now, Frank Reed had an appointment with his partner for 10 o'clock yesterday evening. Private business conference. Windows were open, hot night. Partner gets there and she finds him... She? Did, did you say she? Oh, ho, ho. Sonny, where did you get to that? She, and a gorgeous one. Viola Carson, young, beautiful, skillful designer. Junior partner. Boy, is she... I'm, okay, I'm... okay. So she gets there. Yeah. <clears throat> when she gets there, according to her, the play shows signs of a terrific struggle. Frank Reed's on the floor, three bullets in him. That's her story. It's all we got is her story. Mm. Anything else? Yeah, the guy's dying. She revives him. He comes to for maybe a minute. He tells her, according to her, that someone came in through that office window, conked him from behind. That he tried to fight him off, and then the bullets came. See, he tried to write a note after his assailant left. Then this Frank Reed dies in her arms, and clutched in his hand is a note. You got the note? Yeah, right here. Yeah, take a look. Let's see, uh, the cuff link is. That's the entire note. The cuff link is. Yeah, that's right. The cuff link is. Notice the uh, scrawl at the end there. His uh, strength gave out. He was trying to tell us something, but Lord knows what. Was he wearing cuff links? Yeah, he was. Any connection? None that we can figure out. Petey, why don't you go down there and look over, as they say, the scene of the crime? factory's closed, but the office is open, and that gorgeous partner of his is there. Well, you talked me into it, pal. <laughs> I'll join you there a little later. Well, oh, uh, by the way, Louis, any special suspects? Well, uh, if it wasn't some kind of ordinary holdup, the only ones with any interest is John Reed, this partner, Viola Carson, and then there's John Reed's wife, Linda. Mm -hmm. Oh, and a guy she's kind of stuck on, a dancer by the name of uh, Salvatore Cortez. Here, let me rustle up some of the details for you. You see, this John Reed is married to a haughty, kind of high type of thing. Twenty minutes later, you're in the ground floor office of a couple of doll manufacturers, Reed and Carson. The alley windows are open, but there's hardly a breath of air coming in. 
The walls are lined with shelves holding hundreds of dolls. All the same, the one type of doll they manufacture. There's a large desk, and that's cluttered with many papers, and on that, there's a doll, too. A sample of the one on the shelves. But seated at the desk is a real doll. She's wearing a man-tailored suit, but man-tailoring or no, this one's all woman. Blonde, blue-eyed, with soft, rose-petal lips. She stands up, and the figure she displays adds a sparkling new interest to the matter at hand. Yes? What is it, please? Are you, uh, Viola Carson? Yes, I'm Miss Carson. Miss Carson. That doesn't hurt either. You tell her who you are and why you're here, and she smiles and dimples and cooperates splendidly in the question and answer routine. She corroborates most of the facts that Lieutenant Parker gave you. And that's about all I know, Mr. Chambers. Did you read that note that he had in his hand? Yes, I did. The cufflink is, and then a scrawl. He just couldn't complete it. Any ideas on that? No, sir. None. I uh, noticed that with that lovely blouse of yours that you wear cufflinks, too. Yes, at the moment, I'm wearing cufflinks. Ah. Now, you say you were to have a business conference with Frank Reed for 10 o'clock last night. Isn't that an unusual hour for business conferences? Well, um, Mr. Chambers... I wish you'd call me Pete. Why? Well, people I like, I like them to call me Pete. And I, uh, like you, Viola. Quick like that? That's me, quick as a bunny. Well, and we have the same natures. I'm rather precipitate in my likes and dislikes, too. Mm. Well, how do you, uh... Precipitate with me. I like you. Well, then, before we start talking about cocktails and candlelight, let's uh, get back to the detective and suspect routine. Shall we, Viola? It's your party, Peter. <laughs> now, about that unusual hour for a business conference. Oh, there's nothing unusual about that. We frequently had conferences at that hour. I see, I see. Do you know Frank's brother, this, uh, John Reed? I know him very well. What kind of a guy? Best I can express it. A character. You'd have to meet him to understand. You know his wife? Linda? Well, that's her name, I think. A spectacular brunette. Hmm? And one I hope will never call you Pete. Well, from what I hear, there's small chance. From what I hear, she's got a guy other than her husband, whom she loves to call by his first name. Salvatore Cortez. You know him, too? He's a flamenco dancer at the Bongo Club. Aside from being a terrific dancer, he's quite an inventive guy. It was he who originally gave Frank Reed the idea for this doll we make. This mama doll. Oh, you mean Frank stole it and this guy bears a grudge, oh, huh? Oh, no. He was well paid for his idea. There was no hard feeling between Frank Reed and Cortez. Well, how about hard feeling between John Reed and Cortez? None there, either. Well, from what I hear, this Cortez is real palsy wowsy with the guy's wife. Well, you simply have to meet John Reed to understand that. I intend to meet John Reed. Um, look, Mr. Chambers. Uh-uh. Uh, Peter. Uh-huh. I, uh, I have got to go now. You can pick this up with me any time you like. I'll be home most of this evening. My address is... I know your address. How? Uh, from the police. Oh, so... All right, then. Au revoir. You'd have loved to have gone with her, but you've got work. You mess around looking the place over. You take a doll off the wall shelf and you handle it. Ah, cute. Then you look the desk over and you pick up the doll on the desk. And suddenly it slips to the floor, and you stoop for it when... Somebody with a pea shooter in the alley, and the target is you. A look out of the alley window shows you that whoever it is is gone. Then the door opens. That sounded like gunshot. Well, it wasn't backfire, old bean. Pro or con? Meaning? Were you doing the shooting, or were you being shot at? Shot at. Why? I don't know. I don't know. Maybe I was getting too nosy. Well, I think I'm through here. Hey, Louie, look. Do you think I can sort of steal this little doll and take it home with me, the one here on the desk? What's with you and dolls? Well... Uh, this kind. I got a little attachment for this one. It slipped from my hands, and when I stooped for it, those shots came over my head. So this little one sort of uh, saved my life. Sure, sure. Anytime you need a carriage or maybe a tricycle or something, just call on old Louie. <laughs> Louis. 
So Papa takes his mama doll back to the apartment. And there you shower, clean up, and then you're off again on the usual routine pitch. Checking on all the principal characters. It's late when you finally get to John Reed's place, but they should be expecting you. You called and made an appointment. Good evening, Mr. Chambers. I'm Mrs. Linda Reed. Linda Reed. Tall, olive-skinned, and attractive. And she greets you with about as much enthusiasm as an Eskimo greets an ice cube in an igloo. She's wearing an off-the-shoulder evening gown tight to her figure. And she's got the kind of figure that a dress should be tight to. Mr. Reed is in his study, napping. Uh, I'll uh, fetch before him. you start fetching, uh, Mrs. Reed, a couple of questions, please. Well, I'm in rather a hurry. About Frank Reed, deceased. Was he married? Nobody's told me. He was a widower. Two children, both grown, both living in Paris. Did he have brothers and sisters? Only John, my husband. He was the only brother. Only other relative, in fact. Did they get along, John Reed and Brother Frank? Well, let me put it this way. Frank adored John, as witnessed the life insurance policy in his favor. On the other hand, John absolutely abhorred Frank. Abhorred? But why? Because my husband abhors anything or anyone who is dull. And he found Frank a stuffy bore. I see. Uh, Your husband is a poet of sorts, isn't he? Well, let us say, a writer. Do you sell many things? (laughs) John? Oh, no, nothing commercial about any of John Reed's work. Then uh, where's the wherewithal come from? Frank was always very kind. As I said, he adored John, actually admired his peculiarities. I'll fetch him now, if you please, Mr. Chambers. She goes down a corridor and disappears. And you move about, looking things over in the well-furnished room when... And you start going in the direction of the shots. When a tall, blonde man with sleepy blue eyes comes towards you. Are you uh, the alleged detective? Yes, yes, I suppose... Uh, Chambers, uh, isn't it? Yes, right. Now, look, what was that noise I imagine you'd serve a better purpose in there. My study. Gunplay, clues and whatnot. Think about that. Mrs. Reed! Mrs. Reed! Yes? Those shots, what were they? Somebody out there on the fire escape. Well, did you see who it was? No, and whoever it was is gone now. He ran down the fire escape. Oh, man or woman? I couldn't tell. I saw somebody, but I couldn't tell. Oh, that's too bad. Well, let's get out of the shooting gallery and go back out there and talk to your husband. Well, have you two apprehended the misguided soul who attempted my murder? What do you know about it, Mr. Reed? Uh, You are John Reed. Yes, I am, and I know nothing about it. I was just opening my eyes from a delicious dream. As far as I know, it could have been my dear wife attempting the assassination of her beloved husband. I wouldn't put it past her. Notoriously poor shot, though. Well, as long as we're all safe and sound, I'm a little late. Oh, yes, of course. Off you go, my dear Linda, and my best to Mr. Cortez. Good evening, then. That was Salvatore Cortez I was referring to. My wife is quite enamored of him. A highball, Mr. Chambers? No, thank you. Look, uh, don't our modern poets indulge themselves in the ancient emotion of jealousy, Mr. Reed? As they do, I suppose. And they do not. Speaking for myself, no jealousy. Though I should explain, of course, that my wife and I cordially uh, detest one another. I see. And now that the howling clatter of pistols has subsided, I do wish you'd state your business, Mr. Chambers. Well, sir, as you know, I represent the insurance company. Yes, and and they have some absurd idea that I murdered Frank in order to fall heir to $300,000. Well, sir, it's a pretty good idea at that. In time, I'm sure I'd have come around to thinking about it. But I didn't, that's final. Any idea who did? None, whatever. Any idea who just took pot shots at you? Same answer. I'll say this for you, you're amazingly unruffled. Well, I'm a fatalist, Mr. Chambers. My philosophy is that of the ancient Indians, predestination. To put it in modern and laconic terms, when my number is up, it is up. I'm always singularly free of worry. Okay, let's change the subject. Now, your wife... Ah, beautiful woman, isn't she? Yeah, well, I mean your wife and this uh, Salvatore Cortez. uh... Great dancer, that young man. Performs at the Bongo Club. That's where she went. No, no, no. What I mean is, uh, what do you... Mr. Chambers, your reaching and your attempt to be tactful. There's no reason for that. None whatever. If she's in love with him, just between you and me, I don't give one little toot in Hades. 
Now, if you please, a very good evening to you, sir. Next stop, the Bongo Club. From there, you phone to Viola Carson that you'll see her later. And then you lap up some scotch at the bar and you watch this Salvatore Cortez perform. The guy's dark, slender, and graceful, wrapped up in tight black pants and a white silk shirt and banging his heels against the floor like he's sending out Morse code messages. When he's through, he joins Linda at a secluded table, which turns out to be not so secluded because you sort of mosey over. Chambers, really, this oh, is too much. Oh, you are the Mr. Chambers, Mrs. Reed Hello, has been telling Lord me. Hello, Buster. For me, you don't have to make with that phony Spanish accent. But I do not understand. I will not have you speak oh, this way on. to me. Come off I... it, will you, pal? I've done a little back-checking. Your name is Sam Cortland. You were born in Brooklyn. Now, how do we get it, straight or phony? Okay, you get it straight, Mr. Sleuth. As straight is like this. Beat it. Sonny... Unless you talk nice, I'm going to yank you up by your little lily white shirt and maybe paste you up against that wall. What do you want? Just a little chatter. Don't let him intimidate you, Salvatore. The name is Sam. Didn't you hear me? I know what his name okay, is. Okay, what do you want? Answers to a couple of questions. Civil answers. All right, all right. Let's have them. You wear cufflinks? Sometimes I do, sometimes I don't. You wear cufflinks last night? Last night, I don't remember. I don't remember putting it in my diary. Oh, you're very funny. Next question. Where were you last night between 9.30 and 10? In my apartment. Can you prove that? I don't have to, pal. If it doesn't suit you, you prove I wasn't. You won't cooperate, huh? Words of one syllable? No. What am I wasting my time for? That's your time. It's my time that you're wasting what bothers me. You keep making with a crack, Sonny, and sooner or later, I'm going to rearrange that phony puss of yours. Now, please, Mr. Chambers. <laughs> You grab a cab to Viola Carson's place. And a cute little hideaway she's got. Terrace and stuff. Exactly the spot for cocktails and candlelight. And she's most gracious. Oh, won't you sit down, Peter? Is there anything new on Frank's death? Any clues? Any ideas? Well, there is something beating around the back of my head, but I can't put my finger on it. It's a funny case. Somebody running around taking pot shots at everybody, even me. Please, please sit down, Peter. All right. Ah, good. Wait, I'll take that doll off the chair. It's one of ours. That's it? What? Sweetheart, I think I've got it. Where's your phone? You call down to Parker and you ask him to round up the entire cast of characters and bring them to your apartment. And there, with Parker's cops making a blue-coated semicircle and back with the principals, you go to work with the two dolls. The one from Viola's place and the one you took off Frank Reed's desk. And now, Peter Chambers, the gentleman with the dolls, is not going to do an Edgar Bergen or a Paul Winchell. Peter Chambers is going to do a... Peter Chambers. Thank you, Lieutenant. Now, first, ladies and gentlemen... The regular doll. Listen, please. And now, the doll I took off Frank Reed's desk. Listen. You know the difference? Mr. Chambers, if you're so set on playing with dolls, I have a suggestion. Oh, shut up. Go write yourself a poem Just or a something. Just a minute, Louis. Easy, Louis. Once more, ladies and gentlemen, the regular doll. Now, the doll from Frank Reed's desk. Now, there must be a reason for the uh, vocal restriction of the second doll. There must be something jamming up the sound box. Sure. This doll just says, ma, and the other says, ma, ma. Hey, you know, you sound cute, Louie. Oh, I don't shoot. Now, let's get back to the unfinished note that Frank Reed wrote. The cuff link is, and then he passed out before he could finish it. Now, let's figure it this way. There was a tussle. He tore off his assailant's cufflink, and he put it somewhere. And he tried to write out a note as to just where he did put it, so that the killer would be identified. Now, it's my hunch that it's in the innards of this doll. So, I unscrew the head, 
And I dig in, like so. And I come up with a cufflink with initials SC. SC for Salvatore Cortez, or even for Sammy Cortland. What about that, Sammy? Why, I, I never saw it. You I get the picture, about... Louie? You see, this Brooklyn tamale bumps off Frank Reed. So John Reed latches on to 300,000. Then he's going to bump John, which explains the shooting off that fire escape. So then dear old Linda latches onto the said 300,000, and then Linda and Salvatore... Oh, Linda, she talked me it, into it. That's a lie. It was all his idea. We were going to get married, Linda and I, but it was her idea. She talked me into it. It's just the reverse. He talked me I into it. I don't care who talked who into what. Just keep on talking, Mr. Flamenco Just dancer. a minute, Louie. Just a minute. Now look, Sal. What about me? Why should I be part of your private shooting gallery? Well, all right. After I got out of there, I... I realized my cufflink was missing. Right in the place was lousy with cops, and I couldn't go back. But after a day, I knew they didn't have it. How'd you know? Well, I had my initials on it. As long as I wasn't arrested, I knew they didn't have it. And then? The day I came back for it, you were in the office. I saw you with that doll in your hands. And I heard it, as you said, vocally restricted. And I knew where that cufflink was. I've had experience with dolls. The idea for this type doll was mine. I used my gun. But you dropped in time. Okay, you two. Let's go. And so Parker links up with his culprits and heads for downtown. And you link up with the lovely Viola Carson and head for uh, cocktails and candlelight. And there you've had Crime and Peter Chambers. Dane Clark was starred as Peter Chambers. Crime and Peter Chambers was created and written by Henry Kane. Others in the cast were Bill Zuckert, heard as Lieutenant Parker, Bill Griffiths as John Reed, and Leslie Wood as Viola. It was directed by Fred Way. This is Fred Collins inviting you to tune in next week, same time, same station, for Dane Clark in Crime and Peter Chambers. With us again next week at this same time for another adventure by Peter Chambers in Crime and Peter Chambers. This is the United States Armed Forces Radio and Television Service.
Crime and Peter Chambers. Created by Henry Kane, transcribed and starring Dane Clark. Private investigator, duly licensed and duly sworn, Peter Chambers. You're a private eye. That's your business. Anything else, that's for laughs. This one figures for a lot of laughs, and you're being paid for it, which adds a rare quality to the laughter. You're at the apartment of a jeweler, George Reiner, and you're being invited to a masquerade party at the Riverdale mansion of a famous, or uh, is it infamous, millionaire, Robbie Tamville. And who hasn't heard of Robbie Tamville? And uh, I'd like you to get there before I do, Mr. Chambers. All the arrangements have been made. Um, uh, what will you wear? Well, I don't quite know, Mr. Reiner. You've <laughs> sprung this on me uh, rather quick-like. Oh, a man of your resourcefulness. Come now, Mr. Chambers. Uh, think of your reputation. Uh, yeah, I'm thinking. Tonight, 8 o'clock. Well, let me see now. Well, I've got an idea. Something oh. that's never been done before. Yes. Uh, pirate's costume. Good. No patch over the eye. Very good. And just so that I'll be sure, don't wear a sword. Then I'll know for certain that you're my pirate. Okay, Mr. Reiner, I'll be your pirate. No cutlass, no patch. Mm. Now, let's get back to the business end of the deal, please. Uh, well, sir, you've heard of the Opal of Ramses? Opal? Well, yes. Owned by King Ramses and a priceless objet d'art. Only wasn't it supposed to have brought hard luck to this ancient Egyptian king and hard luck to everyone that's owned it since it was dug up? Oh, sure, Mr. Chambers. Superstition. Pure, baseless superstition. So how come Robbie Tamville is so anxious to get rid of it? Well, he's had a run of bad luck. And now that it is offered for sale, I have the opportunity to purchase it. Yeah, you and this, uh, uh what's his name? Uh, William Zuckle. And good old eccentric Tamville makes it a bidding contest between you and this, uh... William Zucco. Um, I'm to come dressed as a clown. Uh, there, there's the costume. Do you like it? Yeah, it's peachy. Uh, William Zucco is coming dressed as a Persian prince. Anyway, one way or another, tonight, Robbie Tamville gets rid of the ring. Yes, he'll have the opal there tonight at the party. Uh, uh, first, he'll interview Zucco, and then he'll interview me. Whoever bids highest, that one gets the ring. There'll be contracts to sign, and then the cash is to be deposited with his bankers tomorrow. Uh, how much is that thing worth? Oh, about a quarter of a million. I know a collector right now who'd pay 200000 And my job? To accompany me back to town as bodyguard. And to remain with me as custodian of the Opal until I can reach my office tomorrow and where proper transferals of insurance can be executed. Hmm. Okay, I'll see you tonight. I'll be there, P.D. the Pirate. Afternoon, Mr. Reiner. And remember, you know the costume. I'm the clown. So, that evening, you're living it up amongst the swells. Everybody's wearing masks and everybody's wearing costumes, but your client, the clown, hasn't shown up yet. And meanwhile, you've latched on to a female with a lush and lovely figure, incongruously attired as a witch. You've danced, you've chortled, you've chuckled, but now you're dying of curiosity. So you waltz her off to a corner. <laughs> yes, my dashing buccaneer. Pray, what wish you of the witch? A mask a witch, else this pirate walks the plank. If anything is prosaic as a plank can be found in this diamond studded shack. Will you unmask too? Because I'm just bursting with curiosity. You take your mask off and she follows suit and, brother, you've hit the jackpot. Blue eyes, tiny nose, dimples, and a wicked little smile that just verges on being seductive. Like? Oh, I love. Good. Because I like what I see, too. So, let's get acquainted. My name is Patricia Holmes. Uh, Peter Chambers. What do you do? Well, I'm, uh detective of sorts. Detective? How very interesting. Yes. You look like an actor. A leading man type, you know. Yeah, and you like an ingenue. Say, what do you do? I'm a doctor. A doctor? <laughs> well, now. Disappointed? Oh, I'm flabbergasted. 
For further information, over 21 and unmarried, specialize in fluoroscopy and x-ray. Uh, look, Doc, I, I got a small pain that hurts me here, see? <laughs> I conduct my examinations at my office. Oh, I'd love to visit. You may at that. I combine my office and my apartment. 441 Park. I uh, didn't take my car. I was driven here by a group of friends. So if you've a car here... I have. <laughs> well, Mr. Chambers, after this party, I'd admire to have you take me home. And there isn't a thing in the world that I'd admire more, Doctor. <laughs> well, thank you. But all the while you're talking, some joker's jostling you from the rear. True enough, the joint is crowded, but that crowded it ain't. And finally, you whirl on the guy who's wearing the toga of a Roman senator. Oh, I'm sorry, Mac. It's a little crowded. Now, wait a minute, Buster. It's not that crowded, so take it. <laughs> Real sensitive, uh, dear old private optic. Hey. <laughs> Is it because he's engaged in conversation with so beautiful a damn... Louis! Louis Parker! <laughs> Detective Lieutenant Louis Parker, New York City Police Department. Fine cop, good companion, and great friend. You introduce him to the lady. Good to know you, Miss Holt. Likewise, Lieutenant. Hey, what are you doing here, Louis? Well, I got a hunch it approximates your reason for being here. Oh? I'd uh, like to talk to you, Pete, uh, if... Uh... <laughs> That, Miss Holm, means that the courteous lieutenant would like to talk to me alone, but in the circumstances, he finds it difficult to express. Your beauty, Miss Holm, <laughs> makes it even more difficult. Hey, hey, listen. You You're like most it. gallant, lieutenant. If you promise not to keep Mr. Chambers away too long. I promise. Good enough, then. I'll see you later. Isn't she cute, Louis? Now, listen, Pete. I'll tell you why I'm here. Develops Tamville isn't too eccentric after all. What with carrying that opal ring around on his person, he invites Parker to his party so as he can have some law and order around the house, just in case. You give Louis the dope on why you're present. Which means that outside of you and me and Tamville, the only ones who know that this ring is here tonight are George Reiner and this William Zucco. That's straight from the horse's mouth, which is Tamville. Now, Pete... Hey, look... You look, and you see the Persian prince strolling out of the garden. He looks hot, and he's taking off his mask. Let's go join him, Petey, just for the heck of it, huh? Yeah, it's cooler out there. Uh-uh, mustn't forget the bottle. Oh, no, we mustn't. <laughs> this is Parker's night for relaxation. You bring a bottle and three glasses out to a table in the garden. The Persian prince is nearby, mask off. You call him over, introduce him, and offer a drink. William Zucco is a tall guy whose black eyes give off about as much expression as a couple of shuttered windows in an empty house. You're about to hand him his glass when it slips to the ground. Well, you can't hand a Persian prince a dirty glass, so you pick it up, wipe it clean with a handkerchief, and you try again. Then you pour for the three of you, and you all drink. Ah... <sighs> Ah, uh, good. That uh, hits the spot, as they say. Thank you, Mr. Chambers. Would you like another, as they say? No, 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 no. Thank you. You know, uh, you look real right handsome as a Persian prince, Mr. Zucco. Oh, no, no, no. Not really. That was uh, Robbie Tanville's idea. And you don't cross Tanville, not when you intend to do a little business with him. Ah? Uh, you, uh, intending to do business with Mr. Tanville? Well, uh, yes. I think so. Just then, a butler comes out and tells Zucco that Tamble is ready to see him. You all go back into the house, and the butler opens an oak door for William Zucco. You can see inside, it's a big room with wide French windows on the far side opening to another garden. Tamble's inside. The only guy at the party not in costume. Zucco goes in and the door closes. You lose Parker and you find Patricia home again. And you keep her with you. And finally, Zucco comes out and goes up a flight of stairs. And then, not five minutes later, your client, the clown, appears. You wave to him, but he doesn't wave back. He proceeds directly to the oak door 
goes in, and then... The shots are from Tambell's room, and you and Parker bust in there fast. The French windows are wide open. There's no one in the room except Tambell, and he's very dead. All right. All right, everybody out of here. I'm Detective Parker. Police, now get them out, please. Everybody out. Come on. You stick around, Petey. Out, out. That's right, out. Well, nice, huh? Yeah, real nice. Whoever pulled it beat it through those French windows. But the gun's here. You pick it up with the pencils of the trigger guard, like so. Hey, Pete. Huh? Hey, take a look. That barrel, look at the scratches. Fresh ones. Yeah. Hey, it looks like there was a silencer on that barrel, Louis, not too long ago. But, say, we heard the shots. Yeah. Any ideas? Not a one, you? Uh, not on this silence a bit. But uh, I got a lot of ideas on friend murderer. Really? You saw who came in here last? Uh, uh well, yeah. Yeah, I, I, your I... client, that's who. The clown guy, mask and all, but the only clown at the party. Now, look, Louis, don't let's jump to conclusions. Jump after conclusions, all. conclusions, Pete. This conclusion don't have to be jumped at. This comes up, it hits you on the jaw like a hook from Marciano. Well, let's have a look at the late Mr. Tamville. Uh, no. Ain't on him, Pete. Motive for murder? An opal ring worth maybe a quarter of a million bucks. Missing. Fifteen minutes later, the joint is jumping with cops. A search of the ground turns up, uh... A clown's costume. And an idea starts to percolate in your mind. So you do a little searching, too. You pick up an item which might be of unusual interest and you safely deposit it in your car. No guest is permitted to leave until he or she is thoroughly searched by an expert. And that turns up nothing. No opal ring. But the search of the guest does develop one item of importance. One guest is missing. Your client, Mr. George Reiner. Driving down in the car, there's Patricia Holm, there's Parker, and there's you. Mr. George Reiner. Well, I'm saving him for me. No use sending anyone else. If he's skipped, he's skipped. If he's at his apartment, then he's for me, personally. But why, Lieutenant? How? I uh, won't go into the why, but here's the how. He bumps Tamville, cops that opal ring... Goes through those French doors, gets rid of the clown costume, and blows, period. Uh, I sent that gun downtown well in advance. I'm curious about the check on that mm. beat. Which means that after we drop Miss home, we stop first at headquarters, Yeah, huh? sure. Mm -hmm. Then we, uh, call on Mr. Reiner. Very good. Very satisfactory. What are you so happy about? Uh, just a minute. What are you reaching in the glove compartment for? This. The glass. Well, what's... what's well, uh, the... uh, 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 handle it gingerly, Lieutenant. You're going to do a fingerprint check on it. Now, one set figures to be mine. I'm very curious about the other set. Where did you get that glass? Stole it. A memento from Tambell's party. Hey, Louis, will you have that fingerprint check done for me? Sure, Petey. You insist? You deliver Patricia home, and you promise to come back there to bring her up to date on developments, no matter what they are. And then you deliver Parker to headquarters, and you wait in the car while he goes in with the glass. When he comes out, he's got a peculiar glint in his eye. He tells you the fingerprint checks on the glass will take some time, but that he's put a rush on it. And then he clams. And when Parker clams, he's tighter than a bar fly at curfew time. And finally, you're at George Reiner's apartment. Oh, Mr. Chambers, I'm so glad to see you. But Parker pushes through and shoves a gun under his nose. Mr. Reiner, is this your gun? Wait, uh, let me see. Yes, it's my gun. Well, it's nice of you to admit it, but whether you admit it or not, the serial numbers prove it's your gun. Fingerprints on it are smudges, but ballistics show this gun killed him. Now, any way you look at it, kiddo, you're up the creek. Killed? Killed whom? Oh, will you look at him making with the innocent baby act. Killed Robbie Tamville. Robbie Tamville? Mr. Chambers, is this true? Yep. Well, who is this man? Lieutenant Louis Parker, homicide. 
who thought he was going to have an evening of relaxation. You deny that you killed him, you stole that ring, that opal from King Tut or one of those other wrapped-up mummies? Of course I deny it. Brother, you were seen to go into his room. The shots were heard. The gun was yours. The bullets from the gun killed him. The French windows were open. The clown costume was found on the grounds. You were the only guest missing. And you knew he had the opal on him. Now, where's the ring? I don't have it. Now, look, oh, you wait don't... A minute, wait a minute, Louis. Just a minute, just a minute now. Uh, Mr. Reiner, you heard the lieutenant. Yes. Do you have any explanation? Well, I can only tell you what happened. Well, what did happen, Mr. Reiner? Well, uh, sometime after you left, my doorbell rang. I answered it, opened the door, but there seemed to be no one there. I stuck my head out and was struck on the back of the head. Uh, that's all I remember. When I regained consciousness, I, I was bound and gagged. Mm. It took me hours to untie myself. When I finally did, I looked about, thinking it was a robbery, trying to see what was stolen. Was anything stolen? Well, just my clown's costume and uh, my gun. Okay, Mr. Reiner. Suppose, just for the sake of my friend here, whose client you are, suppose I try to buy your story. Now, show us some proof, huh? Where's the rope that bound you, or is it wire or tape, maybe? And the gag around your mouth? Where I'm is sorry, it? Lieutenant. I was bound by a couple of my neckties. And the gag was one of my own handkerchiefs. But I do have a bump on my head. Oh, I'm sorry, Pete. I gotta take this guy downtown. You tell Parker where he can reach you, and then off they go to headquarters. And off you go to Patricia Holmes' apartment. Dr. Holm is comfortable in satin lounging pajamas, and no doctor ever looked better in lounging pajamas. You bring her up to date on your facts, and then she takes you about, showing you uh, her equipment, the fluoroscopes and the x-ray machines. And then you're settling down in a comfortable divan with a good doctor for some conversation about uh, doctoring, when... Hello? Is Peter Chambers there? Oh, just a minute. It's for you, Peter. Oh, thanks. Hello? Here's the dope on that glass deal of yours. All right, Louis. One set of prints. Yours. The others belong to a guy, uh, Bill Zukalski. Zukalski? What about him? Well, he's a Russian emigre. He used to work in a circus. He ate ground, glass, nails, tacks. You know, one of those guys. He did a bit about eight years ago for assault, then disappeared. Hey. Now, look, uh, Pete, what's your interest in the guy, and who is he? Look, Louie, pick up our Persian prince and bring him down here to Patricia Holmes' place and do it fast. Persian prince? William Zucco. You know what you're doing, Pete? Absolutely, and please, Louie, fast, huh? Half an hour later, Parker shows of William Zucco. You don't waste any time. You accuse Zucco of the murder of Robbie Tamville and the theft of the opal ring. Ah, you are talking through your hat, mister. If I had that opal on me, they'd have found it. I didn't have it and I don't have it. Oh, yes, you have. Have I? Then prove it instead of talking like a big guy and doing nothing. Talk is cheap. Proof. Prove it. Demonstrate. First step in the demonstration is to clip him under the chin. <laughs> And then you drag Zucco to Dr. Holmes' fluoroscope and you stand him up behind it. And she starts the do jigger going. Hey, I see it. Clear as day. Where? Through the fluoroscope thing. It's in his stomach. Clear as day. The ring with the stone in it. Come on out, Pete. Take a look at this. Well, who, who's going to hold him? Not me. I'll hold him. I got you. Yeah. Sure enough, there it is. William Zucco, born Bill Zukowski, who can swallow nails and tacks and glass. Oh, what a hideaway, eh, Louis? Yeah. How can you frisk a guy when he's got the loot in his stomach? And ten minutes later, when you've convinced Zucco, or Zukowski, or whatever his name is, that you've got him dead to rights, he straightens out the deal for you. 
Okay, so you knock out George Reiner and you clip his clown costume and his gun, huh? Yes, and I bring the stuff up to Tamville's and hide it in an upstairs room. And then when you're drinking with us, the butler calls you. Oh, it's a good thing I dropped your glass because I wiped it clean with a handkerchief, which, after I handed it to you, left only my prints on it and yours. Inside, I killed him. I used a silencer on Reiner's gun. One bullet. Then I came out, went upstairs, put the clown costume over mine... Went back into Tamville's room, supposedly as Reiner took the silencer off and put three more bullets into him. Then I ran out the French doors, threw the silencer into that brook nearby, but left the clown costume on the ground. Making sure to leave Reiner's gun in the room. Huh? Then I came back, and once more I was one of the guests, the Persian prince. The way it looked, Reiner killed him, dropped off his costume, and ran away. I thought no suspicion would attach to me. Well, you might have been in the clear if not for my friend, the shamas here. Pete, where did you get the idea for the prints on that glass? From you? Yeah, I know. From me? Well, you're the guy that told me that aside from us and Tamville himself, only two people knew about that opal being on him, Reiner and Zuko. Yeah. Now, Reiner retained me and paid me a fee to act as a bodyguard when he would buy it. If he's planning robbery and murder... <laughs> Well, would a reasonable man do that? No, he wouldn't. Well, whom would that leave if anything happened to the opal? Oh, our ex-circus bird here. Huh? Come on, pal. Oh, ho, ho, ho. I'm uh, going to have to handle you gently. After all, in a way, you're sort of a receptacle for evidence. And like that, you're pretty valuable. <laughs> And so, after Parker and the valuable Mr. Zucco take their departure, you and the darling Dr. Patricia Holm finally settle down to some quiet conversation and peaceful tete-a-tete. Oh, you Peter Chambers, you. Oh, Doctor. <laughs> And there you've had Crime and Peter Chambers. Dane Clark was starred as Peter Chambers. Crime and Peter Chambers, transcribed, was created and written by Henry Kane. Others in the cast were Bill Zucker, heard as Lieutenant Parker, Joe Boland as Reiner, and Nancy Wilder as Patricia. It was directed by Fred Way. This is Fred Collins inviting you to tune in next week, same time, same station, for Dane Clark in Crime and Peter Chamber. And Peter Chambers has come to you through the worldwide facilities of the United States Armed Forces Radio and Television Service.
and Peter Chambers. Created by Henry Kane, transcribed and starring Dane Clark. Private investigator, duly licensed and duly sworn, Peter Chambers. You're a private eye. That's your business. Anything else? That's for laughs. It's strictly business this trip. You've been paid a little fee by a little lady in a little apartment on Gramercy Park. And now she's wringing her hands, and she's got plenty to wring her hands about. Her name is Mrs. Donald Sloan, and only yesterday her husband was declared an embezzler. Seems he worked in a bank. Only he must have thought it was a garden patch. Because yesterday, before he disappeared, he helped himself to 100,000 shreds of lettuce. All crisp and all green. Mr. Chambers, my husband wasn't a thief. You got a better name for a man who elopes with 100,000 bucks? Not Donald. I tell you, there's something wrong here, something peculiar. Mrs. Sloan, listen. Look, here's the morning paper. Let me read it to you. But... Now the headline. Bank teller and $100,000 vanish at lunch. I... No, 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 no. Beneath that, the following. Donald Sloan, teller and junior officer of the Trade Bank of the City of New York, is being sought by the police, charged with the embezzlement of $100,000 of bank funds. <laughs> Mr. Sloan, an employee of long standing, left his teller's cage as usual at the lunchtime. When he failed to return, a hasty check by Charles Jenkins, manager of the bank, revealed that Sloan's cash was $100,000 short. But... Curiously... Mr. Sloan had passed up an additional 28000 in the same drawer. Look, However, Mr. Chambers, to the police, I'm just another wife doing the usual screaming about the innocence of her husband. Look, there is no denying the guy walked out of that bank with 100000 clan. But he left 28000 Yes, but... Why? If you're going to steal, why not all? Mrs. Sloan, I'm a detective, not a clairvoyant. But... <laughs> okay, okay. Just what do you want me to do for you? Look, Mr. Chambers, I'm not trying to whistle my way past a graveyard. I have no illusions about my husband. What? But I know for certain the man was not a thief. Wait a minute, wait a minute. Illusions? How did you and your husband get along? Not too well of late. Well, how so, and since when? Since about two months ago. Uh, a lady? You might call her that. What's her name? I don't know. I tried to ignore it, but last week we quarreled, my husband and I... And he asked that we separate. I heard him on the phone several times talking to a... Frankie. Well, Frankie could be a man. No, no, he has no man friend by the name of Frank. Do you think there's any connection between the request for a separation and the embezzlement? No, because I don't think he was involved in the embezzlement. Mm, here we go again. All right, all right then, Mrs. Sloan. Your husband worked at the 34th Street branch, didn't he? Yes. Fine. I'll be in touch with you as soon as anything develops. Uh, one other thing. Do you have a picture of your husband? Yes, yes, I do. Oh, it's an excellent photo. I'll get it for you. So, off you go, and it's tic-tac-toe. You haven't the faintest idea where to make the first stab. You check down at headquarters with your friend, Detective Lieutenant Louis Parker, and all he's got so far is a great big bunch of nothing. He calls the bank for you, gives you a nice write-up, and that's your next stop. Please sit down, Mr. Chambers. I know that you represent Mrs. Sloan. I'll do my best to cooperate. Charles Jenkins, bank manager. A skinny little guy, egghead type. Large ball dome, heavy glasses, and a mouth that's all teeth. Uh, this is a privately owned bank, Mr. Chambers. Uh, all of our employees have been with us for many years and completely to be trusted. <clears throat> or so we thought. The uh, newspaper has said something about Sloan's having been a, uh, uh, a junior officer, I think that was the term. Yes, yes, very true. Uh, part-time he was at the teller's window and part-time he handled business transactions for us, mostly real estate. I see. Now, what about that $28,000 he left in his drawer? What about it, Mr. Chapman? Now, look, grand larceny is grand larceny. Why take the 100 and leave the 28? If you're stealing, why not take it all? The penalty's the same. Mm, I'll admit you have a point there, sir. It sort of puts me over on his side a little bit. Sort of uh, spurs my investigation. Uh, sincerely, Mr. Chambers, I hope and trust you're right. It would, uh, well, 
how shall I say it, uh, restore my faith in human nature. After all, he was a married man. Well, well, don't get restored all at once, Mr. Jenkins. Our boy was having a little trouble at home. Trouble? A tomato. Tomato, Mr. Chambers? Uh, a lady. It seems it started a couple of months ago. His wife tells me he met the lady here at the bank. Uh, suppose I take a gander at the books. Gander, Mr. Chambers? Oh, dear. Suppose I look over his books. You know, recent new accounts, business matters, that kind of stuff. But the police have already done that, sir. Uh, not from my angle, Mr. Jenkins. Me, I'm looking for a dame. Uh, yes, yes, Mr. Chambers. Yes, indeed, indeed. Uh, if you'll come this way, sir, I'll put you into his teller's cage and surround you with everything pertaining to his affairs. Hmm, dame, dame, indeed. <laughs> You spend a couple of hours bent over books like a bank examiner. You go over the whole works, and you come up with one lousy little item that you jot down on a sheet of paper. You're hoping against hope, and then Jenkins joins you. How goes it, Mr. Chambers? Well, one tiny little lead. Yes? Within the last three months, this new account here, a Miss Frances Lake, Opened her account about two months ago, which jives with the time element Mrs. Sloan mentioned. Also jives with the name Mrs. Sloan gave me. The name? Uh, what name, sir? Well, a lady in his life, Frankie. That's all Mrs. Sloan knew, just one name, Frankie. And you think this Francis Lake might be that Frankie? It's a frequent enough nickname. Well, it's the only possible thing I can come up with in all this pile of stuff here. I wrote it down, see? Francis Lake, 1252 East 47th Street. From which she removed about three weeks ago. Well, how do you know? From the police. Did she leave a forwarding address? Unfortunately, she did not. But it was strictly routine, Mr. Chambers. There was no special interest in her then, and there is none now. The big, brilliant detective and his one lousy little clue. You crumple the sheet of paper and you pitch it to the wastebasket and you throw a strike. But it pops out of the basket because the basket's brimful of junk. You cast an accusing glare at the fastidious Mr. Jenkins. Is something, Mr. Chambers? Say, what's with this bank anyway? Don't people have a clean-up around here? <laughs> Matter of fact, the baskets in this cage haven't been emptied since yesterday. What's the matter? Can't the bank afford it? Well, we employ one cleaning lady who, working through the night, does an excellent and thorough job. So? <laughs> Our lady came down with, <laughs> of all things, measles. And we were informed today to secure a substitute. So when the men came in this morning, each one of them cleaned and emptied their own waste baskets. Uh, since Mr. Sloan's cage was unoccupied today, his baskets are still full. Did you tell this to the police? Police? That our charwoman came down with the measles? Well, don't be ridiculous, Mr. Chambers. Ridiculous, huh? These waste baskets are still full of Sloan's stuff, yesterday's stuff, before he walked out for that famous lunch hour. You make a dive for those trash baskets like there's gold in them, our hills of refuse. And gold there is. Because you come up with a sheet off a desk pad diary. Yesterday's date, and on it is written... Frankie. 1215. Real estate. Stanley building. What is it, Mr. Chambers? What is it? Your faith in human nature. Well, what are you talking about? It still holds good, Mr. Jenkins. Donald Sloan is not an embezzler. Here, read this. Huh? Frankie? 1215, real estate, Stanley Building. 1215, lunchtime yesterday. This guy was no embezzler, Mr. Jenkins. Embezzlers don't tip their mitts like that. Tip their mitts, Mr. Chambers? Mr. Chambers! You're off and running. Destination Stanley Building. Which turns out to be a dilapidated, flea-bitten crumb hole decked out to be an office building. It's down near the battery, wedged in between a couple of warehouses. There are a few like it in every town, fitted out for fly-by-night operators. It's four stories high. And a peek at the billboard downstairs informs you that F. Lake Real Estate is on the second floor, room 201. There is no elevator, so you creak up the wooden steps, but when you face up to the solid oak of 201, it's locked. And nobody answers your knock. Downstairs, you flash your credentials at a seedy-looking janitor, give off with some important detective routine palaver. But a uh, $20 bill is the final convincer. He gives you a key, tells you to say you stole it in case of emergency, and back you go to 201. You turn the key in the lock. And you open the door. Go 
Come in, Buster, and close the door behind you. You don't close the door just because he told you to. His order carried additional authority in the form of a chunky revolver held in a pudgy fist. The guy seated behind the desk is fatter than a bookmaker's bankroll. He's really huge, decked out in a white Palm Beach suit with a floppy Panama hat square on his head. He's big, thick, red-faced, with tiny gleaming pig eyes set within many folds of fat. Like this little man, you're liable to get killed. Uh, like what? Like barging in where you ain't invited. Uh, who invited you? You're not F. Lake. I ain't. So, who are you? <laughs> There's a hot one. A boy breezes in where he don't belong, and right away he starts pecking with the stupid questions. Sit down, chump. Over there. Okay. I'm sitting. And I'm standing up. <clears throat> oh, you're a large one. Little pal, I don't know who you are, but sticking your nose in where it don't belong, it picks up trouble. I got a large hunch you're going to be awful sorry you came here, little pal. And I'll tell you a little secret. I'm sorry I came here. I'm sorry I ever came here. Now I'm going to blow. Now first I take your key, like so. And then me, I blow. And I'm going to lock you in. Then you're here, and I ain't. Goodbye, little pal. And take it from me. You ain't going to be lonesome. For a few seconds, you sit there like you're rooted to the chair. Who wouldn't? Then you bounce up and start moving. And then behind the desk, you find him. Donald Sloan sprawled on the floor, dead. A knife stuck in his back. You reach for the phone, but the phone's as dead as Donald. So you're back to being a detective. You frisk the dead Donald and you come up with the usual items. But you're working at your trade and some of the usual items are unusual. For instance, he's a smoker. Cigarettes in his pocket and seven packs of matches. But four of them bear the same ad. Cafe Prince. Cafe Prince. You check it in the phone book and it's down on Sullivan Street. The next problem is getting out of there. The door's too tough. But it develops that your fat friend isn't too bright. The windows are sealed, but glass is breakable. And there's a fire escape right handy. So you're moving again. But you stop off at your office for your gun. And then it's the Cafe Prince. A sign on the door says closed, moving out. But when you try the door, it's open. What's on your mind, bub? The question comes from a redhead at the check room. She's black-eyed and pretty with a cuter assortment of curves than a World Series pitcher. You stick your head around the bend. The joint's deserted. A saloon with most of the chairs on the table. But the liquor bottles are still showing behind the bar. Joint's closed, mister. We're moving out tonight. Uh, well, can I check my hat? Because it was you, I'd love to check my hat. Look, Mac, if you got a thing for check girls, go somewhere else. Lots of check girls in this town. Oh, I got it for you, cutie. Hello, will you? Well, can I have some food? How about some food? Can I get a sandwich? Kitchen's closed. Oh, I I, I saw the bar is still open. That's all I want, honey. I need a drink. That's all. Oh, arguing with a rum pot adds up to a rumpus and a rumpus we don't need around here. Oh, come on, honey. I need a drink. I need a bath. Okay, okay. Go on in. Have your drink. Have two drinks. Tell the bartender the check girl said you could have them for free. And then get out of here. You understand? You weave around the bend into the deserted room, and there's no one behind the bar. So you go into the usual drunk's routine. You slam your hand down. How's the bottle of service around here, huh? A curtain moves at the far end of the bar, and a man comes into view. Now, what do you know? It's your fat friend from the Stanley building. He's wearing an apron now. And on this trip, you've got to jump on him. Now, look, Mac, what the heck is going on? You see the pretty little gun in my hand, fat boy? 
Yeah, I see it. So be a nice little fat boy and come out from behind that bar. Sit down here at the table and let's you and I have a chat. Yeah. That's a nice little fat boy. Sit down. Yeah. What do you want? The story on how come you're locked in a room with a cadaver, which turns out to be Donald Sloan, who lifted 100,000 samples out of a little old bank called The Trade. Who? Who are you? As far as you're concerned, I'm the law cop. Private cop. I didn't do it. What's your name? George Sachs. Oh, George all the way, huh? Okay, let's have your story. It might do you a little good with the DA. Little pal, if private law is sitting here right opposite me... Public law don't figure to be far behind. That's smart enough for a stupid guy. Now, if I spill, you figure I can make a deal with the DA? It's happened before. Will you help, little pal? I'll do what I can. Okay. It was the dame. Francis Lake? Well, how'd you know? Ah, you haven't been reading the quarter books lately, pal. Every private eye's a genius. Come on, talk it up, Porky. Okay. Now... Well, she happens to open an account in that bank. And that Sloan guy, he goes for her like a ton of bricks. She figures a guy works in a bank, a junior office guy, it's an opening, so she punches. <laughs> a cutie, that one. Real cutie. Keep talking. She don't go to rob the bank. She makes the bank come to her. Like how? Well, she opens the phony little real estate office. She tells him about a deal she's got to buy a piece of property worth three quarters of a million dollars. She tells him she needs a hundred thousand bucks for an option, that she can turn a profit within five days. How could she figure we could keep a hundred G's out of the bank for five days? I told you, she's a cutie. She sold it to him good, but good. Like how? Me, I'm supposed to own this hunk of property, an ex-bootlegger with plenty of old moolah. Property's supposed to be worth three quarters of a million. Okay, you're the bootlegger with the property. He brings it a hundred thousand bananas. It's supposed to be her money. Then the two of them, yesterday at 12.30, are supposed to wait for me. Now, why is he waiting? Part of a shrewd apple deal. Now, listen. I'm supposed to arrive. She hands me the option money. The papers are all drawn. Then I turn the money over to him so his bank can hold it in escrow. For what? Either she buys the property within five days or she's supposed to lose the option money. Oh, he figured the money goes back to the bank so he's protected, huh? Yeah. Now, this is how it's supposed to work out. I give him the 100 G's. He's an officer at the bank. Him and I sign a paper. He picks up the dough and brings it back to the bank. Supposed to be holding it on the deal. Oh, the old Ron Robbins. That's right. He's going to cover up for her with the bank records. Like that, according to her, nobody gets hurt. The money's back in the bank. She's got a tight option on the property. She tells him she's already got a sucker who's going to buy the property within five days. Yeah. Then within the five days, she's supposed to sell the property at a neat commission. She's used the bank's money for the option, but the bank still got the dough, and nobody's hurt. Smart thing. So how come the guy winds up dead? That's my beef. I don't mind taking money from a bank. That's like taking a jelly bean from a candy factory. But murder... Brother, that ain't my department. Never mind the philosophy, fat stuff. Just keep talking. Well, yesterday I wasn't even there. What do you mean you weren't even there? Well, Sloan thought I was supposed to be there, you understand? The plan was that it was her job to clip him over the noggin, tie him up, and then beat it with the 100,000 bananas. Oh. Instead, she sticks the seven to him. Why? So she can't ever put the finger on her. Now, I don't know nothing about that. I was here today. I read it in the papers how, how he disappears. And I ask her. And then she breaks it to me. That's why I was there when you barged in. Just what were you doing there? Figuring the angles. How to get the body out of there. Maybe folded him in a trunk. Something. Yeah, but you're the guy that don't want no truck with murder. It was done, wasn't it? Might have wound up like him if I didn't listen to her. But I'm talking now, ain't I? I've had it, little pal. A private eye and a deal like this. You can help a guy like me. You're about up to the jackpot question as to where the dough is when you feel the cold muzzle at the nape of your neck. You feel that gun at your neck, mister? I feel it. Okay, now give your Roscoe the fat stuff. 
Okay. He's got it. No. Just before your brains get blown out, I bet you're dying to know where that dough is, huh? Dying is correct, my lady. In a suitcase in the trunk compartment of my car right outside. <laughs> so near and yet so far. You'd be Frankie Lake, wouldn't you? Yeah. And if I could turn around, you'd also be the hatchet girl. Correct. Only it also happens that I own this joint, which is a white elephant if there ever was one. And now, Mr. Nosybody, a fond farewell to you. But it was fat stuff who pulled the trigger. And down she goes and you come up out of your seat and you're bent over her doing the inspection bit. It was the only way, the only way. I swear I never used a heater in my life, never. It ain't in me. I ain't no killer. But it was the only easy, way, my guy. Easy, easy, does it, fat boy. No harm done. More's a pity. Scratch, flesh wound, period. They'll patch her up nice and pretty and they'll make her nice and healthy. And then she'll stand trial. And she'll wind up in the hot seat after all. Ah, that's the way it goes, fat boy. A merry-go-round. That's life. And death. And there you've had crime and Peter Chambers. Dane Clark was starred as Peter Chambers. Crime and Peter Chambers transcribed was created and written by Henry Kane. Others in the cast were Mary Patton, heard as Mrs. Sloan, and Joe DeSantis as Jenkins. It was directed by Fred Way. This is Fred Collins inviting you to tune in next week, same time, same station, for Dane Clark in Crime and Peter Chambers. Some days are blue days. Some days are happy days. Some days are just ordinary days that you don't even notice go by. But here's a word about a day you can't miss. It's Tuesday. Any Tuesday on the NBC radio network this fall. We're calling it the biggest Tuesday night in radio. That's a big statement. But it's a big night. Listen, Lux Radio Theater moves to NBC in the fall. And you'll hear it every Tuesday. Yes, Lux Radio Theater on NBC. Your favorite stars... Your favorite stories on this station. Lux Radio Theater is enough to make any night a big radio night. But that's not all we mean because your lineup also includes Dragnet, People Are Funny, Fibber McGee and Molly, and The Great Gildersleeve. You can see what we mean by the biggest Tuesday night in radio. It's so big we couldn't wait to tell you about it. Crime and Peter Chambers. Created by Henry Kane, transcribed and starring Dane Clark. Private investigator, duly licensed and duly sworn, Peter Chambers. You're a private eye. That's your business. Anything else? That's for laughs. Laughs. This one figures for more laughs than a bull session at a bachelor dinner. You're being retained to play nursemaid to three of the most beautiful girls in the world. And for that, you're being paid. The lady at your office is Miss Matilda Cragg, battle axe type and built like a fire hydrant. Your fee, then, is $500. Yes, Miss Cragg. And you understand that I represent Mr. Byron Thorndyke? Yes, Miss Cragg. And you understand that Mr. Thorndyke is the Mr. Thorndyke? Byron Thorndyke Model Agency? Yes, Miss Cragg. And you know why you're being retained? Well, of course, Miss Cragg. Then uh, let's go over it again. Again, Miss Cragg? Young man. My dear young man. Yes, Miss Cragg. Uh, can't you... Isn't it possible... Won't you please call me Matilda? Huh. With all my heart, Matilda. There now, that's much better. So much less businesslike, less formal. Uh, well then, uh, let's get on. All right, here goes. Every big city and most every big country has been running a beauty contest. Then all of them competed in an elimination contest in Los Angeles, and three were chosen. Correct. 
Miss Madrid, Miss Paris, and Miss Brooklyn. And these three are now here in New York for the finals tomorrow. And one of the three is to be crowned Miss Universe. Prize, $50,000 in cash and a Hollywood contract. And Byron Thorndyke is to be sole judge. And I am here as chaperone for the young ladies. Mr. Thorndyke has taken a lovely house on Sutton Place with a lovely garden and a lovely view. Oh, the East River in the summertime. Yeah, um... The vast bridges. Yes, Miss Graham. Their lights strung across yeah, the water. Yeah, 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 like... all right, all right, all right. Uh, something, Mr. Chambers? Matilda, let's get back to cases. Uh, yes, yes, of course. Uh, now, uh, you're to be there tonight at midnight. Because the money transport company is going to deliver 50,000 cash bucks to Thorndyke at a quarter to twelve. And you are to serve as bodyguard. You will come armed, of course. Oh, of course, Miss Matilda. And you will stay with Mr. Thorndyke until tomorrow afternoon. And then you will remain with whatever young lady wins the prize until the money is safely deposited in a bank. Miss Madrid, a brunette, is Lola Granada. Uh-huh. Miss Paris, a redhead, is Louise Dupre. Uh-huh. And Miss Brooklyn, a blonde, is Joan Hallam. Yikes. Now, Mr. Chambers, I want you to remember... It's the longest day of your life, as what day wouldn't be when at the end of the rainbow you're scheduled to meet, you hope, uh, Miss Madrid, Miss Paris, and Miss Brooklyn. Anyway, comes midnight and you're all dolled up in your summer finery, if one will forgive the slight bulge for gun and holster, and you're at the house on Sutton Place, and you've got your finger on the buzzer. Well, Peter Chambers, boy detective. I was told you'd be due here, so I opened the door for you myself. Say, what are you staked out here for, Louie? Assistant judge in a beauty contest? I don't think that contest's coming off, Pete. It's been canceled on account of the unexpected advent of a corpse. Detective Lieutenant Louis Parker. Homicide, New York City Police. Straight cop and good friend. He leads you through a corridor that opens upon a massive living room, and there, in a chair with his back to the entrance, Byron Thorndyke, very dead. A knife crammed between his shoulder blades. Parker's men are doing their jobs. Photo guys, fingerprint guys, the works. Real nice, huh? Mm. Byron Thorndyke with a knife in his back. When'd you get the call, Louie? About ten minutes ago. Who found him? The chaperone, that, uh, Matilda Craig. Mm, where's she? Right now, in a hospital. Hospital? Oh, wait a minute, Pete. My boys are finished here. Yeah. Yes, you, uh, might as well get the party out, too. Okay, and I'll be downtown shortly. All right, Petey. Where were we? Matilda Craig. Yeah. Well, then let me, uh, set you up on the details first. Mm. The money arrived a little early, about, uh, 25 to 12. And that's the motive for the murder, huh? No, sir, it ain't. That dough was piled up on the table here when we found him. Nice as you please. Well, if not money, then why do you yeah, think... search me. Anyway, about, uh, oh, quarter to twelve, we get the call downtown reporting this thing. Call from whom? Matilda Craig. We do it with the siren blasting all the way, and we're here in five minutes. We find the door locked, so we jimmy our way in, and there he is, just like you saw him. Dead. He's back to the entranceway, and Matilda keeled over by the phone. Slugged? No, no, fainted. Turned out to be a heart attack, as a matter of fact. Oh. Anyway, we bring her to, and she straightens us out on some of the facts, and then we pile her up to the hospital where she is now, incommunicado. And what were these facts? Very meager. Miss Craig decides to come down to see if Thorndyke needs anything before she retires for the night, you see? Oh. She comes in here, she finds him, just like you saw him. She phones into the cops, she keels over, and that's the deal, period. The dough was delivered at 25 to 12. By the way, where is the dough? I sent it downtown to our property clerk. Safekeeping. Okay. Dough delivered 25 to 2. She finds him at a quarter to, which means he was killed within that 10-minute period, right? Right. Those girls been in the house all that time? Yeah. Each in her respective room. So one of them's your murderer. Or Matilda Craig. Well, one of the four of them. You, uh, talk to the dames upstairs? Yes, nothing. Each one clams, each one denies, each one professes no motive. Where do they live, uh, dresses and stuff? Ah, that's a thing. One lives in Madrid, one in Paris, and the one from Brooklyn was living in Hollywood when Thorndyke discovered her. What have you told them? How much do they know? Well, they don't know nothing except that the guy was stabbed to death. And that's all the information they're going to get until I'm ready to question. Meantime, they all stay put like they are and keep denying like they're doing. Think I can see him? 
Think I can stop you? <laughs> Upstairs, Park introduces you to the cast of suspects. And a beautiful cast it is. First is Miss Brooklyn. Blonde as a Viking, blue-eyed and ruby-lipped. My name is Joan Hallam, and I don't know nothing from nothing. I don't know who killed him or why he was killed. And I would consider it a special favor if you two baboons got out of here and left me alone. Sure. Next you go calling on Miss Madrid. Raven hair pulled to a bun in the back and black eyes with more flash than a swindler on the make in Monte Carlo. I am Lola Granada. I am shocked and all broken inside. I have nothing, nothing to say. I wish to be alone. Please, please. Charming. And then Miss Paris. Red hair, green eyes, and a figure like the figure eight. But, oh, so much more attractive. I am Louise Dupré. Oh, it is Peter, Peter, a chambre, n'est-ce pas? Oh, this is so great a surprise. I am charmed. It is my delight. Double charming. You met her last year in Paris when she was dancing in the Folies Bergère. You just didn't connect the name. You were there on a case, and this had all the makings of a great romance when, as luck would have it, the case was over and you were yanked back to the States. Oh, tiens, my handsome Peter. Oh. Mon cher, this is so true and the light, so unexpected. Hey, what the devil is going on here? We are old friends, my dear. Um, uh, l- Lieutenant. Uh, we, commissioner. Yes, you know who this is? This is Peter Chambre, the one true great detective of all the United uh, States. Louise, uh, oh, no. he must have told you that himself. Oh, huh? yes, he no, did. Sh- the right. one Peter Chambre, the great detective. All right. All right, all right. Well, yeah. Oh, now look, my one true great detective of all the United States. Oh, look, Louis, you don't understand. See, I was in Paris last year. <laughs> the Louis. one great detective. Louis, I'm trying oh. to explain to you. I will I... talk to him. I will talk to him alone. I do not trust another. I am in a strange country. I will talk to him. But not here. Outside, in the rear, is a garden by the ocean. By the beautiful East River Ocean. There I will talk to him. <laughs> well, what have you got to lose, Lieutenant? Commissioner, I will talk to him. To the Peter Chambre. Okay. Okay, go talk to him. And so, outside in the garden, with a cool breeze coming over the uh, East River Ocean, she puts her arms around you and kisses you. But from the way she kisses you, you know she's worried. Before you can ask her, she says it. Oh, I am so worried, Peter. I am very much distressed. Uh, You tell me, honey. You tell the great detective of all the United States. My knife. It is missing. Uh Uh-oh. What's with a knife? It is in my family, an heirloom. We have had it many years, but it is gone. Since when? I do not know. I showed it to the girls when we came here two days ago. Then I put it in my bureau drawer. Then I did not look again. Until the police came and told us about... about poor Byron. As they told us he was... oh, how you say it? Uh, stuck. Stooped? No, stuck. Uh, stuck, stuck. Ah, uh, stuck. Then quickly I look. My knife, she's not there. Well, did you tell the police? I was afraid I am in a strange country. They will think that Look, perhaps they're going to I... find out sooner or later. So, if they find, then I will speak. Perhaps they do not find, then I have no need to speak. Look, Louise, you didn't kill him, I hope. Oh, no, not I. Peter, you will protect me. You will protect poor little Louise. You will not be sorry. Louise will appreciate oh. so... Oh, like no, no, this. wait, 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 wait a minute, wait a minute. Uh-huh. You're a little premature in the appreciation department. Easy. <laughs> True. You are correct. You have any ideas on Byron Thorndike? Oh, he was a bad man. Well, that's an idea. Where'd you get that from? No, from Miss Brooklyn. Jean Allen. You mean she didn't like him? Oh, she loved him. So, uh, that makes him a bad man? Oh, it is so. I am the prettiest. I know I am going to win. I tell this to Joan. She agrees, but she does not no, agree. No, slowly, honey, slowly. You're committing mayhem on your English. She agrees, and she does not agree. Well, how do you work that one out? <laughs> she agrees that I am the prettiest, but she does not agree that I will win. She tells me that she loves Byron, and that Byron loves her, and it is all how you say, um, in the bag, that she will win. Oh, a fix, huh? Even in a beauty contest. Fix? What is this, uh, fix? Oh, you skip it, honey. Huh? Okay, I skip. 
So that is how I know he is a bad man. Now, look, this Joan Hallam, she's told the cops that she lives in Hollywood. Do you know anything about that? Well, once when we are together in Los Angeles, she tells me of a little room she has in Brooklyn. She says never to tell anyone because it is so poor and small. She says she still keeps it because it is so inexpensive, even though she lives in Hollywood, just in case she has to come back east. She was having so much wine that night. I do not think she even remembers that she told me. Did she give you the address? Oui. Uh, 262 Hoyt Street. Hoyt Street? Hoyt Street. Oh, you mean Hoyt Street. That's what I said. Hoyt Street. Yeah, that's what you said. Ground floor back. Is in Brooklyn, no? Is in Brooklyn, yes. So now, Peter, I have told you all because I am so afraid. You must help me, and then when it is all over, believe me, Louise will not forget. Louise will remember. Regretfully, you leave Louise, but you hope there will be a better moment when all her worries are dissipated. You accompany Parker to the Belmore Hospital, where you sit outside in the white wall corridor while he interviews Matilda Cragg. You sit for a long time until finally he comes out. Well, I think we can eliminate her. Matilda, why? My boys have checked her thoroughly. She's known Thorndike a long time, sort of a secretary in his agency, and he's been very good to her. She's got a bad heart. He's paid for doctor's treatments the past ten years. Well, at least she could straighten you out on his background. Uh-uh, she's no help there. He kept his personal life to himself. What about those dames out at his house? Does she have any ideas as to who might have stuck that thing into her boss? That's why I came out for you. She heard mention of a threat. By whom? Lola Granada. Miss Madrid? Mm-hmm. Well, now, how did it happen? Come on in and listen. Softly now. Miss Craig. Yes. Yes, Lieutenant. Hi, sweetie. Oh, Mr. Chambers. Miss Craig, uh, tell us about that argument now, will you please? You feel strong enough? Oh, yes. Yes, I do. It was two days ago. Miss Hallam was in Miss Granada's room. The door was open and I was dusting outside and I could hear. Miss Hallam was speaking. Miss Hallam was saying... Look, Lola... I don't want to tread on anybody's toes. I'm telling you the truth, so help me. I don't care if you're jealous or you're not jealous. I'm telling you the truth. I'm supposed to win this contest hands down. Byron Thorndyke told me he was stuck on me. Told me he was in love with me. Then he was lying. Maybe yes, maybe no. Maybe yes, my dear Joan. Neither you or Louise will win. Only I. There is $50,000 to be paid, and he will keep it in the family. He will pay it to his wife. Wife? Yes. I am his wife. You are married in Los Angeles. Why, the... I don't believe it. No? Then look at this. A marriage certificate. Do you see, John? Yeah. I see. And I don't want you playing around with my man. Is that clear? Or he with you? And I have told him that. I have told him, if it continues, I will kill him. I am not accustomed to this and I will not have it. And now that I have told you, Please, to get out of here. Please, get out. Quickly! Okay, okay. Don't let that Latin temper of yours get the best of you. I've got a temper of my own, you know. Byron Thorndike. That dirty, miserable dog. And, uh, and that was what I heard. I didn't mention it. Not to anyone. I'm not one to gossip. But now... In these circumstances... All right, Miss Craig, all right. Now, easy, huh? Put your head back on the pillow. Nurse. It's the middle of the night now. Parker's gone down to headquarters for a workout with his laboratory men, and you're dying to go to sleep, but you've got one more little chore to do. Two six two six two Hoyt Street turns out to be a ramshackle brownstone with ash cans on the sidewalk. Ground floor back is a flimsy door that has no resistance to your gentle ministrations. Inside, there's lots of accumulated dust, but there's also signs of a recent entry, like a newspaper with yesterday's date. 
You give the joint a quick going over, which isn't much of a job. And then out of an old musty trunk, you come up with something which isn't musty at all. That does it for you when you get out of there. Next afternoon, you're at the house on Sutton Place. Parker's got the ladies in Lola Granada's room, and he's jabbing left hooks. But you know Parker. He's holding back that haymaker. Possibly because he's got no haymaker to throw. But he's wearing them down, the three of them. Now you, Miss Paris, Louise Dupre, that knife belongs to you, no question. That's a French knife made in France, one of them antique deals. But, Commissioner... It's Lieutenant. Oh, certainement. But it does not mean I have used the knife to kill. Only fingerprints on it are yours, lady. Well, it belongs to her, whose fingerprints should be on it. Look, who invited you here? You did, Lieutenant. We're sort of working hand and glove on this thing. Glove. Now, there's a pretty word. Whoever stuck that steel into him probably did use gloves. These uh, ladies equipped with gloves? Yeah, all of them. So a gloved hand would keep the culprit's fingerprints off and keep Miss Dupre's fingerprints on. Okay. Well, let's get to you, Miss Madrid. Lola Granada with a Latin temper. Brooklyn here has been keeping her trap closed, but you, Miss Granada, were heard to threaten Thorndyke in her presence. Any comment, Miss Granada? I did not kill him. That you said too many times. Any other comment? Only once again, I wish to report the loss of my marriage certificate. It was stolen. Marriage? Marriage? We're working on a murder case. It might be pertinent, Lieutenant. Are you still here? Why don't... Pertinent how? Because it was stolen by the murderer. Ah. Uh, and I suppose you know who that is, too. Of course I do. Here, let me point a finger. Eeny, meeny, miny, mo. And it comes out... You. Joan Hallam? Me? You, Miss Joan Hallam, you stole that marriage certificate. I did not. Oh, you deny it, huh? I certainly do. All right, I'll show you the missing marriage certificate. See, I'll dig it out of my pocket. Take a look. What about it? Guess where I found it. Where? Where did you find it? 26262 Hoyt Street, ground floor back. But how? How, how could you? Honey, you were put on a spot. What are you talking You've about? You've been put on a spot by Thorndyke himself. The lieutenant's been holding on to you, sweetie. He couldn't. Thorndyke scribbled your name. He couldn't. He scribbled your name when he saw you come in with a knife in your hand. He couldn't. He couldn't. His back was turned. He was seated with his back to the... <sighs> oh. And that, my dear lieutenant, is what is known as cooking your own goose. Nobody knew that he had his back to the door, Miss Hallam, except Miss Cragg, the police, and the murderer. It's talking time, Miss Hallam. Okay, okay, I killed him. That's one rat that deserved it. I had a contract waiting for me in Hollywood, but he talked me into this. Told me it was a sure thing that I'd win this contest. Told me he loved me. Anything to get this thing rolling for him. Look at all the publicity it gave him. All the business and for free. Because he figured to keep that 50 G's in his own family. That phony rat was going to fix it so his own wife, Lola, would win that contest. When did you make up your mind to kill him, Miss Hallam? When I caught him in the final lie. And what was that? I talked to him yesterday morning. I told him what Lola had told me, that they were married. Even then, he brazened it. Told me he wasn't married to Lola. When I threw him the bit about the marriage certificate, he told me that that was a phony. So I hooked it. I had a lawyer call L.A. and check it. It was the McCoy. Well, that was it. I sneaked Louise's knife from a drawer, and I waited for my chance. And that was that. Parker cleans up the loose ends, and your case is closed. And that evening, Louise Dupre descends upon you. And with a cool breeze wafting over from the uh, East River Ocean and a couple of highballs clinking ice, you have a declaration from the beautiful Miss Paris. Ah, the true great detective of all the United States. In appreciation, Louise bestows a kiss like so. Oh, yes. And in appreciation of your appreciation, the true great detective of all the United States bestows a return kiss. Like so. Oh. Even at home, Barry was never like this. And there you've had crime and Peter Chambers.
Jane Clark starred as Peter Chambers. Crime in Peter Chambers transcribed was created and written by Henry Kane. Others in the cast were Bill Zuckert, heard as Lieutenant Parker, Marion Carr as Miss Cragg, and Anita Anton as Louise Dupree. It was directed by Fred Way. This is Fred Collins inviting you to tune in next week, same time, same station, for Dane Clark in Crime and Peter Chambers. This is Roger Tuttle inviting you on a 60-second trip into the future. Not way in the future, but just as far ahead as this September. September 14th, to be exact. And that's the day that Lux Radio Theater returns to the air. And you'll enjoy it right here on NBC. Lux Radio Theater has been radio's most popular dramatic show for many years. And no wonder. It brings you an entertainment combination that can't be equaled. You'll hear the brightest stars in Hollywood in one-hour adaptations of the greatest motion pictures of all time. The first Lux Radio Theater presentation, September 14th, is the powerful and moving story, Wuthering Heights, starring Merle Oberon. Crime and Peter Chambers. Created by Henry Kane, transcribed and starring Dane Clark. Private investigator, duly licensed and duly sworn, Peter Chambers. You're a private eye. That's your business. Anything else? That's for laughs. It's a lazy summer's afternoon, and you've got your feet up on the office desk. And on the other side of the desk, there's another pair of feet. The latter belonging to the illustrious Detective Lieutenant Louis Parker, homicide New York City police. Cop, gentleman, and good friend. Louis's got a day off, and he's taking a busman's holiday. He's spending it in the company of a private eye. Well, let's uh, get out somewhere, huh, kiddo? A little sunshine or something? Even Coney Island. Yeah, I can just visualize you and me in the tunnel of love. Oh, clever. <laughs> All right, get in the side, Pete. Now, we, we ain't going to spend the afternoon locked in your office talking shop, are we? No, no, we ain't. If I can wangle it, we're going to be seated in a deluxe box at the racetrack, screaming at the oat burners. Great, fine. What do you mean, uh... If you can wangle it. Did you ever hear of Rhonda Duffy? Rhonda D- You mean the lady that owns Grey Dancer? Yeah. Supposed to be the best three-year-old in America? That's the one I mean. Certainly I've heard of her, sure. Well, she's due here any minute with Jackie Johnson, her jockey. Her horse is running today, ain't he? At Belmont? That he is. Hey, what are you doing with these society swells? Well, I'll huh? tell you... Come in! Ah, Miss Duffy. How are you, Jackie? Hi, And a pleasant good afternoon to you, Mr. Chambers. Mrs. Uh, Rhonda Duffy, Miss Jackie Johnson, this is Lieutenant Louis Parker, best policeman in the whole city. Uh, how do you do? Nice. How Glad do you do? You. Mr. Chambers, I don't know what Jackie here wants to see you about, but I do know it's personal. Well, uh, I, 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 I was just... Oh, leaving. no, was... please, Lieutenant. As a matter of fact, I was intending to invite Mr. Chambers to the track today. Oh. <laughs> My horse is running. Oh, thank you. <laughs> and I should love to include you... You, Lieutenant. Well, unless uh, you have something else. No, no, I, I don't have a thing. I, I'd very much like to go. Good. Then suppose you and I leave now, Lieutenant. My car's downstairs. Jackie and Mr. Chambers can join us later after they transact whatever business they have to transact. That's okay by me, Mrs. Duffy. Oh, come along then. <laughs> And, and don't keep him too long, Mr. Chambers. He's riding today. I'll get him there on time. Then I'll see you later on. You know my box number. Yes, Mrs. Duffy, I do. <laughs> Bye, then. Bye, Mrs. Duffy. Okay, Jackie. Where's the tight squeeze? Meaning? Meaning that when a guy wants to see a private eye, there's a tight squeeze somewhere. Pete, you know Ralphie Butcher. Ralphie Butcher. Hey, there can't be a tighter squeeze. What's between you and Ralphie? Forty thousand bucks. Wow. And, uh, you're overdue? Yeah. Ralphie Butcher, the toughest loan shark in the city, and you're overbought to him for forty thousand bucks. 
How come, Jackie? When you play horses, Mr. Chambers, and I play horses, you hit a bad streak sometimes, see? And, brother, I really hit a bad one. I began to borrow and double up, borrow and double up, and and all of a sudden... All of a sudden, you're way down deep in the hole, huh? Yeah, 40 G's worth. Last night, he told me, get it up. Get it up today or else. And what can I do for you, Jackie? Well, I want you to call him. Can you do that for me? Sure, I can call him. Only what do you want me to tell him? To lay off me today. That's all. Just lay off me today. Tonight, I'll pay him. I'll pay him in full. Uh, well, I think that can be arranged. Well, let me see now. Ralphie Butcher, Oregon, four, two, A couple of hours later, you're out in the brilliant sunshine in Rhonda Duffy's box at Belmont. Parker's there, Mrs. Duffy's there, and a tall guy with a little black beard who turns out to be, of all things, an undertaker's embalmer. Mrs. Duffy introduces him to you. John Butler, Peter Chambers. Uh, how do you do? You know, fellow, you're the first undertaker's embalmer I've ever met. Really? How's business? Oh, I'm out of that now. Now I write verse for greeting cards. Verse for greeting cards? Wasn't the embalming business better? Uh, yes, somewhat. Well, why'd you quit? Uh, my wife. Uh, somehow my wife objected to that profession. Uh, prior to that, I was a pickpocket. What did you say? Oh, no, 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 you misunderstand. I was a pickpocket as an entertainer. Uh, you know, nightclub work, vaudeville. Oh, yeah, I see. Well, don't relax, Louis. Relax, relax. Unfortunately, I was never really very lucky. Uh, pickpocket embalmer, greeting card versifier, but uh, I'm afraid I've never averaged more than $50 a week in my life. So now you're playing the horses, huh? Oh, no, no, indeed not. Uh, this is the first time I've been to a racetrack in my life. You're kidding. Honestly. Then what brings you uh, today? Well, I'm a very good friend of Jackie Johns. Mrs. Duffy's jockey, huh? Yes, that's right. He insisted that I come and watch him ride today, and, well, I acquiesced. Well, I've known Jackie for years and years, but this is my very first time at a race. Uh, I, may may I, I uh, cut in on this very interesting conversation? Louis, this is the first time this guy's been to a race. Yeah, track. yeah, he told me, that? Pete, take a gander. Over there. The gander discloses in the very next box, Ralphie Butcher. And seated beside him, a good-looking blonde in slacks and red blouse. Mr. Butcher, big as life. Oh, do you know Mr. Butcher, Lieutenant? I know him slightly. Do you? Oh, yes. He owns several excellent thoroughbreds. Mr. Butcher is a banker, lends money, that sort of thing. Yeah, he lends money, all right. Oh, do you know him too, Mr. Chambers? I know him quite well. The young lady with him is Katie Adams, works for me. Grey Dancer's trainer. She's your trainer? One of the few lady trainers in the business. I, um, I think I'll stroll over and pay my respects to our banker friend. Uh, tell them to join us, Lieutenant. All right, Mrs. Duffy, I will. The next race is ours, Mr. Chambers. I'm awfully excited. Oh. See, I can't even open my bag for a cigarette. Look out for them. Oh! Look. Easy, easy does it, Mrs. Duffy. Oh. All you did was drop your bag. Oh, but everything is scattered all over the place. Well, just relax. Old Petey's oh. the best picker-up in the business. Oh, this is such a... Hey, what's this? A switchblade knife. Oh! How incongruous can we get? A society lady with a switch knife in her purse. Oh, it isn't as bad as it looks, Mr. Chambers. The knife belongs to my trainer, Katie Adams. She comes from the West where these things are legal. She found it in her trunk today and turned it over to me, and I shall bring it to a police precinct when we get out of here. Excuse me. Where are you going, Mr. Butler? That knife frighten you? Oh, no, 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 indeed. I'm just going to stretch my legs and perhaps wager a bob or two. Well, good luck. <laughs> thank you, thank you, my dear. Well, how about you, Mrs. Duffy? Aren't you going to bet on your horse? I've never made a wager in my life, Mr. Chambers. And in this case, it would be practically taking their money. It's only a three-horse race and Grey Dancer has practically no competition. <laughs> Parker appears with Butcher and Katie Adams, and then John Butler comes back, and it's a real happy party. And pretty soon, the horses dance out on the track. And Katie Adams, lady trainer, is most enthusiastic. Look at the gorgeous horse, that old gray dancer. Look at Jackie, sitting on him just like they were born for each other. And look at the prices on the tote board, which is just as it should be, gray dancer. 
one to five. Kenny K, 40 to one, and Pamela H, 99 to one. This one's a walkover, that's what it is. Practically a walkover. But if it was a walkover, it was a walkover in reverse. Because dear old Grey Dancer came in last, absolutely last. The winner, Tammy Kay. Second, Pamela Ace. And a very poor last, the one to five shot, Grey Dancer. The figures on the tote board show that Tammy Kay pays $80. $80 for two. Wow, we. Brother, if ever I saw a jockey throw a race, that was it. First he holds him like he's going to tear his head off, and then he, he makes a grandstand play. Puts the whip to him when he hasn't got a ghost of a chance. Well, it's a good thing you don't wager, Mrs. Duffy, because... Wager or not, I know when a crooked race is run, there was absolutely no excuse. Katie, I want Jackie here as soon as he's out of his silks. And if I have my way, he'll be out of his silks for good. Twenty minutes later, Jackie's out of his working clothes and in Mrs. Duffy's box, and he's giving off with more double talk than a stuttering ventriloquist dummy with amnesia. Look, I just wouldn't run, Mrs. Duffy, that's all. I'm only a jockey, not a magician. But Mrs. Duffy, I broke him last like I always do. You know he's no front runner. But when I come to make my move, he wouldn't move. You held him. You wouldn't give him his head. It was obvious to everyone, and there must be 40,000 people here. Look, Mrs. Duffy, right now there's another race, and there's a horse in it I'd like to bet on, so I'm going to make my bet. Then I'll be back here, and we'll discuss it further, and if you want to bring charges against me, it's okay with me. I'll be glad to leave it up to the stewards, but right now I'm going to make my bet. There's an exodus from that box as though a plague had struck. Rhonda Duffy says she's heading for the stewards. And Katie Adams says she's heading for a bite of late lunch. The rest of them, including Parker, are heading for the seller's windows to do what you're supposed to do at a racetrack. Bet on horses. There are 15 horses in the next race, so you do the old tic-tac-toe and you make a selection yourself. The crowd is tremendous. You push and you get pushed. And then you see another type of crowd... An excited ring of people. And when you get there, Parker's already there. Stooped over a body. And the body's that of Jackie Johnson. He was in that crowd at the $50 window and suddenly he dropped. Somebody stuck a knife into him. You help carry him to the clubhouse and there is definitely established. He's dead. And he was murdered. And now you and Parker are working at your trade. The knife in his back is a switch knife that was in Mrs. Duffy's bag. No question which limits our suspects to the people who had been in that box. Parker herds them all into the clubhouse and grills them. And the last one is Katie Adams. Now, look, Katie, you knew Jackie pretty well. What kind of a guy was he? A no-good guy. Enemies? Plenty. Friends? I'd say he had only one real friend. That Mr. Butler. You met him, John Butler. I'd say Butler was the only guy Jackie ever really trusted. All right, Katie, thank you. You can go outside with the rest of them. Pete, what do you think? Well, the only ones who could have managed it were the ones who could have gotten to that knife. Mm. Mrs. Duffy, Butcher, Butler, and Katie. And we haven't got a thing on any one of them that could hold them. Well, let's give it a run through. Mrs. Duffy? Well, doesn't figure for a motive. Should have seemed to be the kind of a person who would kill a guy just because he lost a horse race. What about Butcher? Well, it's like I told you, Louie. Jackie owed him 40 Gs. There wasn't going to be any pressure until tonight. Jackie promised to pay by then. The guy'd be crazy to kill him when he's been promised the money by tonight. John Butler? According to them, he was his only friend. What reason would he have to stick a knife into him? And Katie Adams? No motive that I can see. Strictly a business acquaintance. Trainer of horses. (sighs) Can't hold one of them. Haven't got a thing on any of them. Anything else I can do here, Louis? Ah, thanks, Pete. Another thing. Look, you've got work to do here. I'll meet you in the paddock when you're through. Yeah, okay. And outside, the first guy that buttonholes you is John Butler. 
Any developments, Mr. Chambers? No, not a one. I think I'd better call home. Oh? My, my wife hasn't been feeling well lately, and I promised her... Oh, my word. What's the matter? I seem to be out of change. Well, there's some coins. Uh, thank you. Uh, thank you very much. My pleasure. Then you find Mrs. Rhonda Duffy seated at a clubhouse table, lapping up scotch like there's no tomorrow. Parker comes out and joins you, and you order a round of drinks for everybody. Parker mashes a hand across his face, and he sighs. Oh, this one's a real humdinger. That it is. What happened to Kitty? She's out at the stables, Lieutenant. She's been very much affected by all of this. Why is she special? Well, it was her knife. In some complex manner, she blames herself for what happened. Maybe it ain't so complex at that. I don't understand, Lieutenant. Well, look, Mrs. Duffy, we've got a limited number of suspects. The weakest one in the chain is your Katie Adams. But why? Well, let's put it this way. The two weakest links were you and Katie. But I checked with the stewards, and you were with them at the time of the killing. That eliminates you. Thank you, Lieutenant. Now, wait a minute. No offense is meant, Mrs. Duffy. Lieutenant Parker is just working at his job. Uh, of course he is. I'm sorry, Lieutenant. It's all right. But the point is that we have excellent reason to believe that Mr. Butcher wanted Jackie alive. Very, very much alive. And from what everyone told us, including you and Katie, Butler was a dear friend of Jackie's. Who does that leave us, Mrs. Duffy? But Katie, I mean... Katie she... Adams. I can't believe Mrs. it. Mrs. Duffy, would there be any... Re... Uh, was there any relationship between Katie and Jackie Johnson? Well... It was a long time ago. Please tell us, Mrs. Duffy. Any little point might help. Well, they were interested in one another, but that was, oh, at least a year ago. You mean a serious friendship? Well, Katie thought so. But then, well, she wasn't actually jilted. It was just that Jackie found a new interest. She take it bad? For a time, but only for a short time. After a while, she realized that it was all for the best... That Jackie was, well, a rather frivolous type. What do you think, Pete? Well, from a psychological viewpoint, I think no. A lady doesn't wait a year to suddenly vent her spleen. Well, let me ask you this, Mrs. Duffy. How long has she been with you? Two years. And how come she picked today to give you that knife? She had it in her trunk, which she keeps here. She was doing a bit of cleaning. When she came across it, she realized that in this state, it's illegal to own such a knife, and she gave it to me. I wouldn't exactly say she picked today to give it to Louis, me. Louie, I still think you're barking up the wrong tree. Well, how about that uh, other tree which is approaching John Butler? Oh, I, I'm glad I found you. I want to thank you for your hospitality, oh, Mrs. Duffy. not at all. And uh, in the circumstances, I must sound like an awful oaf, but I must go home now. Something wrong? Yes, yes, indeed there is. Urgent, Mr. Butler? Extremely so. My wife has been here. I've called home. Oh, uh, thank you for your coins, Mr. Chambers. That's quite all right. It seems that she's taken a turn for the worse. Oh, uh, Lieutenant Parker, we're under no restraint, are we? Uh, any of us? No, no, of course not. Well, then, if you'll excuse me. Just a minute, Mr. Butler, just a minute. Yes? I've got something to show you. Uh, something to show me? Uh, what is it? What you show him is a bunched-up fist. Uh! But he's a strong one, and he stands up under the punch. But then you work his arm around behind him in a hammerlock, and you've got him, but good. What the heck is going on here? Grab a look in his pockets, Louis. Pete, do you know what Grab you're doing? Grab a look, I told you. Okay, all right. Stand still, you monkey. What do you know? What do you got? Parry mutual tickets. A uh, lot of them. For a lot of dough. For that big race, the Grey Dancer race. Except these are for number two and number three, Tammy Kay and Pamela Ace. <laughs> Let's hustle this guy inside where we can have some privacy. You talked me into it, sweetheart. Come on, you. Inside, further privacy is assured by Parker pointing his thirty-eight at the crestfallen butler who's as limp as a rag doll in the rain. The good Mrs. Duffy's eyes bulge as you count up the mutual tickets. 
How much, Pete? $2,000 worth on Tammy K. And $2,000 worth on Pamela Ace. $4,000 worth? Yeah. You know, this monkey never saw 4000 bucks in one lump in his whole life. Well, one set is useless to set on Pamela Ace. But the batch on Tammy K. That horse paid 40 to 1, and he holds $2,000 worth of tickets. Representing in sum, $80,000. Can you explain any of this, Mr. You Chambers? You betcha, Mrs. Duffy. And you, butler, correct me if I go astray. Unbelievable. Oh, fantastic. We start with Jackie Johnson, who needed a pile of money and who needed it tonight. Oh. Why? He got tangled up with a certain banker by the name of Butcher, otherwise known as a loan shark. I knew he was in trouble when he wanted to see you, but I didn't know what his trouble was. Little Jackie dreamed himself up a Lulu, a three-horse race with two tremendous long shots, and he's riding the cinch favorite. Oh, it's beginning to come to me. Uh, Jackie trusted this John Butler. He got together 4000 bucks, and he talked Butler into coming to the racetrack for the first time in his life, and he pumped him full of instructions. Meaning that Butler was to bet 2000 bucks on each of the other horses in the race. And Jackie holds back on the Grey Dancer. Huh? And any way you look at it, he's got to win a fortune. Only little Jackie didn't figure on human nature. John Butler suddenly stopped running to form. Yeah, happens with horses and with people. It's my guess, Mrs. Duffy, that the idea came to him when he saw that knife fall out of your handbag. Oh. Is that correct, Mr. Butler? Yes. Yes, that's correct. You mean uh, it came to him that with Jackie out of the way, he had 80,000 bucks in his kick, and nobody could say it wasn't his. And those Perry Mutual tickets are as good as cash? He used to be a pickpocket for entertainment. And this time he did it for real. He clipped a knife out of Mrs. Duffy's bag the first opportunity he had, and in that crowd at the seller's window, he shoved it into Jackie's ribs. But how? I mean, how did you know? He gave himself away. What? How do you, how do you, he how do you wanted to get away from there, Louis. He was afraid the investigation might go a step further. He might be searched, and he had those tickets on his person. Yeah. So, he figured out a reasonable method. As it happens, his reasoning turned out to be a trap. I don't quite understand, Mr. Chambers. He went off to telephone his wife, and he came back with the story that she was ill and that he had to go home, all very rational, all very normal, except for one great big hitch. Hitch? He couldn't have spoken to his wife or anybody else at his home. But why not? He was unfamiliar with racetracks. That's where he trapped himself. Oh, come on, I get to the point, Petey. There are no public telephones at the racetrack. That's the point. Oh, but of course not. Nice work, Pat. He couldn't have called his wife, and he couldn't have spoken to her. When he broached the subject, I gave him some coins, and I waited. He was either going to clear himself or hang himself. And he hanged himself. You can bet on that, Mrs. Duffy. And that won't be a wager. And there you've had crime and Peter Chambers. Dane Clark was starred as Peter Chambers. Crime and Peter Chambers transcribed was created and written by Henry Kane. Others in the cast were Bill Zucker, heard as Lieutenant Parker, Abby Lewis as Mrs. Duffy, and Donald Buca as Butler. It was directed by Fred Way. This is Fred Collins inviting you to tune in next week, same time, same station, for Dane Clark in Crime and Peter Chambers.
Crime and Peter Chambers has come to you through the worldwide facilities of the United States Armed Forces Radio and Television Service. Chambers. <laughs> Created by Henry Kane, transcribed and starring Dane Clark. <laughs> Private investigator, duly licensed and duly sworn, Peter Chambers. You're a private eye. That's your business. Anything else? That's for laughs. You hope you can mix a couple of laughs with this one. Because the client that's sitting opposite you, you'd like to have a couple of laughs with. She's got black, limpid eyes, black, listening hair, shining white teeth, and red, red lips. And her figure... It's got more curves than a swindle artist can throw at you. And they're much more interesting. Her name is Tina Diaz, an American of Castilian extraction. You're very handsome, Mr. Chambers. Uh, much more handsome than I'd expected. Uh, we're uh, supposed to be talking about murder, Miss Diaz. Uh, Tina to you, Mr. Chambers. Mm. Or may I call you Pete? Yes, you may call me Pete. Uh, no, Petey. I think I like that best. Look, you call me whatever you want, Miss uh, Tina. Now, let's get back to business, huh? About Winnie Brown. Who was murdered last night. I saw the item in the newspapers. Shot and killed in her apartment on Central Park West. Now, why haven't you gone to the police with this instead of coming here? Petey, I wasn't particularly fond of Winnie Brown. We happen to be earning our living the same way as dance hall hostesses, both working in the Utopia Bowl. And both of you interested in one of its patrons... Gordon Phelps, playboy, millionaire, man about town. I was interested, but Winnie won out. To be frank, I didn't like it. Oh, of course, that was before I met you. Uh, let me hear about Gordon Phelps. First, he was interested in me, and then he shifted to Winnie. We're all over the joint, <laughs> all over the dance palace, the Utopia Ballroom. There was a rumor that Winnie was blackmailing him. So, don't you think the police would be interested in that? Yes. But I'm not going to deliver that information. Why not? Because Gordon Phelps is a right guy, that's why. Hmm. Maybe I ought to call him, huh? And get it uh, straight from the horse's mouth. You won't be able to reach him. Why not? The Phelps mansion is on 56th and Madison. You won't find him there. How do you know? Because he's been in touch with me, which really is why I'm here. Right now, he's in a little place that he has down the village, a little hideaway he keeps. You know the phone number? Uh-huh. Warner 2 one, 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 oh. Want the punchline, Petey? Honey, from you, I'll take anything. He sent me. Gordon Phelps sent me. He's waiting for your call. All right. Warner 2 one, one. Maybe you are going to earn a fee. 
after all. Hmm. Hello? Gordon Phelps? This is he? Peter Chambers. Oh, good. I'm delighted that you called me so promptly. Uh, hiding out, Mr. Phelps? <laughs> Not exactly, no. I'm merely attempting to avoid any unnecessary publicity, if that's possible. I know the police want to talk with me, but I won't talk with them. Not until this hubbub dies down. Which is the reason I asked Tina to put you in contact with me. I want to retain you on this, Mr. Chambers. Over the telephone? No, I'd like to talk to you personally. But where? I, uh, I wouldn't want you to come here. It might be awkward. Well, how about the uh, Utopia Ballroom? Good. <laughs> sort of uh, home base, eh? Hmm. And most appropriate. You know what I look like? Yes, yes, I've seen your pictures. Good enough. Utopia Ballroom, nine o'clock. <laughs> Reluctantly, you kiss off the lush and luxurious Tina Diaz. You try to get through to your friend, Detective Lieutenant Louis Parker, but he's working nights. So you march through a dull day, and then at 8.30, you're at the Utopia Ballroom. You're a little early, but that's the way you want it. Ah, Utopia Ballroom. They're all the same all over the world. Dim, dark, and rather delightful. And the girl's young, beautiful, a little hard garbed in clinging gowns, all shapely and vivacious. But that's not all you see. You clamp on to a couple of points of real interest. Snowtime Cummings and Mousy Lawrence, a couple of top narcotics pushers of the West Coast. And you wonder what they're doing here in the East. And then Tina Diaz approaches, and she takes your breath away. Tina Diaz, sheathed in red silk. I want to dance, Hansel. <laughs> no, you know I'm waiting. Here, you got to buy tickets, but for you, Petey, it's for free. I'd love to hold you close and dance. Oh, honey, I've got a date with Gordon Phelps, you know that. Yeah, okay. See that table over there? Way over there where it's dark? That's his favorite table. Uh -huh. Sit there, and when he comes in... I'll send him to you. You sit and you wait. And pretty soon he's there. A tall, middle-aged, slender guy with man of distinction written all over him. The first thing he does is hand you an envelope. This is for you, Mr. Chambers. Tina Diaz directed me to you. What is it? Your fee. thousand dollars. I hope that's acceptable. Uh, it's acceptable. Sit down, Mr. Phelps. Thank you. You know your job, Mr. Chambers. I want to know who killed Winnie Brown. And if it turns out to be you, Mr. Phelps, there's no rebate on the thousand bucks. Good enough. Now, uh, what's your connection with that girl, Winnie Brown? What about this blackmail talk? It's absolute nonsense. She was taking dramatic lessons. And, well, I was helping her. How much were you helping her, Mr. Phelps? Seventy-five dollars a week. Well, now, don't misunderstand. It was purely an act of charity. The girl had time. Yeah, 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 sure, sure. Now, now, look, so what's with this blackmail pitch that everybody's talking about? Oh, rumor, gossip, and nonsense. She probably boasted that I was helping her, and, well, you know, a place like this, tongues get to wagging. Uh, did you visit her apartment often? As a matter of fact, I've never been to her apartment. Okay, you've never been to her apartment. Now, look, somebody did kill her, Mr. Phelps. Any ideas that you can kind of throw into the hopper? Well, there are two people. There's Tina. Tina. Tina Diaz? Yes. Perhaps, in a sense, it was my fault. Because it was Tina's belief that Winnie had won me away from her. There was bad blood between those two, and I know for certain that Winnie was in mortal fear of Tina. Fiery type, that Tina. Bad temper. How long have you known those girls? Oh, I met them about a year ago. Now, you said two people, Mr. Phelps. Who's your other candidate? Johnny Hayes. Who, Dad? The man that owns this place. His office is upstairs. 
couple of nights ago, I knew that Winnie was in his office, and I was going up there to sort of pay my respects. The door was partly open, and before I actually realized it, I was eavesdropping. I overheard an argument. Now, look, you big shot, Johnny Hayes. I know what's going on around here, and I don't like it. You're putting a lot of nice kids in this spot, making criminals out of them, and I don't like it. You don't like it, eh? Well, who the heck do you think you are? I'm the dame that can blow the whistle on you. That's who I am. Sister, let me tell you something for your own good. You're moving in over your head. Way over your head. And unless you butt out of this and keep your nose clean, you figure to get your head handed to you with a few holes in it. And that's final. And so's this final, Johnny. Unless you put a stop to this thing within a week, I'm going to the cops. And you'll get your head handed to you. And it's got holes in it already. And that was that, Mr. Chambers. I heard the way he spoke to her, and that was a threat. A definite threat. There are no two ways about it. Yeah. I suppose I go up and talk to this Johnny Hayes. Suit yourself. Can I quote you on that overheard conversation? Certainly. Why not? Well, if there's nothing more, Mr. Chambers, then I shall be going. You know where to be in touch with me. I'm uh, sort of well, hiding out. I, I just don't want to mix with the police or make any public statements. Not until this thing is completely finished. <laughs> Johnny Hayes' office is the usual cubbyhole overloaded with pictures of prize fighters and actors. Okay, so you're a private cop. So what can I do for you? He's a sharply dressed guy, tall, pale, slender, and good looking. And trying to learn anything from his face is like trying to learn something from a clock without hands. Okay, so you're Peter Chambers. So what do you want me to do? Bring out a flag and wave it? I want you to answer a couple of questions. I'm working on that Winnie Brown thing. Okay, so work. Somewhere else. I'm working here. Oh, a tough boy. One of them, huh? Tough enough if that's the way you want it. Now, how do you want it? Well, for the time being, let's play it in the soft key, tough boy. What do you want? That's better. A couple of nights ago, you were overheard threatening Winnie Brown. Where? Right here. It's a lie. You didn't have an argument with him? I her? did not. Suppose I tell you I got a witness to that. And I'll tell you, he's a liar. Would you say that Gordon Phelps is a liar? Gordon Phelps, eh? Yeah. Yes, I certainly would say he's lying. Why should he lie? So as he can take the heat off himself. If anybody killed her, he did. How does that figure? Because she was playing him for a sucker, that's why. And he couldn't get to first base. And that drove him off his nut. Ah, he's one of the millionaire guys spoiled all the way from the cradle. If they can't get what they want, they kill it. So as no one else can get what they can't get. And that about does it for your conversation with Johnny Hayes. The next stop, police headquarters, where you wait for Lieutenant Parker. And it's about 2 o'clock in the morning before he finally shows up. Detective Lieutenant Louis Parker, homicide. Staunch minion of the law, gentleman, and good friend. Well, bless my soul, if it ain't Peter Chambers oh, and Louis. <laughs> ain't it a little past your bedtime, friend? <laughs> Louis, what have you got on that Winnie Brown murder? Knowing you, uh... What have you got, pal? Well, I might have something you want. Oh, oh. Like perhaps a guy by the name of Gordon Phelps, huh? Perhaps. Hey, you're not you're not kidding, are you, Pete? No. Will you be able to produce that guy for us? I might. When? Oh, within the next twenty four hours. Good enough. All right. Now what have you got for me, Louis? This? A gun that killed her? And her diary. Did you, uh, trace the gun yet? We're working on it. Hmm. How about the diary? Did it give you anything? No, nothing that helps. Makes a lot of mention of that Gordon Phelps, though. And says she lived in that apartment the past two years. Did, uh, he go up to her apartment often? As a matter of fact, uh, according to the diary, he never went there. Ever. Uh, well, that jibes. Jibes? Jibes with oh, what? I'll skip it, Louis, for the time being. Now, 
What did happen up there at Winnie Brown's? All I've got is a smattering from the newspapers. Dead, shot through the head, gun left there, no fingerprints. Killer probably wore gloves. Apartment had been searched, but not thoroughly searched. It appears that she interrupted the search, and that's when she was killed. A neighbor heard the shots, reported it. How'd the intruder get in? Uh, that is one of our chief problems. How come? Well, the windows were locked from the inside. Door lock was not tampered with. In fact, when we got there, it was actually locked from the outside. We had to use master keys. Louis, hmm? a favor? <laughs> but what else? I'd, uh, like to look that apartment over. Yeah? Uh-huh. Do I get cooperation? Have I ever failed you, Louis? No, you never have. There's the key, pal. Thanks, pal. Enjoy yourself. Let me hear from you. It's two well-furnished rooms on Central Park West near 75th Street. You give the joint a quick going over and you come up with nothing. You're just about to start a return engagement, this time more intensive, when you hear an instrument fumbling in the door lock. You douse the lights. You take up a stand behind the door. And when the door opens, you jump them. But the hymn is soft and pliant and nice to the touch. And when you get the lights on, the him ain't a him. It's a her. Tina Diaz. Oh. Uh, you hurt me. Help me up. Please help me up. Hey, with a pick lock in your hand yet. Oh, you Tina Diaz, you naughty, naughty. Help me. All right, all right, all right. All right. Uh, up, up you go. Hey, uh. You hurt me. Right here. Sorry. Kiss it, Petey. Here. Right here. <laughs> Much better. Okay, now we finish playing post office. Let's start playing detective and suspect. What are you doing here? I, I didn't kill her. Please believe me, I had nothing to do with it. So what that. are you doing here? I I came because because I'm afraid. Oh, that makes a lot of sense. You came because you're afraid. I don't get it. I was afraid they'd mix me up in her murder. You see, a long time ago, I threatened but her. But she's dead. She can't tell the police you threatened her. It was in writing. I still don't get it. Listen, I have a temper. I flare up. When Gordon Phelps became interested in her, I felt that, well, that, that she tricked me. At that time, I, I went away for a vacation. I wrote her some letters, threatening letters. Well, later, when I returned, she told me she'd saved those letters for insurance. I'm sure the police haven't found them. Hmm. Otherwise, they'd have picked you up. Yeah, huh? that's right. So they're still here. Well, I don't want to be involved. So, so I, I borrowed this pick lock and I came here tonight, took some time off from the dance okay, hall. Okay, okay, sweetie, okay, okay. Now, let's see. Let's look together. Let's see. I'm, uh, Winnie Brown. I'm a girl who works in the dance hall. I have a tool in the apartment. I have some letters that I want to hide. Now, where would I hide them? I'm uh, a girl who's influenced by movies, comic strips, television. Tina. Yeah? Help me take that picture off the wall, that big one. You miss on the first, but the second picture does it. You rip off the brown paper back, and there are the letters. And there also is another item, a document. You look at that, and you pocket it. And then you return the letters to Tina. Oh, oh, I don't know how to thank you. Well, we'll uh, discuss that later at my place, huh? I've got a great, big, beautiful terrace overlooking the city. Oh, I'd love that. It's a date. See, what was that other thing you found, that, that legal-looking document? Well, at the moment, it's none of your business, sweetheart. Look, tell me, do you know a character called Snowtime Cummings? Another guy called Mousy Lawrence? Yeah. Yes, I do. Are you mixed up in any of that? No, I'm not. Good enough. Do you know what's been going on there at the Utopia Ballroom with those guys? Yes. A lot of the girls know. But they're afraid to talk. Those were not mixed up in it. Don't you be afraid. You tell me. Well, those two men come from the West Coast. That Snowtime Cummings and Marcy Lawrence...
You call Parker and you call Gordon Phelps and then you and Tina and a lot of cops and Parker and Phelps are all gathered in Johnny Hayes' office. Snow time and Mousy have already been picked up and now Parker points a finger at Gordon Phelps. You, Mr. Phelps, just in case you're remotely interested, the gun that killed Winnie Brown was your gun. Well, that doesn't mean a thing, Lieutenant. I gave her that gun six months ago as a gift. You're pointing the finger at the wrong guy, Louis. Well, who's the right guy? A little bit to your left. Ah, uh, correct. Johnny Hayes. Me? Why, you dirty little... Oh, shut up. Let him talk. Those two West Coast hoods were passing narcotics right here in this dance hall. They terrorized some of the girls into working for them. They slipped the girl a packet, and the girl would slip it to the customer while dancing with him, and then they'd take his dough in return. I didn't know anything That's about that. That's a lie. You even tried to talk Miss Diaz into your filthy little racket. Yes, it's true. He did. And for all of that, the boys paid him off, Louie. Winnie Brown found out about it, and she was a spunky one. She told Hayes unless he cut her out, she'd go to the cops. So he killed her. Johnny Hayes is all washed up, and he knows it. Suddenly, he pulls a gun from a drawer, and he points it at you. But it's Parker shooting the gun out of his hands. Good old Parker. Then everybody heads for downtown, police headquarters, and there you clean up a couple of loose ends with the lieutenant. And then... And the faint blue of the very early morning, on your terrace overlooking the park. You and Tina Diaz drink a quiet toast to the great, sprawling, sleepy city beneath you. To New York, and to you, and congratulations on a really brilliant performance. And to you, honey, who helped plenty. And believe me, it took a lot of nerve. How, how were you so sure it was Johnny? Well, first, whoever killed her had used the key to go in. And when he left, he actually locked the door behind him. So? Well, there was plenty of motive for Johnny. Phelps had heard his threat, and you gave me the rest of the information. That made me very sure that he was our boy. But that document stuck behind a picture was the clincher. What was that? That's what he was searching for. What might tie him into it? It was a legal separation between Winnie and Johnny Hayes dated six months ago. They'd been married, husband and wife, and they'd broken up. And back in my mind, I was looking for somebody with a key to that place. And who else would that be but the legally wedded husband? Real little old brilliant Sherlock Holmes. Well, uh, <laughs> I try. I like you, Petey. I like you very much. Oh, and I like you. <sighs> Petey, yeah. you, uh, you make a lot of money, don't you? I do all right. Well, I was thinking... I work pretty hard for a living, and I don't want to earn very much. Sure, sure, I know. And I was thinking that if you had confidence in my ability... Oh, I have confidence in you, honey. Uh, well... I know a dramatic school. It's only $75 a week, and if you could lend it to me and... Uh... Well, what, what's so funny? Nothing. Except this is where I came in. And there you've had crime. And Peter Chambers. Dane Clark was starred as Peter Chambers. Crime and Peter Chambers was created and written by Henry Kane. Others in the cast were Bill Zuckert, heard as Lieutenant Parker, Patricia Wheel as Tina, and Bill Griffiths as Gordon. It was directed by Fred Way. And this is Fred Collins inviting you to tune in next week, same time, same station, transcribed for Dane Clark in Crime and Peter Chambers.
Crime and Peter Chambers has come to you through the worldwide facilities of the United States Armed Forces Radio and Television Service. Chambers. Created by Henry Kane, transcribed and starring as Peter Chambers, Dane Clark. Your private eye. That's your business. Anything else? That's for laughs. You find yourself in a university, but you're not a student. Generally, you're allergic to classrooms, but the lady talking to you, the teacher by name Elaine Janis, well, she's uh, sort of an antidote for the classroom allergy. I need your help, Mr. Chambers. I need your help desperately. She has large brown eyes and a smooth white forehead. And despite her obvious agitation, she's a sweet young thing, this Elaine Janis. Starchy, but sweet. I need your help, Mr. Chambers. Not for myself, for another. Uh, Help? That's uh, my racket. Help, a public helper. Although sometimes I'm known as Peter Chambers, a private eye. Oh, well, there will be a fee, of course, Don't worry about the fee. I'm like a doctor. It depends on what the traffic will bear. And sooner or later, you'll get your bill. It's about Professor Stanley Sanders. Sanders? Hey, the papers have been full of it. The austere Professor Stanley Sanders, suspected of killing his wife and uh, suspected as putting him mildly. Oh, not Stanley. Uh, not Professor Sanders. He, he could no more harm any human being than... Right, than right, right, not right, Stanley. He's the sweetest, kindest person in the whole world. Well, what do you want me to do, Miss Janice? I want you to try to find out who did kill Mrs. Sanders. Well, does the uh, good professor know that you're retaining me? Oh, no, no, he doesn't. And I don't want him to know. I'll I'll have to talk to him. Well, tell him. Tell him that you've been retained, but that your client doesn't wish the name divulged. Uh Just uh, one more little question. Yes? What's your interest in this? Mine? Yes, yours. Well, I have known Professor Sanders for a long time. I think by his silence and his non-cooperation with the police, I I think he's been wrongfully suspected. He's a fine person, a good man, a kind man. Professor Stanley Sanders lives in a suburb at the edge of the Bronx. You drive up there and you find a modest, neat little house. Yes? Yes, Mr. Chambers? The professor's a young man, sandy-haired and straight-eyed. Yes? What is it, please, Mr. Chambers? Well, I'm not here as a student, Professor Sanders. No? What are you here as? An investigator. Investigator? Are you from the police? No, no, no. I'm a private investigator. I've been retained to, uh, look into the, well, the death of your wife. I'm sorry, Mr. Chambers. I don't know who retained you, and I don't care. But I've told the police what I know, and that's that. There's nothing further I can add. Professor... Now, if you please, I'm a very busy man. (laughs) 
And that's how you read about it in the newspapers. Stubborn Professor Stanley Sanders, who disclaims any knowledge of the murder of his wife, although he was home at the time. Three children, all of them up in camp. So you go to the fountainhead of information, police headquarters, and your very good friend, Detective Lieutenant Louis Parker. Ah, you're mixed up in a rough one this time, Petey, my lad. Louie, Louie, what happened there? Exactly what happened there? Well, all we got is Professor Stanley Sanders' story. All right, what's the story? Well, it's about a week ago. Uh-huh. It's a warm night. Three kids are off at camp. Uh-huh. Professor is alone with his wife at their home in the Bronx. Now, he's wearing slacks and a sweatshirt. Look, Louie, I'm not interested in the sartorial well, effect. be interested. Well, why must because I be... Because it's got a bearing on the case. All right, all right. All right, okay, okay all, all right. Okay. Well, about ten minutes before the murder happens, Professor Sanders is seen strolling outside in the slacks and the sweatshirt. Then he goes into the house. The rest is his story. All right, what is his story? Well, the wife was in the kitchen. He went upstairs, the bedroom, to read... So, according to him, he hears sounds of a scuffle. He runs downstairs and he gets hit a hard blow on the neck. Knocks him out. When he comes to, his wife is on the kitchen floor. Stabbed 15 times. She's dead. Sweatshirt he was wearing, it's gone. Missing. And so? So, that's the story, period. Guy himself, the professor, absolutely refuses to cooperate any further. Well, what's he got to cooperate about? Oh, now listen hard, Mr. Peep, and try and think like a grown-up detective. I'm listening, Master. Look, I'm a harness bull. I don't do the glamour routine like uh, you I guys. I said I was listening, Louis. All right. It's an isolated home on Staten Island. Wife stabbed to death. Nobody home except him and the missus. Kitchen knife missing, sweatshirt missing right off his body. And what are your ideas on that? Well, only that the sweatshirt was bloodstained. He got rid of it together with the knife. We accuse him. He refuses to talk except to deny the murder. We want him to take a lie detector test. Refuses, absolutely. Now, what would you think, Pete? Well, don't ask me, Louis. I'm a glamour boy. You're the harness bull. It's your thinking that counts. Well, I think the guy's guiltier than seven devils in Hades. Well, why don't you lock him up? Because there's one thing missing. And that? Motive, my boy. Motive for murder. Oh. That we ain't got. So, so far, all we can do is accuse him and holler and papers make a big stink about it. Without motive, we're hamstrung, Pete. Yeah, I suppose you are. What else you got, Louie, that the uh, newspapers haven't got? Oh, now, look, oh, Come sonny. on, Louie, it's confidential. It's always confidential. I've been retained on this thing. I'm working. Whatever I dig up, I turn into you. So, uh, no bless oblige. Tit for tat. Come on. <laughs> all right. Take a look. Search of the house disclosed these. First note, typewritten note. Let me see it. Yeah. Let's see. Look out for yourself. You'll be sorry. And it's signed by initials SS. SS. Stanley Sanders. And a couple of weeks ago, he was out of town, so it figures that he wrote her this nice, sweet little letter. We found it in her handbag. And what's the rest of this stuff? Menus. Menus. Mm-hmm. Menus from restaurants, nightclubs. Looks like she was one of them collectors, you know, menus. Can I see that? Yeah, help yourself, detective. Thank you, detective. Don't mention it, detective. One of the menus uh, sort of tickles at you. It tickles at you fit to bust. It's from the Casino Rouge, a hotshot nightclub over on the east side. So you take your leave of your beloved harness bull, but you're too early for the Casino Rouge, so you try Professor Sanders again. There's absolutely nothing I can tell you, Mr. Chambers. Nothing that I haven't already told the police. Well, what about that note, Professor, that uh, typewritten note that they attribute to you? I didn't write that note. Then why don't you submit to a lie detector test? Because there's no reason to submit to it. I'm not a criminal. I've lived an exemplary life all my life. I have three children whom I adore. I'm not riffraff, scum. There's no reason to submit to a lie detector test. I've told the police exactly what occurred, exactly what happened that night. Well, do you have any explanation for the disappearance of your sweatshirt right off your back? No. Well, what about the kitchen knife, which in this case seems to be the murder weapon? I have no explanation for that. But it's not my province to find explanations. That's the business of the police. Well, Prof, do you, uh... Know a lady by name of Elaine Janis? Yes. Yes, I know her. She teaches at the university. 
Look, Professor, how did you get along with your wife? Was Mr. There any... Chambers, I consider that an impertinent question and one that will end this interview right now. Good day to you, sir, and please don't trouble to come back. So, that evening, you're an early nightclubber. Casino Rouge goes into action late, but you're early. Sebastian Slocum owns a joint, affectionately known as Sibby to the Joes in the note. But you're not interested in Sibby, not now. Now you're interested in a slick chick who goes by the name of Carmen LaRose. She used to be nuts about her boss, and maybe she still is, but... Anyway, you ask around for her. She's a singer of the joint. Have you been looking for me, Hanson? Carmen LaRose. Tall, dark, and electric. Plenty of voltage. Voltage like a third rail. I hear you've been asking around for me, Petey boy. Yeah, I've been asking around. Tell you something, kiddo. I've been asking around for you. Like how? I called your office a couple times when I got the chance. Well, who's been stopping you? Nobody. And what do you mean when you got the chance? Sibby. He's been close to me, so close to yeah, me. Yeah, and you hate him for that, huh? Yes, I hate him. I hate him. I call you, but you are not in. Uh, I've been working on a case. What's uh, with you and Sibby? I thought you were nuts about that mug. No more. I hate him. And I am scared, pretty scared stiff. I, I don't know if he knows, but I thought... I don't know if he knows. You don't, you don't... know if I know what, my little boy... Well, how are you doing, Sibby, my little boy? I don't like you in my place of business, Snooper. Me, Sibby, my little boy? I don't like no coppers in my place of business. I'm no copper, Sibby. To me, you're a copper. My little boy, Sibby. Sebastian Slocum. Six feet tall, Latin type, lover type. Sleek, slim, and dapper with wild black eyes that look like they need four alarms to put out the blaze. So kindly do me a very small favor. For you, Sibby, anytime. Get out of my place look, of business. Sibby, will you Get look? out of here. Hey, it's still a free country, Sibby. Free country, sure. Place of business, that ain't free. So get going, Snooper. Get out of here. And if I don't, my little boy... Then I help you. Mike, Jack! What do you mean, you... Hey! Get him out! Get him out! Have uh, you ever been bounced out of a nightclub? Happens to the best of people. Makes you a member of a very select circle. Anyway, you get up and you brush your clothes and you have a small debate with yourself. Do you go back and break up the joint? Or do you keep punching at your business? You have a tough tussle with your alter ego, but business wins out. So, once more, you go where you aren't wanted, to the home of Professor Sanders. But there you learn that he's been picked up, arrested for the murder of his wife. So you hightail it down to headquarters and you're ushered into Parker's office, and there they are. The good lieutenant, the professor, and what do you know? Elaine Janice. Okay, Pete, we got the whole story. We even know that Miss Janice retained you to help our professor here. Well, you said you didn't have enough on him, Louie, until you had a motive. Which is what we got right now. Plenty of motive. Like what? Like love. Love? Mm-hmm. That's motive for murder? It is when you're in love with the wrong party. I had to tell them, Mr. Chambers. I had to talk. I couldn't hold it any longer. Holding it back was... Well, it was like lying. Yeah, but you... Th and they should know everything. They should know the truth. Truth? What truth? Dear Professor Sanders and dear teacher here are very much in love. The professor asked his wife for divorce. His wife refused. Good enough, Detective. Do we have a motive? You see, he didn't do it. I'm perfectly confident. And I want you to know everything, but but he didn't kill her. You want to talk, Professor? I've told you all I intend to tell you. I'll add that I did ask my wife for a divorce and that she refused. But I didn't kill her. As to that, I've given you all the facts. Now, are you in love with Miss Janice here? I am, and I would like to marry her. But I'm not a murderer. I have three children. And it's my intention to try to save them from any possible scandal. Is that why you wouldn't talk? I didn't kill her. That's all I have to say, except I should like to call my lawyer. You don't need a lawyer to answer the simple question. And so it goes deep into the night. 
They put the grill on Professor Sanders, but he clams tighter than a teenager's evening gown. And finally, when Parker throws his hands up in disgust, you get out of there. And where to? Casino Rouge. You owe a debt there. Your dignity's been bruised, among other things. But you're late. Carmen La Rose left with Sebastian Slocum. You throw the bartender a couple of tens, and you learn that Carmen lives up at Rye Beach, a little shack up at Rye Beach. It takes you a half hour to get there, and then you mosey over to a window, and you make with the gander. And there they are, drinking it up, the two of them. The window's locked from the inside, but you can hear... Nothing, Sibby. I didn't see nothing. I don't know what you're talking about. You can tell me, honey. I don't care if you saw. But I want to know. I don't want you holding out on Sibby. Uh-huh. Here. No. Here, have a little belt. Have a little belt on Sibby. Ah, oh, you wouldn't hurt me, Sibby. You wouldn't do me no harm, huh? Wouldn't hurt a hair on your head, my little boy. Now, come on. Loosen up. Uh, did you tell me that night? Yeah. Yeah, I did. I was crazy jealous, Sibby, on that phony society dame. You were a toy to her, a plaything, and you were thinking she would divorce a guy for you. Shut up. Okay. Okay. I'm shouting. Don't ask me no more, Sibby. No more. I don't want to talk no more. I didn't see nothing. I don't want to talk no more. Don't you worry, my little boy. You ain't going to talk no more. Never. The guy pulls a knife that looked like it's a foot long. Ah! You go into action. You crash the window. <coughs> and you are in action. Get up. He's tough, but he's not tough enough. And when you're finished... <coughs> He's stretched out, cool and comfortable, and nobody's going to hear from Sebastian Slocum until he gets dialed in. But meanwhile, you've got Carmen LaRose on your hands, and I mean on your hands. Hold me, Petey. Kiss me. Carmen. I'm afraid. Hold me, please. Now, easy, Hold me. easy does it, Carmen girl. Take Hold it me. Easy. Kiss me. What's going on here? Kiss me, please. Look, Carmen, my little boy, this isn't the time. It's not the place. It is. Not... It is when I am frightened. When when I am frightened, I am like a little child. Please yeah, but... kiss me. Please, 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 please. Okay, okay, okay. Oh. And now, um... Yes. Talk it up, sister. Oh, yes, I will. Once, once I love him. I thought I love him. No more, huh? No more. He is like Tomcat. Women, he does not care. Anyway, this one came. This one, for once, he is entangled. A society thing. This professor's wife, this, uh, Mrs. Sanders. Yeah, 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 yeah. She lead him on. She lead him by the nose. She is one to enjoy, but she does not become entangled. So then, Sibby talks to the wife, and she laughs in his face. She says she is happy, protected as a married woman. So? So, later on, he types note to her from Casino Rouge office. He thinks I do not see it, but I see it. I see a threatening note. And she comes then to the club. And again she laughs at him. She laughs right in his face. And then? Then last week he goes there. I go after him. He does not know it, but I am tailing him because I want to know. I want to see. The husband is upstairs. I am by the kitchen window. They fight. They argue. And he kills her. Butchers her with kitchen knife. The husband comes down the stairs. Sibby, wait behind the door. Slugs him. He falls near her. There is blood on his shirt. That Sibby takes the shirt off him, takes the knife, and he goes. You got any idea why he took the sweatshirt? I imagine to make something that cannot be uh, explained. I imagine to put the suspicion on the husband. Yeah, yeah, yeah. To... I imagine that you imagine pretty good, my little one. Ah. So now, please hold me. Please kiss me. Hey. I am afraid. Oh, please. And so once more you're at police headquarters. Sebastian Slocum is confined to the calaboose. Carmen LaRose is held as a material witness. 
And Professor Sanders, free as a lark, is in Parker's office with Elaine Janice. And you, you're listening. Professor, I don't get you. I simply don't understand. He is a good, dear, fine man. Yeah, but he almost got himself fried in the hot seat, clamming up like he did. Oh, there are all kinds of people, Lieutenant. Yeah, there certainly must be. Scandal, Lieutenant. I shudder at it. I have three children. So you told me over and over and over. Let me give you a little background, Lieutenant. My father was a minister. My mother a devout woman, a social worker. I was brought up very strictly. I am, in essence... An old-fashioned man. So? You knew about Slocum? He came to you to ask for your okay for divorce. Why didn't you tell us? Scandal again, Lieutenant. Bad enough, she was dead. I wasn't going to heap scandal upon scandal. My children, my community, my students. Oh, what a guy. Yes, he's the dearest, finest Yes, but not taking the lie to take the test, holding out on your affection for Miss Janice here, and holding out on that Sebastian Slocum thing, and that, that note, the typewritten note. Weren't you worried, man? Not for a moment, Lieutenant. As I said, I am a devout man. I knew that one way or another, truth would out. (laughs) Yeah, truth would out. Thanks to the crazy operations of this crazy private eye. Thank you, Louis. Well then, Lieutenant, may we go? And peace go with you, Professor. You're quite a guy. Bye, Miss Janice. Bye now, Lieutenant. Thank you, Mr. Chambers. Thank you very much. Bye now. What a man. <laughs> yes, sir. There's a certain simplicity, a certain integrity. you got to hand it to him. Yeah, I suppose you have to. All right, now let's get to you. What sent you off to that Casino Rouge? Well, you did, Louis. Me? Yeah, you. Well, like how? How did I send you? Well, maybe I'm a little bit of a rounder, more than you, let's say, but I knew that the Casino Rouge was owned by Sebastian Slocum. So? What's that got to do with it? Well, that note you showed me. Here, let me see it again. I'll show you. Yeah, sure. There you See, it's a typewritten note. Mind you, a typewritten note. Mm-hmm. Now, it reads, Look out for yourself, you'll be sorry, and it's signed by initials S.S. That's right, S.S., Stanley Sanders. Professor Stanley Sanders. Also, S.S. for Sebastian Slocum, which it turned out to be. Well, how in the heck did you know that? Psychology, Louis, psychology. First, ask any married man in the world, if he drops his wife a note, would he type it? The answer is no. Plus, and this is even more incontrovertible psychologically... Incontrovertible? Well, never mind, never mind. What husband in the world would sign a note to his wife by both his initials? Yeah. Yeah, you've got a point there. A husband would sign by his first name, perhaps even by his first initial. But think, no husband is that formal with his wife. Both initials. It just didn't figure psychologically. And that plus the menu from Casino Rouge plus... S.S. owns Casino Room. Yeah, and it sure tickled me, Louie, in the right place. <laughs> Look, pal, can I say something? Louie, you can say anything. Well, for once, I'd like to go on record with a statement. You know, people make jokes about routine hardest cops like myself and the glamour boys, you guys, private eyes. So I'd like to go on record with a statement. All right, now hit me easy, Louie. I'm not going to hit you at all, Pete. All I want to say for the record, Harness Bull, private eye... Well done, young man. Very well done indeed. And there you've had crime and Peter Chambers. Dane Clark was starred as Peter Chambers. Crime and Peter Chambers Transcribed was created and written by Henry Kane. Others in the cast were Bill Zuckert, heard as Lieutenant Parker, Mary Patton as Carmen, and Bill Lally as Dr. Shepman. It was directed by Fred Way. This is Fred Collins inviting you to tune in next week, same time, same station, for Dane Clark in Crime and Peter Chambers.
with us again next week at this same time for another adventure by Peter Chambers in Crime and Peter Chambers. This is the United States Armed Forces Radio and Television Service. by Henry Kane, transcribed and starring as Peter Chambers, Dane Clark. Your private eye. That's your business. Anything else? That's for laughs. It's been raining cats and dogs and assorted animals for three long, wet, miserable days. Happens. And today it clears. So you're heading for the polo grounds in a view of your beloved giants. But first you call the office and there's a message. And Mr. Winston Carr wants to see you at his Park Avenue apartment. So, business is business. Winston Carr, he's got enough loot to run his own little private Marshall plan. Winston Carr, Stockbroker Deluxe. You kiss off the Giants, you wish him luck, and your special young man, Willie Mays. And then you've got your finger on the door buzzer of Mr. Carr's Cloud High Penthouse apartment. Mr. Chambers? Peter Chambers? That's right, sir. I answer the door myself. Servants stay off. <laughs> You'll pardon my attire. He's a massive man and a handsome one. Maybe 60 with white hair and a white mustache, but he's got a youthful twinkle in his eye. He's dressed in an ancient bathrobe, and he leads you through to a room that's half bedroom, half den. And then he plumps out in a soft bed. Bad heart, Mr. Chambers. Bad ticker. It's been acting up. I've been catering to it. Haven't been out of the apartment all day. Been lying about pampering myself. Haven't even changed my suit. See? Hanging there. That's the suit I was wearing yesterday. That's nice, that's nice. Uh, what's that got to do with me? <laughs> There's an envelope there in that suit. Uh, I want you to deliver it. And for that, you need a Private Richard? Private Richard? <laughs> that's a cute term. Never heard it before. Private Richard, Private Eye, Confidential Agent. It all adds up to the same thing usually, a patsy. You're rather a cynical one, aren't you, sir? No, but maybe I'm in a bad humor. I was looking forward to seeing the Giants this afternoon. The Giants, my favorite ball club. I'm quite a fan. <laughs> couldn't resist business, could you, Mr. Chambers? Matter of fact, I couldn't. Can you, Mr. Carr? Well, business, young man, is business. And let's get to it right now. Though since you've made a sacrifice in coming here, your fee is hereby doubled. And how much was it single? A hundred dollars, now two hundred. For what, Mr. Carr? For delivering an envelope. Delivering an envelope? Sort of a glorified messenger boy, wouldn't you say? Well, it's important and valuable. And your reputation is such that I know I can trust you with it. And whom do I deliver it to? Henry Martell at his apartment, 1020 Central Park West. He should be waiting for it. I promised it for this afternoon. 
Am I to get a receipt? Oh, no, no, no receipt necessary. You see, Mr. Martell is about to be engaged to my daughter. Daughter? My daughter, Loretta. Only child, very dear to me. Only real thing dear to me since my good wife died. Anyway, Mr. Martell is going into business, and uh, I'm sort of helping him with the contents of that envelope. I'm not quite up to delivering it myself today, so... Okay, Mr. Carr, I'm to deliver an envelope. Where is it? In the inside jacket pocket, Mr. Chambers. Yep, yep, right there. That's it, that's it. And uh, from my wallet, please help yourself to $200. So, out of a clean, white, unwrinkled Palm Beach suit, you take the envelope, your fee, and you wave bye-bye to Winston Carr. And then you're out in the sunshine and up to Central Park West, and once more you're poking your finger at a doorbell. This one over an engraved card... Mr. Henry Martell. Well, 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 it just wouldn't be legitimate if you didn't show up, would it, huh? You've never seen Henry Martell, but you know it isn't he who's answered the door. Because the guy in the doorway is an old friend and a good one. Detective Lieutenant Louis Parker, Homicide, New York City Police. Like I said, without you, my case wouldn't be complete. What kind of a case, Louis? Murder, my friend. Who's murder, my friend? Henry Martell. Martell? Mm Mm-hmm. You're not kidding me, are you, Louis? With murder, you don't kid. Come on in, son. Cops working over a cadaver. There's hardly any blood on him. He must have been a good-looking lad. Tall with dark, wavy hair and high cheekbones. Cops are cops and a cadaver is a cadaver. But there's one incongruous note in the room. A sobbing blonde standing near the window, teetering like a drunk on a tightrope. Pete. Yeah, Louie. You happen to know the dame? Uh, No. Who is she? Says she's Loretta Carr. Says she's the daughter of that mogul, Winston Carr. Oh, Loretta Carr. Did uh, she kill him? She says she didn't. Haven't questioned her closely yet. As you can see, she's uh, standing there like she's going to faint. I'm giving her a little time to settle down. How did uh, he get it? Bullets. And this gun right here. No prints on it. We got the call from the girl, this Loretta. Claimed she dropped in on him for cocktails or something. Door was open. Found him like that. Dead. Gun on the floor. Is it uh, possible that it was suicide? No. No, Pete. The gun was 20 feet away from him. Guy doesn't shoot himself and then die and then throw the gun away. No. Uh, looks like my boys are finished. Let me get them out of here. Okay, fellas, I'll see you downtown. And the body goes too. I'll talk to you after the autopsy, Doc. Okay. Uh, now, Miss Carr, just a few short questions, sir. Huh? Yes, yes, Lieutenant. Oh, uh, Loretta Carr, this is, uh, this is Peter Chambers. Oh, how do you do, Miss Carr? How, how do you do? Miss Carr, we know all the details of your finding him, calling the thing into us. Now, what were you doing here? I mean, how uh, how well did you know her? I knew Henry, Mr. Martell, for the for the past six months. We we were going to be engaged to be married. I can verify that, Louis. Ah, uh, just wait your turn. Huh? I'm I'm saving you for later. Okay, Miss Carr, how old are you? Twenty. Mm-hmm. How old was Mr. Martell? Thirty-five. Well, did you, uh, did you have your parents' consent to this uh, prospective engagement? Just, just one parent, sir. My my father. Well, did you, uh, did you have his consent? At at first, at, at at first he objected, but then he came around to my way of thinking. And what were his objections at first? That Mr. Martell was too old for me. That that he wasn't. Exactly the type of person that he'd imagined I'd fallen up with. Oh, you, you, you know how fathers are. Yeah, yeah. But, but slowly, slowly, I, I won him over. And, th- and then we had his consent. I see. Now, how'd you meet uh, Mr. Martell? I, I was introduced to him at a cocktail party. Okay, Miss Carr, that about does it for now. You, you can go home, but please be available, huh? Thank you, Lieutenant. <laughs> And now, Peter Pan, what the heck are you doing here, anyway? 
You bring him up to date fast. He gives you full concentration, nodding his head up and down like a small boy watching a bouncing act on a trampoline. And then... Uh Uh-huh. Mm-hmm. Okay, let's have it. Uh, uh, have what, Lieutenant? You know what. The envelope. Envelope, Lieutenant? Come on, come on. It's a murder case I'm working on. This ain't a game of badminton. Oh, badminton yet. These modern cops are all right, Lieutenant. The envelope. Mm. Naughty, naughty. You're opening other people's mail. Hey. Pete, you know what's in this? Love Sonnet by William Shakespeare. 100,000 bananas. $100,000 bills, cash money. Wow. Oh, he certainly did approve of his prospective son-in-law, didn't he, Louis? All right, you've done your bit. You've delivered your envelope. Police will take possession for the time being. I'll go up to the old man personally, explain the situation. And what do I do in the meantime? No, you go to a ball game or something. It's too late for the ball game. Oh, that woolly maid. Well, then go to your office and sit and pray. Maybe business will fall in. <laughs> Business didn't fall in. It wafted across the wires of Alexander Bell's invention. Oh, was that Don Amici? Hello. I want you to come down here right away. Who wants me to come where and why? Me. Well, who that? Hey, I'd be Morse. Don't you know my voice? You're supposed to be a private eye. Maybe I am a private eye. I'm not a private ear. What's on your alleged mind? I want you to come down here. Where's here? My office. Right away. What's the matter, Herbie? Trouble. What else? When I call on you, it ain't so you should teach me to mumble. Now, come on, pal. Get on your horse. You get on your horse and you're traveling again. Herbie Moss. Big shot. Bookmaker's bookmaker. Commission brokers, they call him. Herbie Moss, angle guy from way back. Slippery as a lemon pit in olive oil. His office is a fancy spread on lower Broadway. Well, the old charmer, as handsome as ever. Come in, come in. You're going to earn yourself a hunk of change. Herbie Moss. About 40 and not bad looking. And dressed, of course, in the latest of hand tailoring. Okay, I come right to the point. And what's the point? Waste your fee. 500 clams, which I hand over like so. Well, thank you, Herbie. You've made your first point. Now what? Ever hear of Martel? Henry Martel? What about him? He got cool this afternoon. That's what about him. What's that got to do with you? Nothing, not a thing, except it's my gun he happens to get cooled with. Your gun? Nobody else's, pal. My gun, Herbie Moss. Cops know about this? They trace it to me quick, and they yank me in. So what are you doing out? My lawyer gets me out. One of them writs, habeas, habeas, what do I know? I'm out, but I ain't in the clear. That's your job, to put me in the clear. You, uh, kill him, Herbie? No, I did not kill him. You know him, this Henry Martell? No, I uh, never hated a bum in my life. Herbie, my boy, just for the record, if I find that you are mixed up in this, I turn you in anyway. And you're stuck with the $500 fee. I am mixed up in nothing, I tell you. All right. I lent that heater to a dame. When? About uh, six months ago. Who's the doll? Doll is right. Don't trip over that, pal. That's dynamite. Joyce Doreen, a model. Tall, dark, and with a shape. Oh, brother. All right, all right. What's the address? It's in the phone book. And let me tell you, I've seen them all, big and small. But this Joyce Doreen... Next stop, Joyce Doreen. It's a terrace apartment on Madison Avenue, and the good Miss Doreen must have been taking the sun on the terrace because she opens the door for you, wearing high-heeled white shoes, white swimming briefs, a white bandana, and that's all. That is all. I'm glad you called me first, Mr. Chambers. I was going to go out, but instead I reserved this time for you. Well, you said it was urgent. Oh, that Joyce Doreen. You take black eyes, black hair, red lips, and then you dream up a lush figure, and you put it on the longest, shapeliest legs you've ever seen, and there you have it. Joyce Doreen. 
Will you tell me what this is all about, Mr. Chambers? You tell her. You're doing a lot of staring and a lot of gasping, but in between gasps, you tell her. I want to thank you, Mr. Chambers, for coming to me so quickly. Well, what else could I do, Miss Doreen? Herb Moss claims that gun was here. Police don't know about that yet, but sooner or later they will, and then, little lady, you'll be all jammed up. Oh, but I'm sure there's some mistake. Why? Because that gun's been in that bureau drawer since Herb lent it to me. I never even touched it. Let me show you. Oh! What's the matter? It's gone! Mr. Chambers, Mr. Chambers, you must help me. Now, I would like to retain you. I'll pay you a fee if you'll just help Fees me. Fees have just been pouring down on me like hailstones. But... For you, honey, for you, it's for free. But you've got to answer a couple of questions, and you've got to answer them truthfully. Oh, yes, yes, whatever you say. First, how well do you know this Herbie Moss? Oh, as well as I know any other man. He was attentive to me. Period. And were you, uh, attentive to him, period? Not more so than to anyone else. I have many male friends. But there's never been anyone special. Not yet, huh? No. Not yet. Uh, do, do you know Henry Martell? Ah, uh, yes. Was he attentive to? <laughs> Very. Did Herbie Moss know Henry Martell? Yes, he did. He did, huh? Why? Is there something wrong with that? Uh, no, no, uh, nothing. I... Was Herbie Moss fond of Henry Martell? He hated him. Hated him, huh? You know why? <laughs> well, I, uh... Well, in all modesty, I... Oh, come on, Mr. Reen, you can tell me. Well... Herbie was jealous of Henry. In fact, Herb and I terminated our friendship because of his crazy jealousy of Henry Martell. Did you happen to know that Martell, uh, well, that he had a girlfriend to whom he was going to be engaged? I heard that he'd been running around with some little girl. Mm. And were you jealous, Miss Perrine? Me? <laughs> Me jealous? Oh, look, Mr. Chambers, as I've told you, I have many male friends. Young and old, flip and distinguished. And as far as I'm concerned, you can lump them all together. Faithfully, you promise to keep her abreast of events. And then you make tracks for Parker's office to sort of catch up on events yourself. Pete, my boy, that's the sum and total of it. Herbie Morse is our number one suspect, but we just don't have enough to hold him. What about this Henry Martell? Well, what about him? Well, what kind of a guy? Well, he's a fringe guy, man about town. Strictly a phony, a lived by the wits guy. Never arrested, never convicted. He had a few brushes with the law. Oh? Mm, the last time uh, <laughs> when he belted a private eye. Belted a private eye? Who? Barry Miller. A couple of months ago when you were on the West Coast, claimed the eye was tailing him, annoying him. You know? Anything else? No, nothing. Louis, you ever hear of Joyce Doreen? Am I supposed to? Well, I don't know yet. Well, find out for me sometime, huh? Lieutenant, I intend to do just that. Ah. Uh, it starts. Already it begins to make with a dame, huh? Beat around town, digging up dirt on Henry Martell, and then you start hiking for Joyce Doreen's place. You'd like to give her apartment a quick look-see, and you wonder how you can make it. So, it gets made for you. You're outside her door, and you can hear the finish of an argument, inside. And I say you use my gun to knock him off, and like that you put me in a spot. I'd like to punch you right square on the jaw. You wouldn't well, I wouldn't. I wouldn't. Herbie comes tearing out and goes past you without even a friendly howdy-do. And you mosey in, and there's Miss Doreen laid out neat and comfortable. She'll come to in time, but this isn't the time. You give the apartment a quick frisk, and you come up with... Guess what? A little old address book. Gal wouldn't be a gal without a little old address book. You look through it, and bang, your case opens up and unfolds for you. You get out of there, and you call Parker, and you're told that Parker's at Carr's place. So that's your next stop. 
Winston Carr's in bed, and Parker's near talking to him. Loretta let you in, and then went away. And Parker's a little peeved. You again? What are you doing here? I'm wrapping up your case for you, Louis. Like how? Like giving you the murderer. And who would that be, Mr. Chambers? You, Mr. Winston Carr. Oh, easy, Petey boy. Do you know what you're doing? I know what I'm doing, all right. Now, how do you want Louis right side up or wrong side under? Any way at all, as long as it makes sense. Well, I'll do it straight first, and then I'll tack the evidence onto it. Any way you like, Detective. Winston Carr with an only daughter. Apple of his eye. She latches onto a phony. Carr tries to talk her out. She won't be talked. Carr puts a private eye on him and gets convinced that Martell is a phony. Private eye? Uh Uh-huh. At Barry Miller? How could you people know that? Quiet, Mr. Carr. Let him talk. Now, Carr pretends he okays the engagement of his daughter, but he sounds out Martell. Martell wants 100 G's as an out price. But Carr is a businessman, so he goes there and he shoots him. How am I doing, Mr. Carr? Very well, young man. Too well. Mm. I... I can't fight this. I'm too old and... Too sick. But I won't knuckle under either. It's evidence that convicts. Oh, you want evidence. All right, listen. Now, here's a businessman, Louis, that says he's going to help his prospective son-in-law in business. Now, how would he do it? Not by a hundred thousand dollars in cash? Of course not. It would be a check or nothing. Well, then why? As a cover-up. After he knocked them off, he used me to deliver a hundred G's to Martell, supposed to show that he had affection for the guy, you know. Now, he used me as a delivery boy, strictly as a cover-up. He's in bed all day. He says he didn't even change out of yesterday's suit. Well, take a look, Lieutenant. There's the suit hanging there. Okay. I'm looking. Palm Beach suit, clean, white, unwrinkled. It's been worn, but it wasn't worn yesterday. It was worn today. Pete, how do you know? Because it was pouring cats and dogs yesterday. And if he wore it in that rain, it wouldn't be clean, white, and unwrinkled. All right, enough. What about the gun? Look, if Herbie Moss used that gun, you think he'd be crazy enough to leave it there? Well, then where did this guy get? He stole it out of a bureau drawer. What bureau drawer? Doll by name, Joyce Doreen. Oh. Herbie gave her the gun, and Carr here lifted it from her. Convince her? Well, here's a little old address book, Louie. Belongs to Joyce Doreen... And under the initial C, guess whose name is there, big as life. All right, enough. 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 So, after Carr gets put on ice, surrounded by high-priced lawyers, and after you've made your report to Herbie Moss, you wend your way to Miss Doreen's apartment. And you tell her she's out of the mess... And you're about to give her details when... Oh, no. No, Mr. Chambers. Not so fast. Uh Let's do it nice and easily. Well... Now, you just sit down while I build a highball. Two highballs. Two nice, long, leisurely highballs. Now, just sit and wait. Oh, that joy story. Did you say something? Uh, I didn't say a thing, honey. I'm just sitting and waiting. And there you've had crime and Peter Chambers. Dane Clark was starred as Peter Chambers. Crime and Peter Chambers transcribed was created and written by Henry King. Others in the cast were Bill Zuckert, heard as Lieutenant Parker, Leslie Wood as Joyce, and Roger DeCoven as Winston Carr. It was directed by Fred Way. This is Fred Collins inviting you to tune in next week, same time, same station, for Dane Clark in Crime and Peter Chambers.
This is the United States Armed Forces Radio and Television Service. Created by Henry Kane, transcribed and starring as Peter Chambers, Dane Clark. Your private eye, that's your business. Anything else, that's for laughs. You're not an early go-to-better, but... This night, for a change, you've hit the sack fairly early. You've turned, you've twisted, you've beaten at the pillow, and finally you're firmly entwined with the first of your usual tortured nightmares when... Oh. Oh. Huh? Yeah, uh, it's Peter Chambers. Oh, yeah, yeah. Uh Oh, yeah. Well, all right. All right already. What is it? A mustache? Okay, I'll be there. Yeah. I'll get dressed and I'll be there as quickly as possible. Goodbye. Your midnight telephone caller is Miss Claire Connolly, press agent for a nightclub with the unusual name of uh, the Hot Spot. She worried about a small event that took place there maybe a half hour ago, a little thing called murder. Seems that the main attraction at the club, the band leader by name Johnny Silver, probably the most fabulously successful band leader in America, caught up with a slight but deadly dose of lead poisoning. You throw on some clothes and you hot foot it to the hot spot. Claire Connolly is waiting for you outside. First thing I want you to do, Pete, I, I want you to look the joint over. Just so you know what the setup is. Well, it should have been looked over plenty by now. Don't you have cops? Cops? The place is stinking with cops. She leads you in and you do what she asks you to do. You look. The hot spot on 54th and 5th, a joint that's really jumping, owned by an ex-gangster named George Black, who doesn't have the gangster anymore for a living. This hot spot is doing better legitimately than he can ever do illegitimately. Seems the excitement is over and the suckers are back eating and drinking and having a good time. Clara takes you up to the office and there's nobody there except you and Clara. Now you've seen the joint. I've seen it before, honey. I wanted you to get a good look at the layout. Like I said, I've seen it before. Dim lighting, a lot of atmosphere, bandstand for Johnny Silver's orchestra, and then the stage for Rita Dupre's dancing group, and then the customers seated around little tables, and upstairs a balcony running all around the joint. That's where he got it from, the balcony. Uh, how, what, and when? Maybe a half, three quarters of an hour ago. 
Johnny Silver's on stage with his band, doing his latest composition, talking back to the blues. Suddenly there's a shot from the balcony and Johnny keels over, dead. And the gun? It was flung down from the balcony. Nobody touched it. Where is it now? The cops have it. And who, perchance, was on the balcony? No customers, if that's what you mean. This has been a comparatively quiet night. George Black seats nobody up here, not unless the downstairs is overcrowded. Now, let me see. He gets it from upstairs here, from the balcony. No customers. So it figures for an inside job. Yeah, it's pretty good for this hour of the night, huh? Good enough, since it's exactly what the police say. Who's in charge of the shindig? An old friend of yours, and a good friend of yours, Detective Lieutenant Louis Parker. Oh, the best, honey, absolutely the best. And, uh, now, my sweet, why me? I beg your pardon? Well, why pull me out of bed, unless it's sort of to uh, save your own skin? <gasps> We've been friends, Pete. We were very good friends a long time ago. Yeah. That was a long time ago. Now, uh, we're, uh, friends. Well, it's, it's been established that he was killed by George Black's gun, for which George has a license, of course. The gun was kept in an open drawer, right here upstairs in, in this office. And I can come and go here as I please. So, that, uh, makes you a suspect? Not entirely. But I know that I was heard to threaten him. Whom? Johnny Silver. When? Last night. Where? Right here. In this office. By whom? By Rita Dupre. Well, let's hear about that. Uh, there's not much to hear. I found out that Johnny'd been doing a terrible thing. To? Eddie Gale. Eddie Gale. Oh, used to be a drummer with Johnny's band, mm-hmm. his arranger. And then he retired, no? Yeah. Eddie's always here at the hot spot. He's here tonight. Anyway, when I found out what Johnny'd been doing to Eddie, I, I talked to him. To Johnny, here in his office. I'm Johnny's press agent, too. Anyway, the upshot of it was a, an argument. Johnny fired me. Oh? But that wasn't all. Suddenly, he, he made a pass at me. We struggled, and I, I remember my saying, you ought to be killed. Somebody ought to kill you. Maybe I ought to do it myself. Well, those are threats, all right. Hey, I'm a real smart detective tonight. Well, in the heat of excitement, people say things like that without meaning them. Ain't it the truth? Anyway... Rita Dupre walked in just then, dressed as usual in that sultry dancing costume of hers. She heard me. So? So she'll give the cops an earful, no question. Why? I thought you two were friends. Not anymore. Not when she saw me tussling with Johnny. Oh, you mean that uh, Rita Dupre and Johnny Silver... I thought that was a press agent's concoction. It was. But she began to believe her notices. Happens? It's a real cockeyed setup. George Black brought her here from the West Coast because he's nuts about her. He tells me to play up a phony romance between Johnny and Rita for the newspapers. She really starts going for Johnny. And George starts to do a slow burn. And then Johnny... Uh, Johnny suddenly starts going for me. A real merry-go-round. And a deadly one. But I didn't kill him, Pete. Believe me. Well, what about that Eddie Gale deal? What did he tell you? But right there, you get an interruption. An interruption in tandem. George Black and Detective Lieutenant Louis Parker. Well, Petey Chambers. Hi, Louis. (laughs) I'll go to my grave and you'll pop up, huh? What are you doing here, Petey? Business, formal retainer. By Miss Claire Connolly, services to be rendered. She may need those services. I'd like to talk with you, Miss Connolly. Outside, please. Certainly, Lieutenant. So, you're left alone with George Black. George Black. Big, powerful, and, uh... Slightly sinister. Well, as long as you're here, pal, you can work for me, too. Uh, Like how? Like so. Here you are, pal. I'll take 500 bucks worth of your services. And the nature of such services, uh, pal? Keeping me out of the jam jar. How far are you in the jam jar? Uh, Look, my gun killed him. Everybody around here knows I hated his guts. Because why, Daddy-O? Because I don't like nobody fiddling with my girl. Rita Dupre? Who else? Everybody always blames a guy rather than a gal. I get this straight. I don't care about everybody. I care about me. I'm stuck on Rita, so I can't blame her. But that Johnny Silver, I warned him to lay off. Like telling a fly to lay off molasses. Oh, Excuse me. Uh, Rita, baby, come on in. Come on in, sweetie. Re 
Lolita Dupre. Nobody's been stacked like that since Cleopatra. Black hair, black eyes, a patrician nose, glistening red lips, and a costume, wow we. It's a dance costume. Red gloves to the elbows, red silk stockings to the hips, and the rest of it all red sequins and briefer than a shrunken bikini. Beautiful, ain't she? Yeah, yeah. She always walk around like this in uh, the uh, costume? Yes, I do. It's crazy to keep changing. Yeah, it's crazy. My dance group goes on eight times during the evening. Uh, Rita Dupre is Peter Chambers. Oh, don't bother, George. We're well acquainted. Oh? Now, don't, don't, don't start with that jealousy jiggle. I knew her from way back, before she went to the West Coast, before she even met you. That's true. We've been acquainted for much time. George, George Black? Yeah. Uh, come on out here. My boys are back from the lab. I want to talk to you about the gun. Okay, Lieutenant. Okay, okay. Oh. And so, as must happen sooner or later, you and I are alone again. With me, my love, you can drop that phony French accent. So? I knew you when you were Rita Doberman and you were living in the Bronx. I am Rita Dupre and I was born in Paris. You are Rita Doberman you were born in the Bronx. I'm a French dancer. And you're death on wheels to all men, you think. Except I got a hunch to uh, Johnny Silver, who in turn was death on wheels to all women. The beast. Uh, you can't take it, huh? You know, you had a reputation that way, thin-skinned and deadly when you're riled up. You can dish it out, but you can't take it. What's the matter? Johnny boy push you around? I know what you're trying to do, but you're not going to trap me, not me. I did not kill him. Ask about that Claire, how she threatened him. I know all about that. So do not try to get funny with me. If so, I, I speak to George, and then they find you in the river and you're wearing a cement zoot suit. Zoot suits are old-fashioned, Rita. George Black he is an old-fashioned man. Then you and Parker are sitting in a secluded spot listening to the strains of Johnny Silver's music, without benefit of Johnny Silver, and lapping up some of George Black's scotch on the house. The minute after he was shot, practically simultaneously, the gun was thrown from the balcony. One of the waiters saw it coming down. He stood guard over it. Nobody touched it till we arrived. Now, let me get the picture, Louis. Johnny... Silver is on the bandstand playing his dreamy music. Right. He gets shot from the balcony, one shot, and he's dead. True. Then immediately the gun is flung down, George Black's gun, and a waiter stands guard over it until the cops come. <laughs> Very good, Junior. You may take two giant steps. Hmm? Fingerprints on the gun, Louis? Nothing. Not a one. Clean as a whistle. And your suspects? No customers on the balcony. Strictly an inside job. And only four people had any interest in Johnny Silver. George, Rita, Claire... And, and Eddie Gale. Yeah, yeah, Eddie Gale. And Pete, guess what's the word on him? I give up. Only yesterday, right in this joint, I got this from two different waiters. Got what? He was heard to say about Johnny Silver, I'm going to get that bum, I'm going to get him good. That's what he was heard to say. Are you sure you don't want to drink, Louis? No, thanks, Pete, now what I'm working. That's what he said. I'm going to get that bum, I'm going to get him good. Did he have access to George Black's gun? Oh, they all had access. He kept it in his office in a desk drawer. The drawer was open. Well, did you question him, this uh, Eddie Gale? Ah, he's a tough nut to handle. Nervous little guy. He's always half-loaded. Clammed with me. He stayed clammed. Do you mind if I try? <laughs> I wish you would. This one time I really wish you would. You know these musician types better than I do. <laughs> Is he around? Yeah, sure. See over there. Where? Corner table it. Oh. Little Eddie Gale. Looking like a lost soul. You meander over and you pull up a chair. Hi, Shamus. Yeah, it's a pleasure to have some pleasurable company you I like. Hey, waiter. Drink for my friend here. A couple of drinks for my friend. And a couple of drinks for my friend's friend. That's me. Eddie Gale, neatly dressed in sharp clothes, his shirt collar long and billowy. Eddie Gale, pale as death, his small wolf smile infinitely sad. Eddie Gale, small, slender, intense. 
You get the feeling you're near a high explosive with the fuse going fast. Well, he finally got it, uh, Johnny Silver. Rather am I glad. Look, they're uh, pointing the finger at you, pal. Yeah? Who's pointing a finger at me? Cops. The Johnny's knockoff? Well, he got it from George Black's gun. Oh, that's George Black's headache. No, 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 no. Guy wouldn't use his own gun. Yeah, sure he would if he wanted to as a cover-up. Then he says somebody clipped it out of his desk drawer. That drawer was always open. So was the door to his office. Well, you see what I mean? See what you mean? No, I don't get you. Well, you knew where the gun was. You knew the office door was open and the desk drawer. Yeah, but... You knew your way around this club so you can get up to the balcony, plus... Plus what? Plus, the cops have a report that only yesterday you said, I'm going to get that bum, and I'm going to get him good. And now, wait a minute, wait a minute. I was going to shoot lawyers at that bum, not bullets. Well, for what? Claire mentioned some beef you had against him, but she didn't say what. Is it, uh, because he fired you out of the band? Uh, well, that shouldn't be much. Any band would be glad to grab you. You're a great drummer and a great arranger. Uh, thanks. It ain't that. Well, you haven't been working. That's only because I don't want to work. I don't need to, see? I got plenty of scratch, Dad. And what's the beef against Johnny Silver? Ah, uh, that bum was a crook. what did he steal? You know them songs Johnny's been writing? Mm. Talking back to the blues, all of them. Johnny Silver, the great new Gershwin, the new Porter, the new Irvin Berlin. Yeah, I yeah. I wrote him. You wrote him? Me, I wrote him. Every blessed tune. You're kidding. Hope to die, Dad. Well, he was a funny kind of crook. Sweet Johnny Silver. He stole my soul, that's what he done. But he give me how to scratch. Now, wait a minute, do that a little slow already. Oh, once when I was with the band, see, I wrote a song and he thought it was great. Look, he says, look, Eddie boy, he says, it's great, it's groovy, it's got schmaltz. But you gotta have weight to throw around in the music publishing world. Then I got the weight, Eddie boy. Meaning? Meaning he had a friend, Sam August. You know, August Records, August Sheet Music. Yeah, I know well, anyways, he brings the song to Sam August, says he wrote it. He, Johnny Silver, and Sam publishes. That's how the whole deal started. All his songs? You mean all the Johnny Silver compositions Every are not... Every said one of them. I give me half the profits right in the button, but after a while, that's no good. And the money doesn't cover it. If you got pride, if you got a soul pushing inside of you, well, you, you begin to crack up. Uh, I guess so. A person needs recognition. That's it, Dad. Recognition. That's a word, Dad. What did I get? Bubkiss. That's what I got. Money. Well... After a while, you begin to get sick. So, yesterday we had a showdown. I wanted to... Uh, you know what you said, full credit recognition. You know what he told me? No. That's just what he said, no. Plus, he said that if I gave him the gate, he'd see to it that I'd never have a song published in this here town. He said I was getting half the loot, so what was I squawking about? Is that when you threatened him? Yeah. But with fireworks, not firearms. Lawyers, not bullets. Well... That's my story, Shamus. Me, a wise guy. All of a sudden, I'm a little babe and in the woods. you told all this to Claire. Sure, huh? sure, sure, I told her, and she went to bat for me. So what does he do? He fires her as a press agent. Then he makes a pass at her. He was getting sick and tired of Rita Dupre. Let me tell you something. That guy was a big nut in that dirty <laughs> Meanwhile, Parker is working hard, and he's beginning to steam like a cauldron. He puts them over the grill, one after another, until they're sizzling. Rita Dupre. I did not kill him. Yes, I will admit to a bad temper. I will admit to jealousy. I will admit that he was finished with me, that I was clinging. But I did not kill him. George Black. Yeah, yeah, it was my gun. Sure, I was plenty sore at that rat. Maybe I would have come around to putting the boots to the guy, but I didn't come around to it, Lieutenant. Somebody did me the favor first. Nobody fiddles around with a chick that belongs to George Black. Claire Connolly. Yeah, I threatened him. I said the words, but I didn't mean them literally. That's what I said. I said, somebody ought to kill you, and maybe I ought to do it myself. I was excited. That they were just words. Words. And? Eddie Gale. Yeah, Dad, I threatened him, but it was fireworks I was going to throw at him, not firearms. Lawyers, court proceedings, attachments, garnishes, you know what I mean. Dad, the works. Parker's barbecue breaks up and everybody scatters, and when you finally wander into George's office, Rita Dupre is there, seated. Gorgeous in her lovely uh, costume, her long legs up on the desk. 
If you think you're going to talk to me, talk fast. I'm resting my leg. Ah, so I see. Our last show is going on right away. Your last show has gone on. What kind of a crack is that? No crack, sister, except that you murdered a guy. Trying to trap me again, are you? You will not succeed. You trapped yourself, sister. The lieutenant's been a little busy, but as soon as he simmers down, it'll hit him just like it hit me, and then buffo. You're in the can. And just what hit you? Four people had a finger on Johnny Silver. You, Eddie Gale, George Black, and Claire Conley. You, because you hated the guy. He made a punk out of you, tossed you aside like the uh, proverbial dish rag. Shut up! Four suspects, but no fingerprints on the gun. And it landed downstairs practically simultaneously with the shooting. Nobody had time to wipe that gun. That's conclusive. Not one single fingerprint. You want to know why? I think I know you why. You bet your boots you do, because one of the suspects was wearing gloves all the time. It's part of her costume. Okay. That's all for you, fella. George Black has slipped in, and Georgie's wearing a gun in his fist. A nasty-looking little automatic. All right, Shamus. You've done your bit. You're through. Did you know she killed him, George? I don't know it yet. Did your baby? Yes, yes, I killed him. Why? Because I loved him. Because he pushed me around. Because he laughed at me. Because when I pleaded with him, he spat at me. He spat in my honey, face. Honey, honey, your French accent's slipping. Shut up, Shamus. Peter, baby, come here. Now, don't you worry about Sherlock here. Don't worry about nobody, see? I'll get you out of this. You and I, there's Cuba, South America. I got contacts, baby. The biggest and the best. But you got no brains, Georgie. Porgy would make you an accessory. You two would be on the lamp for the rest of your lives. He's right, George. Rita, Rita, come here. Where are you going? I want to be honest for once in my life. I don't love you, George. I want you to know that. Now look, baby, I know everything. You leave that to me, honey. As long as you like me, just as long as you like me a little bit, that's all. Well, you're sweet, it. George, but I can't do this. To you. If you're going to do it, this is the time. When they start making with the romance talk, they're off guard, so you jump. You... <laughs> he missed you, and Rita's down on the floor. And by the time Parker and his boys pile in, Rita's dead. George is standing over her, blubbering. And then it's over, and Park is talking to you. That's funny how things work out. She gets it quick and sure, instead of waiting for a trial, and then getting it from the state anyway. And George Black, we've been trying to pin a rap on him for a long time. Now he's pinned the rap on himself. <laughs> Legal doubleheader. Funny how things work out. Yeah, Louie, it's funny. It's hilarious. You can just die laughing. And there you've had crime and Peter Chambers. Dane Clark was starred as Peter Chambers. Crime and Peter Chambers transcribed was created and written by Henry Kane. Others in the cast were Bill Zucker, heard as Lieutenant Parker, Rita Lynn as Claire, and Donald Buca as Eddie. It was directed by Fred Way. And this is Fred Collins inviting you to tune in next week, same time, same station, for Dane Clark in Crime and Peter Chambers.
This is the United States Armed Forces Radio and Television Service. Created by Henry Kane, transcribed and starring as Peter Chambers, Dane Clark. You're a private eye. That's your business. Anything else? That's for laughs. Your client is a lady, every inch a lady, and every inch of the lady, gorgeous. She's a blonde with black eyes, which makes you sit up and take notice, and there's plenty to take notice of. I will not believe that my uncle committed suicide. Is that clear, Mr. Chambers? Despite the evidence, despite what the police say, despite anything, I simply will not believe it. And why not, Miss Wilson? Because he wasn't the type, that's why not. I know my uncle. Simply and succinctly, he is not a man to take his own life. Okay, okay. Now, let's do it systematically. Your name is Irene Wilson. Your uncle's name was Max Daly. He owns a delicatessen store on 57th Street and Broadway. He killed himself yesterday at 1 o'clock in the afternoon in the bathroom of his apartment. He did not kill himself. Either he killed himself or he was murdered. It only happened yesterday, but according to the newspapers, it's already a closed case to the police. Which is why I've come to you. Well, you realize that aside from the physical evidence of suicide, the daughter's apartment was locked from the inside. There are keys that can open such locks, Mr. Chambers. Mm. Who discovered the body? A neighbor. Mm. And what about your uncle's family? My uncle lived here alone. Where? 6666 Park Avenue. It's pretty fancy. And who was this next-door neighbor, the one who discovered the body? A Mr. Clark Standish. According to the police, rich, retired, and an amateur musician. All right, now let's get back to Uncle Max Daly. Any enemies that you know of? Mm, no. Of course, he was acquainted with many unsavory characters, customers of that little delicatessen of his. Only last week, I was standing near the counter, off to a side, when a man came in. He talked for a while, excitedly, and then this man raised his voice, and I could hear him saying... I could hear him very clearly. So you listen to me, pastrami peddler. You're getting too big for your britches, that's what you're getting. Your neck is sticking out, way out. I'm giving you very good advice, pal, and for free. You're asking for a bigger hunk of pie? Well, you ain't getting it. Because with a bigger hunk of pie, you're liable to choke to death. This is the last time I'm... When I asked my uncle about it after the man left, he just laughed it off. Did you ever see this man before? No. Would you know his name? My uncle called him Lefty. Mm. Just a few more questions, Miss Wilson. Anything at all, Mr. Chambers. You say that Max Daly ran an ordinary little delicatessen store? Yes. Well, how come he lives in one of the fanciest apartment houses in New York? He must have been a rich man. 
I agree with that. Well, then how come? Well, according to him, he made some very good investments, and those investments were paying off handsomely. Oh. Is there anything else, Mr. Chambers? No, I don't think there is. I know I can depend on you. Your first stop is police headquarters. And your first interview is with Detective Lieutenant Louis Parker. Straight cop and good friend. So far, Pete, it looks like suicide. Pure and simple. Mm. Seems he was shining his shoes when he got the impulse. Call came from a neighbor who uh, heard the shot. And we had to break our way in. The door was closed and the inside. We found him in the bathroom. Yeah, I heard that. He was finished shaving. His own gun was beside him. He was a neat guy, Max Daly. He'd been shining his shoes and he'd been wearing gloves while shining his shoes. Wearing gloves? Mm-hmm. Then he makes up his mind to knock himself off and he does. So, door to apartment locked. Powder burns on temple close enough. Nitrate impregnations in the right-hand glove. Gun there on the floor. It's his own gun. Now, what would you say, pal? Murder or suicide? What would I say? Well, what difference does it make? Maybe this will make a difference. What? Your client, the gorgeous Irene Wilson. What about Irene Wilson? First, her little hat shop is somewhat kaput. Meaning? Meaning it's on the verge of bankruptcy. So? So, she asked her uncle for a loan. And he refused. So? So if anybody murdered him, she'd be the prime suspect. What with her having a key to the apartment, too? Oh, sure, sure. And then, though the police say it's suicide, she comes to me to prove it's murder, just because she's got an affinity for the hot seat. There's a better reason than an affinity for the hot seat, yeah. An affinity for 200,000 bucks. What are you talking about, Louis? Well, Uncle Max Daly recently took out a life insurance policy in favor of pretty Irene. Hundred thousand bucks, two hundred G's in case of accidental death. Murder, that's accidental death. And suicide? Well, before the two year incontestability clause goes into effect, suicide makes the policy null and void. Now, is it all beginning to come to you? Yeah. Yeah, I see now. If it's suicide, Irene gets nothing. Mm-hmm. If it's murder, and it can't be proved that she committed a murder, she gets two hundred thousand dollars. Very good, Detective. She would be interested in showing that it wasn't suicide. And how she'd be interested? Which, where are you going? To find out which way her interest is going to lead. To a cabana on the Riviera or a chair in Sing Sing? Next stop is 6666 Park Avenue, the apartment of Mr. Clark Standish. You stick your finger on the doorbell. But all you get is piano music. And you keep pumping at that bell. Yes. Yes, young man. Uh, name's Peter Chambers. I'm investigating the death of Mr. Max Daly, and I was told that you were the one who discovered the body. I didn't quite discover the body, but I would say that I was the one who, uh, turned in the alarm, shall we say? Come in, young man. Please, come in. Clark Standish. Small, delicate, white-haired, about 55 years of age. He's dressed in black pants, small pumps, silk blouse, and a maroon smoking jacket. He leads you into a lavishly furnished room, and he leans delicately over a baby grand piano. I'm the man that called the police, but I didn't know that Mr. Daly was dead at the time. Well, would you mind telling me a little bit about it, sir? Certainly. It was about one o'clock yesterday afternoon. I heard a shot, a single pistol shot. Did you suspect where it came from? One needn't be very perspicacious for that, Mr. Chambers. You see, there are only two apartments on each floor, and it being a rather warm day, the windows were open. Uh, uh, the windows? Uh, come here, Mr. Chambers. Yes. You see, as I draw this drape aside, a fire escape window. Mm. 
My neighbor's window also opens on this fire escape. Two windows, two apartments, mutual fire escape. As I said, this having been a rather warm day, these windows were open to the breeze, and I was able to hear the shot distinctly. I see. Well, sir, I was playing the piano at the moment, and when I heard the shot, I attempted to disregard it, hoping perhaps it was a backfire from downstairs. You know how it is. But it kept nagging at me, and finally I went across and I rang his bell. There was no answer. I kept ringing, still no answer. So I came back here. Didn't know if I was doing quite the right thing, but I called the police. Well, it turned out that you did exactly the right thing, didn't it, Mrs. Standish? So it seems. Tell me, sir, did you know Mr. Daly well? Friends or just acquaintances? Matter of fact, I didn't know him at all. Usual New York story, not knowing your neighbor, but I suppose it's common enough in this city. Yes, of course. Did see each other occasionally and nodded, but we never actually spoke. I do hope I've been of some assistance, Mr. Chambers. Thank you very much, Mr. Standish. You've been very kind and most cooperative. Oh, not at all. And if there's anything further, please don't hesitate. You get out of there, and you go to a cafeteria, and you sit over coffee and a cigarette, and you ponder. But the coffee, the cigarette, and the pondering adds up to a large hunk of nothing. So you go to the real estate agent, the people that run 6666 Park Avenue. You ask about Max Daly, and they tell you that each tenant has to be sponsored and recommended. You ask to see the papers on Max Daly, and they oblige. And you take a look. You take a good look, and then you beat it out of there, and you hurry back to police headquarters and barge in on Louis Parker. Oh, Pete, it's not like Louis. You, Louis, listen. you're really pressing me Louis, this trip, son. Please listen to me, will you? Did you check those gloves on Max Daly? Sure, we checked the gloves. Nitrate particles in the right-hand glove, just like I told you from the gun. Oh, no, no. I mean, did you check them where he bought them? You know, that kind of stuff. No. Why should we? Look, Pete, you know, you, you can't start terrific investigations every time a guy knocks himself off. Louis, a lot of crime in this city. A lot of crime. Not too many cops. The police commissioner himself said it. It doesn't figure. It just oh, doesn't figure. there right. he goes. Psychological on me again. I can see the look in your eye. Look, the niece insists he wasn't the suicide. The niece has an axe to grind. 200,000 axe. Yeah, but you said yourself he was shining his shoes, using gloves not to get his hands dirty. Oh, he was neat. Look, neat. shining shoes with gloves on his hands, that's not neat. That's screwy, Louis. It's screwy. Uh, maybe you've got a point there, but... Now, you, you just can't waste the taxpayer's money on every little Look, psychological... Can you do me a favor? What? A special favor just for me? Sure, sure. Check those gloves, will you? Ah. Uh, okay. Special for my little old psychological private eye. You go up to Irene Wilson's exclusive hat shop on Madison Avenue, and you fire a few questions at her. She's wearing a smock. But this baby's gorgeous even when she's wearing a smock. Her black eyes blaze as she gives you her speech. Yes, I am on the verge of bankruptcy here. Yes, I asked my uncle for a loan and he refused. He had no confidence in this shop, in this location. He was always a good businessman. Yes, there is a policy in my behalf. Yes, I know I get nothing if he committed suicide and I know I get $200,000 if it is proven that he was murdered. Yes, I did not tell you any of that and there was other things that I haven't told you. I don't tell everybody everything. But I did tell you what I thought was relevant, and I tell you again, I don't believe he committed suicide. I do believe he was murdered, and I don't want you to believe that I murdered him. So, you're on your white horse again. The private eye knight on his bedraggled white horse, galloping around the asphalt wilderness looking for answers. You wind up in Max Daly's delicatessen, the gallant knight munching on a pastrami sandwich. The joint is open and running despite Daly's decease, and the waitress keeps eyeing you. Finally, she moseys over. Say, you're Peter Chambers, ain't you? You're the eye guy, ain't you? Yeah, yeah, I'm the eye guy. I'm going to tell you uh, something. Wait, 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 just a minute. Would you get me a uh, bicarb? This uh, food is wonderful, but it always... Listen. Well, what? For the past few years, Max Daly was running a book here. Mm -hmm. A big book. I wouldn't have said anything, but since he got it, I thought... Look, I... what kind of book? Everything. Horses, basketball, hockey, baseball. Here? There isn't even a phone in this place. That's... Except a business phone. That's 
you did, Mr. Chambers. Phones, that's passe. Comes a reform way, they all get tapped. Everybody winds up in the pokey. This is a new kind of operation. The bets come in personally. I don't get it. Anybody wants to make a bet, they write it out on a slip of paper, stick their code name on it, and bring it in here. Personally. Then they hand it to one of the waitresses. But the Max himself. Uh, I dig all right. Now, that's a pretty smart gimmick. Did the Max handle all this himself? He got a percentage. Who was the boss? A guy named Moore. Lefty Moore. No. Yeah. So you're on the run again. You're looking for a hulking hood, ex wrestler type. Lefty Moore. You visit all his usual haunts, but Lefty strangely missing. So you switch from the nefarious to the sublime, and you're back in Parker's office. And this time, he's glad to see you, albeit he's roaring like a bull. Eat me, lad. This is one time you did me a good turn. The guy was murdered, no question about it. He was murdered, murdered, murdered. Murdered? Who was murdered? Who? he asked. Max Daly, that's who. Murdered, period. The gloves tipped me. Your suggestion. The gloves Max Daly was wearing. Easy, Louis. He had to... Easy. Now, wait a minute. Wait a minute. Uh, uh, yeah. Well, <clears throat> we checked the gloves carefully, you see. First, they're too small for him. Second, they're very expensive, quite new, and not to be used for polishing shoes. Third, they come from a London shop. Max Daly never was in London. Man's gloves, Louis, or ladies? Well, it could be either small, you know, like a gauntlet type. Mm. So if somebody worked out an evil frame job, huh? Uh-huh. Add to that, a careful examination of the bathroom floor discloses the imprint of, uh, sneakers. Sneakers? Men's sneakers or ladies? Well, again, it could be the small size. Well, how do you make it, Louie? According to you, his apartment door was locked from the inside. Yes, but the fire escape window was open. Leads down to the alley in the rear. Now, somebody, wearing sneakers, snuck in... Sneaked in. Sneaked in, they took Max's gun out of a drawer. Then he goes into the bathroom where Max has just finished shaving, moved close, let him have it. Then they put the gloves on Max, fixed up the shoe shine routine, sneaked out. Snuck out. Sneaks. Now, what, what are you, Bob? Oh, I was only kidding you. Wait a minute. Uh, you any idea who it was? You know who figures the benefit. But I'm letting it rest a while. I'm just letting it simmer. Just want to see what cooks up, you know? Uh, Louie, hmm? how's that fire escape window? Still open? No, it's closed tight now. Sealed. Which means that I'll have to use the door. It means you'll have to use the what? The door, the door. I'd like to look the place over. Seeing as I'm your white-haired boy now, uh, may I have the key? <laughs> yes, sir, white-haired boy, you may. Max Daly's got a cute little place, and you've hardly even begun when there's an instrument jiggling at the door lock. You wait, and the door opens. And there, big as life, with a pick lock in his hand, Lefty Moore. You jump him, you feed him to the first punch. He's a big one, but you manage to drop him. Then you drag him in and kick the door shut. All right. All right, Shamus. Lay off. Lay off. Now, look, pal. The gun I'm holding is out of your holster. Now, if you insist that I use it, I use it. Is that clear? Yeah, yeah, clear. All right, now. Breaking and entering, that's burglary. You can get a long rap for that. Now, if you talk up, and if you talk up good, maybe the rap won't be so long. Am I still clear? Yeah, yeah, clear. All right. Now, what do you want here? A ledger. A ledger? I waited till the heat was off, and now I'm here looking for a ledger. What kind of a ledger? Max Daly. He was doing some high-class bookmaking. Yeah, yeah, I know, I know. So he kept a ledger, a black leather record book. Well, how do you know the cops don't have it? Are you kidding, Shamus? If the cops ever had that book, there'd be rockets busting all over this town. Lefty, let me ask you something. Yeah? Where were you yesterday at one o'clock? <laughs> you mean when Maxie was bumped? Mm. I got the best alibi in the world. Alibi? Yeah. I was in court, pleading not guilty to a traffic rap. Ever been in London? London? Oh, well, what's with London? You mean the London... Okay, you... okay, Lefty. Let's... You and I together... Look for that black leather record book. You talked me into it, Shamus. Leave us look. 
You look, but you do not find. So you attach Lefty to a minion of the law with instructions that he be placed in the capable hands of Detective Lieutenant Louis Parker. And back you go to Irene Wilson, real glamorous now in a man-tailored red gabardine suit. You pump questions at her, and what do you know? For once, she comes up with the right answer. Yes, my uncle did have a black leather record book. He kept it here at my shop. His instructions were that I was to destroy it upon his death, but in the circumstances... Give me, honey, give me quick. I never looked at it. He he kept it in a locked briefcase, which I kept here in my Okay, safe. let's have it. Yes, Mr. Chambers, I'll get it for you. Please wait. You wait, and you grab, and you break open that lock, and you look. And then you're running again. And then you're at 66, 66 Park Avenue at the apartment of Clark Standish. Ah, Mr. Chambers. Any new ideas on the subject of uh, Max Daly? Plenty. And they're all about you. I beg your pardon. You went through that window wearing sneakers. You got into his place, clipped his gun, caught up with him in the bathroom as he finished shaving, and you let him have it. And then you pulled that shoeshine routine, slipped your gloves on his hands, left the gun there, and beat it back to your place. And then, sweet and innocent, you called the police. You had heard a shot. You want to know your first mistake? I'm listening, Mr. Chase. You told me you didn't know him. You never spoke to him. Yet a check at the real estate office showed that you sponsored him. Uh, slipped your mind, didn't it, Mr. Standish? But why should I kill him, Mr. Chambers? What motive would I have? Oh, I got that right here, Mr. Standish. Right here in Max Daly's record book. Oh? We may be able to do business, Mr. Chambers. Oh, a real brain guy, huh, Mr. Standish? Dreamed up an idea of personal vetting, no telephones involved, had Lefty Malone funding for you. Let's talk business, Mr. Chambers. You did business with Max Daly, but when he got too big for his britches, when he wanted a big hunk of pie, that business was stopped. With a bullet. That ledger is worth enough to me for you to retire for the rest of your life. Are you going to give it to me? Uh, By the way, Mr. Standish, do you buy your clothes in London? Yes, I do, but that is of no importance right now. Mm. Are you going to give it to me? Oh, yes, sir. And how I'm going to give it to you. And so, with all the bad little boys safely put away in the pokey, and after congratulations have bounced around like rubber balls in the children's playground, you suddenly realize you've never settled the fee with Irene Wilson. And she is coming into 200,000 solid simoleons. So, that evening, you're at Irene Wilson's apartment, ready to discuss your fee. And there she is, in gold lounging pajamas. On me. You're quite attractive, Mr. Chambers. Now that it's all over and I have an opportunity to observe... And you, beautiful is the word. And beautiful is an understatement. Uh, you said there was something to discuss. Something let about... Let it wait, Irene. Let it wait. Let it wait and wait. I wouldn't wait too long if I were you. That is very good advice. Oh, Mr. Chambers. And there you've had crime and Peter Chambers. Dane Clark was starred as Peter Chambers. Crime and Peter Chambers Transcribed was created and written by Henry King. Others in the cast were Bill Zuckert, heard as Lieutenant Parker, Elaine Ross as Irene, and Leon Janney as Clark. It was directed by Fred Way. And this is Fred Collins speaking.